Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day last. Um, we have our regular items scheduled for today as well as uh, uh, E5 from yesterday. Um, but we will get started with C9. But first, I will ask uh, Chuck or Merrick if there are any announcements. Uh, just, just. Somebody's connected via their. Chuck, not hearing you. We turn off the right now. Yeah. Uh, okay, sorry, we had still. Right. <laughs> okay, I think we're good now. <laughs> we're we're still uh, getting everybody up to speed on our uh, uh, hybrid protocols here. We've got a number of people in the room and just making sure everybody's uh, properly uh, audio muted. Okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, Mark, uh, we've got uh, our regular uh, two administrative items uh, with our action on the ground fish management measures, specifications management measures to complete today. We also have one other uh, minor um, uh, Typo to fix in a, in a previous motion uh, on um, adopting stock assessments. So uh, that'll just take a few minutes. Uh, we'll do that after we're done with the uh, management specifications and um, management measures and specifications C5, uh, E5 agenda item. Um, so uh, with that, I think we're ready to get rolling here this morning. All right, thank you, Chuck. So uh, C9, membership appointments and council operating procedures and uh, Mr. Mike Berner, take it away. Good morning, council members. Welcome to day last. This is agenda item C9, membership appointments and council operating procedures. We have a little bit more business to do here under this agenda item uh, this time around than normal, uh, given that it, we have a expiration of our current three-year term at the end of the year. So uh, let's dive right in. Uh, regarding council officers and designees, we have no changes at this meeting. Uh, regarding advice, advisory body appointments, so however, as I mentioned, we have a fair amount of business outside of the three-year term uh, appointments that we will get into in a moment. We also have a request from National Marine Fisheries Service. They've nominated Dr. Kate Richardson to replace Dr. Keeley Summers on the North in the Northwest Fishery Science Center uh, seat for the ground fish management team. And we'll look to the council for a motion there as appropriate when we get to council action. Also regarding the ad hoc ecosystem work group, National Marine Fishery Service has requested that Dr. Kiva Oaken replace Dr. Andy Stevens as their representative on the ad hoc ecosystem work group. This one uh, being an ad hoc group, this would be an appointment of the chair in consultation uh, with the with the council, so I would look to Chair Gorelnik uh, to speak to this appointment when we get to council action on, on this agenda item. So diving into the, the main uh, piece for this uh, session, uh, the 2022 to 2024 advisory body term, uh, many of our advisory body seats are, are on a three-year three term, uh, which expires, uh, the current one expires at the end of the year this year. So at this meeting, the council is poised to uh, appoint folks to uh, all of our advisory subpanels, uh, nine at-large seats on the Scientific and Statistical Committee, uh, and seven uh, essentially non-agency seats on the Habitat Committee. Uh, so following the September meeting, uh, we opened up uh, for nominations. We solicited for nominations for all of these seats. We got uh, a pretty healthy batch of nominations in the first round. Those are shown in uh, attachment one for this agenda item. Uh, as we reviewed uh, those original batch of, of nominations, we noticed there was a couple of spots where we still had some vacancies, uh, not enough nominations to fill the seats. So we decided to open up uh, a second nomination period uh, to try to get as many names uh, as we could. Um, 
that 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 closed in early November, and in your supplemental attachment two is is a complete list that includes uh, all the names we got in the first round, plus all the names we got in the second round. So, when we get to uh, council action, uh, we will look to motions to uh, deal with that GMT nomination. I meant mentioned at the first and then uh, I would recommend perhaps motions as we go by advisory body uh, to fill all these appointments. It's, it's quite a quite a list. I think I counted up over 80 seats we'll be filling today. So um, looking ahead to this next term, it's uh, really nice. I want to thank everyone who threw their name in the hat. It's really nice to see uh, a lot of stakeholder interest in the council process. I also want to thank a lot of council members and others who helped me uh, sort of get people fired up and get people's names uh, in so that we'd have have some uh, bodies to put in seats for the next go around. So thanks for all of that. Uh, in addition to that work, uh, there was some discussion under closed session about the status of the electronic monitoring uh, groups. There's two ad hoc groups, a policy and a technical group. Um, as the council's well aware, council's uh, revisiting EM uh, in the next couple of years. And so uh, in turn, uh, took a look at that membership. And I believe Chair Gorelnik has some comments to make regarding uh, those two groups when we get to council action as well. Uh, and if that weren't enough, we also have some business to take care of regarding our council operating procedures. At your June meeting, uh, the council, uh, the CPS management team and the council discussed uh, a framework for management of the central subpopulation of northern anchovy. Uh, the council at the time asked the, the team to uh, come up with some draft text for your COP9, which uh, includes management schedules across our FMPs. This, is, well, this one would be specific to Schedule 3. Uh, so in your briefing materials under agenda item C9A is the team's response to that. It's a brief write-up and uh, proposed language changes so that that COP schedule reflects the action you took in June regarding uh, the management of anchovies. And I believe Greg Krutzikowski is prepared to speak to that management team report. Additionally, in your briefing materials, the CPS advisory subpanel has a report uh, on that same COP topic I just mentioned. And I believe we have two public comments signed up uh, to speak to this agenda item. So uh, again, like I mentioned, there's quite a bit of business to take care of uh, under this agenda item. Uh, We've got uh, appointments to the GMT. We've got some ad hoc committee uh, uh, appointments to discuss. Uh, and of course, we've got that large uh, business of taking care of all those appointments for our next advisory body term. Uh, and then as well, uh, your consideration of that COP9 to see if uh, those changes reflect the decision you made back in June as to how to proceed with that anchovy framework. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll pause and, and take any questions. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you for that overview, Mike. I'll look to see if there uh, are any questions of Mike on that overview. Uh, and if not, we will uh, get started with uh, this agenda item. All right, not seeing any hands. So we'll, we'll start with our reports. We have a report from the management team, CPS management team and CPS advisory subpanel. So we'll hear first from Greg Krutzikowski from the management team. Welcome, Greg. Hello. Did you, uh, I, I'm sorry, I had an interruption. This is Greg Krutzkowski. Did you guys call me to yeah, we did. get the report? Yeah. I, I apologize for the delay. No worries. Uh, my, so this is Greg Krutzkowski, member of the uh, Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team. I will be reading into the record the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team report on COP9, Schedule 3. Uh, to incorporate the management framework for central subpopulation of northern anchovy. The Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team provided two reports on the management framework for the central subpopulation of northern anchovy in June 2021, which described a tool, the flowchart, that addresses the frequency for assessments and changes to harvest specifications. At this meeting, the council is to consider the council operating procedure, COP9, Schedule 3, 
that provide the revisions needed to incorporate that framework as the council requested in June. In examining the COP to make the revisions related to CSNA, the CPSMT noted that the schedules for various fishery management plans contain only text, but that including the CSNA flowchart to depict the process visually in conjunction with text would be helpful. Thus, the CPSMT provides revisions to COP9 Schedule 3 for Council consideration in Attachment 1 that incorporates the flowchart diagram from Agenda Item H3A, Supplemental CPSMT Report 2, as well as text that includes a schedule. Note that the schedule differs slightly from Agenda Item H3A, CPSMT Report 1. To reduce the potential for a compressed timeline, as was, was noted by the SSC in its June report on the CSNA framework, that could be problematic, especially in years when an assessment is conducted. That was agenda item H3A, Supplemental SSC Report 1. The Council would adopt any management changes in June rather than in April. The CPSMT recommends that the Council adopt the version of COP9 Schedule 3 in Attachment 1 to this CPSMT report that clearly captures the intricacies of the CSNA flowchart. And with that, I will take any questions. I don't believe that you would like me to read, uh, read the uh, attachment text for you. All right, thank you very much, Greg. Let me see if there are any questions from council members on the MT report. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from the CPS Advisory Subpanel, Michael Konevsky. Welcome, Mike. Hey, good morning, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning. And good morning, Council Members. Agenda Item C9A, Supplemental CPS AS Report 1, 2021, Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel Report on Member appointments and council operating procedures. The Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel, Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team report on council operating procedure COP9, Schedule 3, C, period 9A, CPS MT Report 1, which recommended changes to incorporate the management framework for a central subpopulation of northern anchovy, CSNAA. The CPSAS complements the CPSMT for its forethought and extensive work to integrate the new management framework and schedule. We concur with the CPSMT recommendation for council to adopt the version of the COP9 Schedule 3 in Attachment 1 Management Team Report that clearly captures the intricacies of a CSNA flowchart. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Are there questions for the advisory subpanel? Thank you, Mike. Good morning to you. Thank you. All right. Uh, that completes the reports that we have, but we do have four public comments. And we will start with uh, Tom Rudolph. Welcome, Tom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? You bet. Um, uh, uh, good morning, uh, Chair Gorelnik and Council members. Uh, just signed up for a public comment very briefly today to draw the Council's attention to a uh, late submission of a letter of support that, um, that uh, Pew Ocean Conservancy and Oceana submitted uh, in support of the nomination of Dr. Waldo Wakefield 
for uh, the upcoming vacancy in the conservation seat on the Habitat Committee. Um, I don't believe that uh, Waldo really needs any introduction to uh, the council and the council family, um, but uh, our three groups, Pew, Ocean Conservancy, and Oceana, um, are very pleased to see that uh, Waldo has submitted his nomination and is willing to serve. And uh, yeah, that's it. I just wanted to draw your attention to that letter this morning. All right, thanks very much, Tom. Are there any questions of Tom? All right, thanks, Tom, for your comment. Uh, we'll now hear from Jeff Shester, followed by Susan Chambers. Uh, hi, thank you, and good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the council. This is Jeff Shester representing Oceana. Um, wanted to start uh, in the spirit of Thanksgiving by thanking you all for uh, your hard work at this meeting and your certain your continued service to uh, uh, protecting our, our fisheries and our ecosystems. Uh, this has certainly been a, a tedious meeting and uh, appreciate uh, all the, the hard work and many, many hours spent. Uh, really uh, re wish that we could all be together in person. I uh, personally very much miss uh, my personal act interactions with you uh, in person, um, hanging out in the hallways and, and having conversations and hopefully look, can look forward to brighter days where we can do that again. Um, I wanted to speak in, on behalf of uh, Oceana regarding uh, our support for the adoption of the new anchovy framework in the COP, uh, the Council Operating Procedures, uh, under this agenda item. Uh, this is a key milestone and interim step toward a long-term solution to a regime that will effectively prevent overfishing and be responsive to best available science. Uh, the, the management strategy evaluation that was conducted, many stakeholder discussions, uh, new science, the acoustic trawl methodology reviews and the subsequent improvements um, and and I think the the flexibility and uh, and compromises by stakeholders around the table have now resulted in a new framework and new harvest control rule for anchovy uh, that that has uh, parameters and details supported around the table as a result of the the June 2021 meeting and the and the discussions um, and we believe that, that it strikes uh, a balance and, and a compromise that, that we can support. Uh, we're also thankful for the Southwest Fisheries Science Center uh, for its uh, work on completing a new anchovy stock assessment, which will be the first in, uh, in 27 years. Um, we, we look forward to the review uh, panel, the star panel review in December and consideration by the council of that new assessment in April. Uh, this spring, uh, we understand under the new uh, timeline and, and schedule under the COPs that we would be kicking off the implementation of this new framework and constructing a new uh, ABC and OFL and uh, annual catch limits based on the new assessment and recent biomass. Um, we're excited to see the beginning of an evaluation of the anchovy stock status every two years with clear objective management thresholds uh, that will allow a quick response to rapid collapses that we know anchovy is prone to do. Uh, ultimately, as we've stated before, we do believe that harvest specifications are the only appropriate way to conduct the two-year check-ins after the, the, the stock assessment. Um, it, we believe that the, the specifications are what will provide a robust approach for resolving any discrepancies on best available scientific information. Um, and I think as and under that agenda item on best of it, scientific information available, uh, I think there was a, 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 an important discussion of a, a process under the specs that will um, uh, address any potential controversies or disagreements over, over scientific estimates. Um, we note that uh, there's always controversy and uncertainty associated with uh, estimates of low biomass, particularly for these coastal pelagics. And we really need a, a clear, transparent process uh, through that, that allows thorough scientific review uh, and public input. And the specifications process are how the Magnuson Act ensures that best available science is used and overfishing is prevented. So while we do support the adoption of the COP language today, ultimately, 
the CPS fishery management plan, not the COPs or the safe documents, is where a clear description of anchovy management and harvest policy belongs. So that we ask that you adopt the COP9 language now and schedule a new FMP amendment to implement the key elements of the new framework and establish that two-year specification cycle. Uh, this would, this uh, two-year cycle could be consistent with the schedule for Pacific mackerel, which takes place every other June. And we note that these two species could be combined into a single specifications rulemaking. Uh, so thank you again for your uh, hard work and many hours at this meeting. Uh, we act, ask that you please adopt the COP9 language today. And we look forward to working with you to implement the framework this spring uh, based on the first anchovy stock assessment in over 25 years. Uh, and thank you very much. We also do have a number of um, uh, support for, I think, uh, a, a, a nice roster of conservation representatives uh, to, for the various advisory bodies, including uh, the, the, the support for Waldo Wakefield that Tom Rudolph just mentioned. So uh, we, we look forward to uh, uh, seeing, seeing who is nominated and, um, and, and, and look forward to further continuation of the conservation community's participation in the council process. Uh, thank you very much, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thanks very much, Jeff. Are there any questions for Jeff? Uh, I'm not seeing any hands, but thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I'm going to call uh, Bill James, and then we'll come back to Susan Chambers. Bill? Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. My name is Bill James. Speaking for myself and Port San Luis Commercial Fishing Association, um, I did, you know, I did as letters of support. We've been so busy uh, working on management measures and everything else, I forgot to do this. So here it is, and uh, I'm going to just go down the, the list that I have, and I'll be done real, real short. Um, Louis Zim for sport fishing at large. Um, he's really missed. We work well together. Merritt for what he does. Um, Dan Waldeck is, uh, it's funny for me, I endorse him, but he does such a great job in the wordsmithing of all, whatever comes uh, through GAF. So he's really helped us out, and I think he should come back for sure. Susan Chambers, same thing. Um, Danny Platt for uh, Open Access South, Harrison for uh, North. Um, yeah, Deb Wilson Vandenberg for Ecosystems. Um, and it's important to have with these this next go around here. It's it's important to have people with a lot of history to be able to, to go through this because uh, you know it's taken us years to get back into the shelf, and so the expertise needs to stay or be added. So um, let's see. Without that, that's about it as far as that. Um, and I really appreciate everybody. Um, working with me, listening to me, you know, my voice is hoarse all the time now. I talk too much. And uh, as far as Gary Richter, he's the cat person, and he needs to be up there with his cat. So anyway, so uh, he does a good job on helping out. And, yeah, thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, that's your job. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bill. Are there any questions for Bill on his public testimony? Thank you very much, Bill. And uh, Susan Chambers, welcome, Susan. Thank you. Um, good morning, uh, Chair Gorelnik, Vice Chair Pettinger, and Council members. My name is Susan Chambers, and I currently serve as Vice Chair of the Groundfish Advisory Panel. Absent our traditional November banquet, I want to offer some personal comments about the changes we have coming. First, I want to say thank you and congratulations to Mr. Chuck Tracy, who is retiring as executive director. Thank you for everything you've done over the last few years. Second, congratulations to Merrick Burden, who is taking over. You have some exciting new challenges ahead and I look forward to working with you. <clears throat> Vincent Van Gogh said, the fishermen know that the sea is dangerous and the storm terrible, but they have never found these dangers sufficient reason for remaining ashore. To me, this also speaks to the dedication GAP members have shown over the years. We've been through some stormy times with tough rebuilding plans for rockfish, canary, and yellow eye, for example, in the past two decades. 
GAP members have sacrificed days on the water to attend meetings in person or virtually to represent friends and constituents in this regulatory process. Now, nine of our friends are planning other adventures. Bert Weedoff and I would like to recognize these fine people. They have given countless hours of personal time and comments. Their perspectives helped form valuable and consistent insights about how regulations would affect the worlds in which they live and work and the constituents whom they represent. These are some of my brief personal thoughts and memories about each of them. <clears throat> I will always remember Tom Burlingame telling me all about his boat, the Cabazon, while we shared a ride to the San Diego airport. I've always looked up to Michelle Etter as a strong woman in a tough business <clears throat> who is most eloquent in making her arguments and has been dedicated to the process through difficult times. Lauren Goddard has been active in state and federal fisheries policy for years and brought a unique voice to the gap from one of the smallest ports on the West Coast. Bob Engel's wealth of knowledge and fairness were key to some gap decisions that improved fishing for all California sport fisheries. <clears throat> Tom Libby has shared his knowledge of processing through many GAP meetings, but what really stands out to me is his effort on Amendment 28. He led the push to work with conservation groups to go port to port and work through new rockfish conservation area boundaries and essential fish habitat areas to bring forward to the council and advisory bodies. It was a long process, but he and Seth Atkinson really got the ball rolling. Tom Marking is a very strong advocate for his constituents in Northern California and the whole state. He provided clear data to back up his ideas and I will truly miss my conversations with him and Mary about crab and halibut fishing. Dale Meyer was on the gap after he served on the council for several years. From his obvious knowledge and advocacy for sport fisheries in Washington, it's easy to see his retirement from Arctic Storm Management Group has been good for his soul. Sarah Nayani, also from Arctic Storm, made quite an impression with her attention to detail, writing skills, and general personality. I will never forget Sarah bringing flowers to her space at the gap table, always looking, excuse me, always looking for the bright and positive things in life. And last, <clears throat> one second. Last, but most certainly not least, Chair John Holloway. Sorry. Representing Oregon Sport Fisheries. John has led the gap for several years, a beacon of light in stormy weather, like harvest specifications, Amendment 28, and how can we forget Holloway gear? I was a reporter when John first proposed the long leader recreational gear that is now his namesake. He talked about it as a way to allow sport fishermen some opportunities to fish when salmon and ground fish seasons were limited. When yellow eye rockfish was listed as overfished and limiting several fisheries, John found a way to keep fishermen on the water. His name will be forever linked with a change in the fishery excuse me, that benefited fishermen from Bellingham to San Diego. John's leadership on the gap is equally as creative. He always brings fairness and levity. <laughs> With one quip, John can defuse a tense situation and make everyone laugh. Serving with John on the gap has been one of the best things of the council process. To all the retiring GAP members, thank you for sharing your knowledge, your years of service, and for all the good times. I think I speak for the GAP when I say, we wish you, wish you all the very best, and I'm see, sure we will see you at the harbor soon. And um, I think Brett has a couple comments. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. So 
we wanted to memorialize the gear that John had worked on. His name is in the federal regulations. And so I asked around for photos and uh, asked for the gear set up. And so Lynn Mattis of ODFW sent me the gear set up that he created and used as a demonstration. So I created a shadow box for that. Uh, and, the, and next slide, please. Um, and wanted to compile a few things. There wasn't much to go on for John. He's an elusive person. So uh, the top left photo is the, the parade of boats is last year, I believe it was. He was driving somebody else's boat. Um, but I, I love the look on his face in this photo. There's a great little text message exchange between Susan and John there saying, okay, thanks. Santa, Santa gave me a midwater fishery in the Federal Register posted as a proposed rule. Beats the lump of coal from previous years. So that's the typical John uh, quip and his uh, humor in it. And it is really uh, great to have him in the room uh, so many times when there's tense situations. Um, at the bottom picture there with Louis. Uh, out for sushi is kind of the normal routine as much as we can get out together and, and eat sushi wherever is possible. Uh, and then just a couple photos of trying to get as many people as I could in the picture uh, from around the table. Um, and, and in the lower right there, he has a headphone on and I thought it was great that somebody bought him finally something that he could really project his, his voice uh, to everyone so that they could uh, be led down the right path. And uh, I do appreciate all that he's done uh, for, for us in the gap and he will be greatly missed. Uh, just next slide, please. Uh, I think there's another one more slide as a close up of the gear. Uh, and then we quoted the, the regulations uh, that he has uh, now his name in, in there. So, John, much appreciated for all your guidance, your thoughts, your your fairness around the table. Uh, you will be greatly missed, and and I do appreciate it because I was a newbie too when I started working with you uh, on the gap. So your wisdom will be missed, but we will keep your thoughts in the back of our minds. Is what would John say? So thanks. That's all we had. I applaud all the gap members around the table. Um, that have been serving, and I and I and I warm, warmly welcome all those new members coming on too. So that's all we had. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Susan, and and thank you, Brett, and uh, thank you, John, for everything you have done and the benefits that will continue from your work. Not seeing any hands with any questions. <laughs> I'm not sure what we could ask after that tr great presentation. So that, that completes uh, Chuck Tracy. Mr. Chair, uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, just say uh, thank you, Susan, for your testimony uh, on behalf of Merrick, myself, and all the GAP members. And I just also wanted just to thank all of the retiring advisors uh, this time around. We've tried to um, pull out, you know, note, note a few, but there, there are many that have given many years of service and uh, the council certainly appreciates it. I certainly appreciate it. And um, uh, I, I, I feel bad that we haven't been able to uh, properly honor people um, over the last couple of years. Um, I hope that, that we can remedy that situation in the future and uh, look forward to um, uh, honoring those people and uh, seeing them again uh, at some point, hopefully next year. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Chuck. Mm -hmm. So that completes public comment and takes us to council discussion and action. Uh, we have a number of issues here, um, COP and uh, advisory body appointments. And uh, what I would suggest we do is take them one at a time. Let's, I mean, and let's, let's deal first with the COP and see if there uh, is any discussion or action. And I'll look for a hand. Brianna Brady. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you. I appreciate the management team providing the revised text to COP9 to incorporate the 
<clears throat> excuse me, the flow chart as discussed from the June 2021 meeting. And I just wanted to say that I'm supportive of the revisions that MT has made. All right, thank you, Brianna. Other discussion on the COP? We would need to make this change by motion. Does anyone have a motion? Brianna Brady. Thank you. Um, I have a, a motion, if it could be presented, please, Sandra or Chris. Thank you. I move the council adopt C9A CPS management team report one proposed changes to the council operating procedure nine. All right, thank you, uh, Brianna. Um, there was a reference to a schedule in in the reports. Does does your language there capture that? I believe it does. Okay, great. All right, and the language on the screen is accurate and complete. Yes. All right, I'm looking for a second. A seconded by Heather Hall. Thank you, Heather. Uh, please speak to your motion. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and. Thank you to the management team for providing the revised text for COP9. In June, as I mentioned, the council had requested the management team to provide this text in COP9 that includes the framework for the central subpopulation of Northern Anchovy. And we see that for us here today. So again, thank you to the MT for working on this item and updating the COP. Okay, thank you, Briotta. Are there, are there any questions for the maker of the motion or any discussion on the motion? With no, with no uh, hands, uh, I guess we're ready to vote. So I'll call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Brianna, for the motion. That takes care of the COP business under this agenda item and takes us to membership appointments. Uh, as uh, Mr. Berner said, there's quite a long list here. And uh, I have a list here in front of me. I suppose we can we can take these one at a time. I will I will um, mention the body and I will ask for any discussion or a motion. And if that's acceptable to everyone, we'll we'll go that way. So first, there is a, a vacancy on the groundfish management team. Uh, currently held by Kaylee Summer. So uh, is there a nomination or discussion? Ryan Wolf. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I have a motion I'd like to make here. Please. I believe, yep, there we go. <clears throat> I move the council appoint Dr. Kate Richardson to the National Marine Fisheries Service Northwest Fisheries Science Center position on the groundfish management team currently held by Dr. Kaylee Summers. All right, thank you, Ryan. That language appears accurate because I've seen it. <laughs> and uh, I'll look for a second. Uh, seconded by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. Uh, please speak to your motion, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Richardson joined our Northwest Fisheries Science Center um, a few years ago in our fishery resource analysis, analysis and management division. Uh, she an, was an analyst there supporting our fishery observation science program. She's been the lead author of the annual salmon bycatch report, the biennial green sturgeon report, <clears throat> um, co-authored a number of other reports on protected species bycatch, fishing effort and groundfish mortality. <clears throat> 
uh, Dr. Richardson has extensive experience in, in processing and analyzing observer and packfin and other fisheries data and in general has a has a long history since she started a positive and, and productive interactions with the GMT and, and council staff since joining uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service. So we believe her expertise and range of experience with topics and taxa of interest to the council and the GMT make her an ideal addition to this body. And uh, that is, of course, me speaking to Dr. Richardson. I also want to thank um, Dr. Kaylee Summers for all of her uh, work uh, and efforts uh, on the GMT over the years. All right, thank you very much, Ryan. Are there any um, questions of Ryan or discussion on the motion? All right, I will call the question. All those in favor of this motion say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Uh, welcome Dr. Kate Richardson and thank you to Dr. Kaylee Summers. And thank you Ryan for the motion. Uh, we'll move next to the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel. I'll look to see if there's any discussion or action on that body. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. I move the council make the following appointments to the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel. California Commercial Fisheries, three positions. Mr. David Crabb, Mr. David Haworth, Mr. Nick Gerlin. Oregon Commercial Fisheries, Mr. Ryan Kapp. Washington Commercial Fisheries, Mr. Michael Kornman. Processor, three positions, Mr. Brian Blake, Mr. Mike Okanuski, Mr. Anthony Buoso. California Sport Charter Fisheries, Mr. Steve Crook. And Conservation Group, Ms. Anna Weinstein. And the language on the screen is accurate? Yes. All right, I'll look for a second. Seconded by Brianna Brady. Uh, Maggie, please speak to your motion. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, pleased to have this uh, slate of well-qualified and knowledgeable representatives uh, to bring, bring their expertise and perspectives to our, uh, our council family to advise us on coastal pelagic species management. Appreciate their willingness to serve and look forward to their participation. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions for the maker of the motion or any discussion? Not seeing any hands, I will call the question. All those in favor uh, of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Maggie, for the motion. We'll move next to the Ecosystem Advisory Subpanel. Is there any discussion or a motion there? Brianna Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a motion and I move that council make the following appointments to the Ecosystem Advisory Subpanel. California, three at-large positions, Ms. Melissa Mahoney, Mr. Richard Ogg, Ms. Deborah Wilson-Vandenberg, Oregon, three at-large positions, Mr. Scott McMullen, Ms. Gway Rogers-Kirchner, Dr. Andrew Thurber, Washington, three at-large positions, Dr. Terry Klinger, Dr. Philip Levin, and Ms. Michelle Robinson. Okay, thank you, Donna. Is the uh, our language and the names on the screen accurate and complete? Yes. Brianna, is everything there accurate and complete? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, yes. Very good. All right, I will look for a second. Seconded by Bob Dooley. Thank you, Bob. Please speak to your motion. I think we have um, a great group of qualified individuals to help us advise on ecosystem matters. Thank you. All right, is there any discussion on the motion? Not seeing any hands, I will call the question. 
All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Brianna, for the motion. We will move next to the ground fish advisory sub panel and I'll look for discussion or a motion there. Heather Hall. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. I do have a motion. Uh, thank you for putting it on the screen. Uh, I move the council make the following appointments to the ground fish advisory sub panel. For fixed gear fisheries, three at large positions, Mr. Bob Alverson, Mr. Scott Hartzell, Mr. Gary Richter. Bottom trawl fisheries, Mr. Travis Hunter. Midwater trawl fisheries, Mr. Jeff Lackey. At large trawl fisheries, two positions, Ms. Ruth Christensen, Mr. Kevin Dunn. Open access fisheries north of Cape, Cape Mendocino, Mr. Harrison Ibach. Open access fisheries south of Cape Mendocino, Mr. Daniel Platt. Processors, two at large positions, Ms. Su Susan Chambers. At sea processor, Mr. Dan Daniel Waldeck. Washington charter boat operator, Mr. Steve Westrick. Oregon charter boat operator, Mr. Jeff Jeffrey Wilmarth. California charter boat operator, North of Point Conception, Mr. Tim Clausen. California charter boat operator, South of Point Conception, Mr. Merritt McRae. Sport Fisheries, three at large positions, uh, Mr. Stephen Godin and Mr. Louis Zim. Tribal Fisheries, Mr. Steve Joner and Conservation Group, Mr. Shums Judd. Thank you very much, Heather, for the motion. Is the language uh, there accurate and complete? Yes, it is. And I'll look for a second at this point. I see Maggie Summers' hand is up, I assume, for the second. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, please speak to your motion. Uh, I, I think we have a, a fairly complete list of um, very capable candidates uh, for the ground fish advisory subpanel. Um, appreciate everyone who put their names in for these positions. I think we heard um, in public comment earlier that uh, how, how much the council values the input from the gap. And uh, I know we're at a point of transition. I did wanna speak to the sport fishery at large position. Uh, we're appointing two here, um, one from Oregon and one from California and hope that we can fill a third with someone um, potentially from the north. Uh, so appreciate keeping that open as we look for some more um, potential applicants. That's it, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Heather. Uh, I see Maggie, you have your hand up. Go ahead, Maggie. Thank you, Chair. I just briefly wanted to acknowledge that um, given the, the duration of the gap meetings and the, that they meet at every council meeting, it can be, it is one of our, our um, larger time commitment advisory bodies and really appreciate the, uh, the willingness of folks who have submitted nominations to serve. A note that specific to the Oregon charter seat and um, the sport at large seat that has traditionally gone to an Oregon um, representative, those um, you know, were part of the uh, uh, reopening and you know we ended up with really a number of, of very strong candidates for it really appreciate the interest folks have shown in getting involved in the process and want to um, encourage everyone to continue to be involved uh, through participating in council meetings and providing us with public comments so that we benefit from your knowledge thanks all right thank you maggie are there uh, further uh, discussion uh, on this agenda item Heather? Uh, okay, uh, I'm not seeing any, any hands here. So uh, I will uh, call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 
Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Heather, for the motion. We'll move next to the Highly Migratory Species Advisory Subpanel. Let's see if there is any discussion or a motion to be had there. Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a motion when you're ready, um, and it looks like it's up there. So I will read my motion. I move the council make the following appointments to the Highly Migratory Species Advisory Subpanel. Commercial Troll Fisheries, Mr. Wayne Heikela. Commercial Purse Seine Fisheries, Mr. Michael Conroy. Commercial Gillnet Fisheries, Mr. Gary Burke. Commercial Deep Set Buoy Gear, Mr. William Sutton. Commercial Fisheries North of Point Conception, Mr. Douglas Fricke. Commercial Fisheries South of Point Conception, Mr. Austin Brown. Processor North of Cape Mendocino, no appointment at this time. Processor South of Cape Mendocino, Mr. Dave Rudy. Northern Charter Boat Operator, Mr. John Yosem Yokomizu. Southern Charter Boat Operator, Mr. Mike Thompson. Private Sport Fisheries, North of Point Conception, Mr. Tom Matsuch. Private Sport Fisheries, South of Point Conception, Mr. Robert Osborne. Conservation Group, Mr. Josh Madeira. And the Public at Large member, Ms. Pamela Tom. All right, Krista, thank you uh, for that motion. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? It is. All right, I will look for a second. Seconded by Maggie Summer. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, please speak to your motion. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will say that this was, um, for me, one of the more difficult um, conversations that we had because it's a strong room with strong opinions uh, and we had a lot of strong candidates, meaning we had more than one person apply for many of our seats. I think that we have a great mix um, for participants this time. We have a lot of returning people, but we do have some new ones. And I think that we have seen an increase in um, the ability for stakeholders to work together uh, over the last three to four years. And I believe that this group will uh, continue that process and, and we will see um, just stronger messaging coming out of this sub panel. Thank you very much, Krista. Uh, are there any questions uh, for the maker of the motion or discussion on the motion? I will uh, call the question. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Krista, for the motion. We'll move next to the Salmon Advisory subpanel. I'll look for a discussion or a motion there. Uh, Mr. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I do have a motion. It's on the screen. I move the council make the following appointments to the Salmon Advisory Subpanel. Washington Troll Fisheries, Mr. Ryan Johnson. Oregon Troll Fisheries, Mr. Garris Peak. California Troll Fisheries, Mr. George Bradshaw. Gillnet Fisheries, Mr. Bryce Devine. Processor, Mr. Gerald Reinhold, Washington Charter Boat Operator, Mr. Michael Sawin, Oregon Charter Boat Operator, Mr. Mike Sorensen, California Charter Boat Operator, Mr. John Atkinson, Washington Sport Fishery, Mr. Dave Johnson, Oregon Sport Fisheries, Mr. Richard Heap, Idaho Sport Fisheries, I believe we'll be advertising again for that position so we don't have a person to propose at this time. California Sport, two positions, Mr. James Stone and Mr. Jim Yarnell. Tribal Fisheries, Washington Coast, Mr. John Pink. Tribal Representative from California, Mr. Justin Alvarez. And Conservation Group, Ms. Megan Waters. Thank you, Phil, for the motion. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is. 
And it looks like Pete Hossamer has second your motion. Uh, please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to thank all of those who participated over the last three years on this very important advisory subpanel. I uh, appreciate your service. And I believe we have before us a very a, a group of very well qualified individuals who are going to who have a lot of expertise to bring to the council process and will assist the council in making de decisions on salmon management matters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? All right. I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much for the motion. Uh, next, we will have the um, uh, Scientific and Statistical Committee and uh, look for discussion or motion there. Uh, Ms. Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move the council make the following appointments to the Scientific and Statistical Committee. Dr. Melissa Haltuck, Dr. Dan Holland, Dr. Kristen Marshall, Dr. Stephen Munch, Dr. Andre Punt, Dr. William Satterthwaite, and Dr. Jason Schaffler. Thank you uh, very much, Corey. Uh, is the language on the screen accurate and complete? It is. And I'll look for a second. Seconded by Brianna Brady. Thank you very much. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We are fortunate to have a talented and hardworking SSC. These individuals, almost all of them existing members, uh, will continue that tradition and help ensure that our decisions are based on the best available science. I appreciate their willingness to serve and look forward to having them as part of the council process. Um, and I'll note that there are two vacancies remaining and that these are intended to be reopened with a focus on individuals with expertise in oceanography and social science. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, is, are there any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on this motion? Not seeing any hands, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you very much, Corey, for the motion. And last but not least, we have the Habitat Committee. Uh, I'll look for discussion or a motion there. Uh, Ms. Brianna Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a motion. I move that the council make the following appointments to the Habitat Committee. Northwest or Columbia River Tribal Representative, no appointment at this time. California Tribal Representative, Mr. Barry McCovey, Commercial Fishing Industry, Mr. Glenn Spain, Sport Fishing Industry, Ms. Timothy Roy, Conservation Group, Dr. W. Walder Wakefield, at large two positions, Dr. Scott Hapel and Mr. Stephen Scheiblauer. All right, thank you. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? I believe so. All right, I'll look for a second. Seconded by Joe Oatman. Thank you, Joe. Please speak to your motion. We have another group of knowledgeable and well-qualified individuals to advise us on habitat issues, and I'm grateful for their willingness to participate. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brianna. Any discussion on this motion? All right. I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, uh, Rihanna, for the motion. So th that completes um, our task of advisory body appointments. Uh, but uh, you will have noticed that there are some positions uh, remain vacant. I'm going to ask Mike Berner to talk about um, 
our plans to fill those vacant positions, if that's okay, Mike. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as, as you noted, we have a few seats uh, left to be filled. Uh, our intent here, hearing, unless I hear other guidance from the council, would be to open uh, those positions for nominations shortly after this meeting, uh, probably with a due date sometime in February of 2022, with the hopes of getting uh, nominations uh, in time for your consideration at your March meeting. Um, you can look to the council's webpage and we'll send out notices through our various channels so that people are aware uh, when these open and what the deadlines on and are and how they can apply, uh, et cetera. Uh, the list of uh, vacancies that I intend to open shortly after this meeting, including one gap sports fisheries at large position. Uh, and as Heather mentioned, uh, this is um, we're looking for particularly expertise in Washington sport fisheries, uh, but not exclusively that. So it'd be open to all. But uh, we do have, uh, as we just went through, uh, representatives from Oregon and California lined up for the gap there. So we'd be looking for some northern expertise there. We have another seat on the gap, an at-large processor position that we'd look to open uh, over the winter. There is uh, one seat on the Salmon Advisory Subpanel at Idaho Sport Fisheries position that we did not get uh, a name for here, but I understand uh, there's interest in, of course, finding someone there, so we would be reopening that position. We have two at-large positions on the SSC that remain vacant after your action here. Uh, and as Corey mentioned, uh, we council is interested in some, particularly in some expertise in oceanography and or social sciences. Uh, but again, not exclusively that, but there's some expertise that we heard from the SSC that uh, they could use some, some help with. Uh, we have one seat on the Habitat Committee representing Northwest or Columbia River tribal uh, interests. And we will reopen for one seat on the HMS advisory sub panel, uh, that being for a processor north of Cape Mendocino. So uh, again, look for the, that announcement uh, sometime after this meeting uh, with deadlines or due dates uh, sometime in February would be, would be my guess at this time. So just stay tuned and uh, hope to get some, some names there. Thank you. All right, thanks for that, Mike. And I just want to make sure everyone around the table is comfortable with that plan to fill the remaining uh, vacant seats. See if there's any discussion there. All right, we seem to be in good shape there. So we'll come back to that uh, at our March meeting, presumably. So there are a number of ad hoc uh, appointments to be made. Um, well, those are my appointments. Uh, well, Mike, you got your hand up? Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. One thing I forgot to note, uh, for some of these positions that we're, we are reopening, there were some names that were nominated uh, for this meeting. Uh, I just, just for clarification, when we reopen these seats, we would ask that uh, folks that are interested in being considered uh, in the spring to uh, re-nominate themselves again. So we won't be carrying forward any nominations from this meeting, but uh, welcome those folks who are interested in, in, in continuing uh, uh, to pursue those seats to, to resubmit their names uh, in, the next, in the next round. Thank you. All right, thanks for that, Mike. Um, so uh, there are a number of ad hoc uh, appointments to be made, ad hoc committee appointments. And um, while those are my appointments, uh, that's not something I do without uh, consulting with the council and getting guidance from the various interests on the council. Um, so let me uh, run through those. Um, there is a vacancy on the ad hoc ecosystem work group. We'd like to thank uh, Dr. Andy Stevens for the contributions made to that body. But um, the new appointee uh, there is Dr. Kiva Oaken, and that's based on a recommendation from the National Marine Fishery Service. So uh, welcome, Dr. Oaken. Um, with regard to the gem pack and the gem tack bodies charged with, uh, uh, a lot of work in the field of electronic monitoring, uh, a lot of good work has been done and a lot of, a lot of time has been spent by the existing members of those bodies. Um, and, and they, they deserve a lot of thanks. Um, but we still have, uh, a, a, some distance to go there and, um, we're going to be adding a, a few people uh, here and uh, make, making some other changes uh, to hopefully uh, get us uh, across the finish line, so to speak, 
um, in, in the next uh, uh, six months. So um, uh, the uh, membership for the uh, gem pack, uh, after consulting with uh, council members, uh, these are the names, uh, Mr. Phil Anderson, um, council member from Washington uh, will be the new chair. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dave Hansen for all his hard work there. Uh, Mr. Paul Kujala, Ms. Melissa Mahoney, Ms. Heather Mann, and Mr. Brent Payne all remain on the committee. And uh, the new members uh, are uh, John Corbin from the Fixed Gear community, uh, Lisa Damrosh, Bottom Troll, uh, Bob Dooley, uh, council member, welcome Bob for pitching in on this, uh, Kate Cower, and uh, Mr. Ryan Wolf. Um, obviously, participation on the gym pack will include others who are not uh, formal uh, committee members, uh, such as the enforcement consultants and, and council staff. Now, there is a separate body dealing specifically with uh, enforcement. And um, there is uh, one change there. Uh, and I'll just, for the sake of completeness, I'll read off the new membership of the GEM TAC. Uh, Captain Chadwick, uh, Dan Colpo, uh, Lieutenant Ryan Howell, uh, Mr. Justin Cavanaugh, and Mr. Andrew Torres. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. John McVeigh for his contributions on that committee. Um, I think that was the only change there. So those, those are uh, the ad hoc appointments uh, I'm making at this meeting. And I wanna thank uh, all the council members who provided input here to make sure that we had uh, uh, a good composition on these bodies and as we, we, we seek to uh, to finish this project. So with that, uh, I will uh, turn, all right, um, I'm getting a text here. Um, I think there are two more names that I've left off um, because they weren't on my notes here uh, for the GEMTAC. Uh, also Lieutenant Jason Krause and Tracy Lorento. So my apologies, they were not on my notes here. So that completes the uh, uh, Brad Pettinger and Phil Anderson. I'll go to Brad first. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair Grelnick. I, I believe it was uh, Dave Copo. Um, I hate to think Dave has a, uh, a brother running around out there. So uh, I'm pretty okay. sure it's Dave Copo. Thank you very much. And I think uh, Phil had his hand up. Um, same reason. No, no All right. Thank you. Great. <laughs> All right. Is there anything else uh, for uh, any other comments uh, from the council on these ad hoc appointments? All right. Uh, I'm going to go back to Mike Verner and see how we're doing on this agenda item. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik, and thank you, Council Members, for moving through that large list of things expeditiously. I think you've completed your business here. You've adopted uh, some new language for COP9, and we will get that updated and posted uh, shortly after this session. You've also made quite a few uh, appointments. I won't summarize all of those here, but we will do our best to get those posted on our website. Uh, I'd like to welcome the new members and thank them for their participation. Also, of course, express echo a lot of the appreciation we've heard here for, for folks that will be uh, leaving our advisory bodies uh, as I typed up these lists preparing for the briefing book. Uh, it was kind of tough to not see some of some old friends and some, some people that have been in this council process for a long time. So I, I heartfelt appreciation for those folks and I wish them the best, particularly the gap had a lot of people uh, to move on and uh, Susan and Brett did just a wonderful job going through that and uh, I share those sentiments. So thanks to everyone. Welcome to the new members. Uh, 
And uh, everyone keep uh, an eye out for emails and posts on our website regarding the vacancies we went through. Uh, we still have a little business to do regarding some vacancies for this next term. And so I uh, encourage people to uh, throw their name in the hat. Thanks for the time. All right, thanks very much, Mike. And thanks uh, to the council for getting through that work expeditiously. Um, so we'll now go to agenda item E5. This is uh, carried forward from yesterday. We've had all the reports. We've had some council discussion. There may be some additional discussion, but uh, certainly we'll need to have uh, some motions for E5. So um, I'll look for some hands to get us started on E5 biennial management measures. Marcy Remco. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to note, um, the states uh, and others are sorting out um, some motions and order of motions, and I think we can wrap that up with about a three minute break. Okay. Or pause. Uh, or a pause. Um, why don't we, we, we did pretty well time wise on C9. So um, why don't we take uh, five minutes here? Uh, and that will not be our morning break. We'll later come to our morning break, but uh, I want to make sure that uh, you have the time you need. And so we'll come back at uh, 9.15 or 9.16 rather uh, or so. Is that okay, Marcy? Sounds great, thank you. All Sounds right. great, thank you. All right.
Mm-hmm. All right, it's uh, 9.16. Um, ask uh, Marcy Remco um, if you're ready now or if you think we need to extend this break. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would look to Sandra or Chris to reply. We, we did provide them with uh, an order of operations and not sure if they're pulled up and ready to go yet or not. Thanks. All right. Um, I'll look for a sign <laughs> from Sandra or Chris. I, I assume that means, um, well, we have our council action ahead of us. Um, so I, I'm simply going to open the floor at this point for any uh, discussion uh, that, that we need to have um, and then uh, welcome any motions. I'm sure there's a, a, a pretty a decent list of motions here on E5. So uh, look for some hands here, get us started. Marcy Uremko. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, believe we had uh, quite a bit of uh, discussion yesterday. Uh, I think we ended um, right where um, we needed to um, with the council comments uh, around the table um, with where we're looking to go with our management measures uh, in the next biennium. Um, appreciate the detailed conversation we had on a, on a number of points. Um, and I believe the series of motions that we have for you today uh, that should cover the suite of action items that we have to work from um, should, should get us uh, set up to move forward um, with further uh, overwinter analysis that'll be necessary um, on a number of these points. Uh, so with that, I, I think that Sandra might be ready. She um, at least has our, uh, our list of um, motions and the, the order in which uh, they're best organized for everyone. So with that, um, Sandra, if you're ready with CDFW1, Thank you. I move the council adopt the following alternatives for inclusion in the range considered for groundfish management measures in 2023 and 2024. Noting the numbering from E5 attachment one, November, 2021, the action item checklist. Action item number two, area management. Make minor adjustments to RCA coordinates to better align with bathymetry lines, depth contours, and to avoid crossovers, and to incorporate recommended modifications from enforcement and industry as described in E5A Supplemental CDFW Report 1, November 2021. Action item three, off the top. Adopt the following preliminary set-asides for 2023 and 2024. Research. The maximum historical research mortality should be used for set-asides for all species except yellow-eye rockfish and cow cod. For each of these species, the GMT shall determine the appropriate amount to set aside for research based on anticipated projects. The maximum historical IOA mortality for off the top deductions for all species except dark blotch rockfish, suggested deduction 9.8 tons, petroli sole, suggested deduction 11.1 tons, stablefish south, suggested deduction 25 metric tons, yellow eye rockfish, suggested deduction 2.66 metric tons, and near shore rockfish north, suggested deduction 1.3 tons to accommodate mortality in Iowa fisheries in 2023-2024. GMT recommendations from agenda item E5A, Supplemental GMT Report, Table 2. Thank you. 
for quillback rockfish, the quillback and copper rockfish off California include placeholders for off the top set asides for research, IOA fisheries, and approved EFPs for each of these species as necessary pending further overwinter analysis. Thank you. And then we'll be well, skipping uh, item four and coming back to that in a second. Um, action item five for ACTs. For CalCOD, a single ACT of 50 metric tons for south of 4010. Yellow eye rockfish, non trawl ACT of 39.8 metric tons in 2023 and 24. For quillback rockfish off California, include placeholders for ACTs for each of the groundfish fishery sectors off California that incur fishery mortality, pending further overwinter analysis. For copper rockfish off California, includes, include placeholders for ACTs below the minor nearshore complex ACLs for each of the groundfish fishery sectors off California, both north and south of 40 degrees, 10 minutes latitude, pending further overwinter analysis. And then uh, be skipping uh, six and seven, they'll be covered in another motion elsewhere um, and move to item eight for harvest guidelines, the state shares for stocks in a complex Adopt preliminary harvest guidelines for species managed within a complex. Blackgill rockfish within the slope rockfish south of 4010 complex, the status quo allocation scheme. For the Oregon black, blue, and Deacon complex, uh, there's no need for species specific harvest guidelines within the complex. For the Cabazon and Kelp Greenling complex, no need for species specific harvest guidelines within either the Oregon Cabazon Kelp Greenling Complex or the Washington Cabazon Kelp Greenling Complex. And for nearshore rockfish north of 4010 complex uh, by state, use the status quo sharing arrangement to set the state specific harvest guidelines as described in action item 11 of E5A Supplemental GMT Report 2. For quillback rockfish off California, include placeholders for harvest guidelines for each of the groundfish fishery sectors off California that incur fishery mortality, pending further overwinter analysis. For copper rockfish off California, include placeholders for harvest guidelines below the minor nearshore complex ACLs for each of the groundfish fishery sectors off California, both north and south of 40 degrees, 10 minutes latitude. Okay, Marcy, uh, it's, thank you for uh, that motion. It's uh, rather lengthy, but I wanna ensure that the language that appeared on the screen is accurate and complete. Yes, it is, thank you. All right, uh, I will look for a second. Seconded by Maggie Summer. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Marcy, please speak to your motion. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Gorelnik. Um, these recommendations largely follow from the GMT's uh, most detailed and excellent uh, series of reports to us. Um, there are a few additions that are included here um, that I just speak to uh, briefly. Um, in particular for quillback and copper rockfish off of California, um, now that we have uh, approved these stock assessments for use in management, um, we'll be needing to pull the uh, quillback rockfish off California um, out of the complex, which requires some, uh, some different treatment of it in our management measures uh, to attain the uh, state-specific standalone uh, ACL that will be established for quillback off California. Uh, in the case of copper rockfish, um, while we expect uh, 
copper will remain uh, in the complex um, both north and south of 4010. Uh, that's the minor nearshore rockfish complex. We do expect the need for um, specific harvest uh, guidelines or ACTs uh, for this um, stock. So there have been a few additional um, items here added um, for off the tops, ACTs and harvest guidelines to uh, allow for the development of those um, those numbers over winter. Um, so we've added um, placeholders here. I do wanna talk for a minute about um, the off the top set asides. Um, first, I wanna really uh, acknowledge and appreciate the work of the GMT on short order um, on their um, Saturday off to do their best to um, pull us um, some numbers to get a, a first look at what some necessary off the tops might be, uh, particularly for quillback rockfish. Um, noting we'll also need them for copper. Um, it appears from this initial look that um, the set asides for quillback um, will be minimal. And, and that's that's good uh, in the sense that we'll be deducting those set asides from the ACL and the remaining um, amount will be used to inform our fishery harvest guideline um, on these stocks. Um, however, I just want to flag that um, the ACLs and harvest guidelines that we'll be managing, or the ACLs that will um, come from the analyses uh, forthcoming um, are going to be extremely constraining. Uh, and in the case of Quillback, we're probably looking at a smaller ACL for all of California um, than uh, we may have been working uh, under um, the, the the sheer number uh, is likely to be smaller than what we were working on uh, with for either cow cod or yellow eye in in their um, period of time when they were the um, at their lowest abundance. So, um, how these set asides work out, um, we'll be keeping a close eye on it. Um, uh, again, uh, cautiously optimistic that um, that these uh, set asides will um, that we will accommodate them out of the ACLs and um, not need major um, decision making or adjustments. Um, but I think uh, the message remains the same, and that's that every fish is going to count. So. Um, we've got some work ahead of us in the <laughs> accounting department uh, from these um, non-target uh, fishery activities to do. Um, on that front, I guess I'd, I'd just like to take this opportunity to flag uh, in the case of Quillback uh, off of Northern California um, that um, given what we did see uh, in the uh, directed Pacific halibut fishery. Uh, there, there were um, encounters with quillback rockfish uh, that we'll need to um, address. Um, so I do expect that looking forward to um, next uh, fall, um, when we take our, or maybe it's June, when we take our first look at directed fishery measures uh, for Pacific halibut for 2023, um, I'm expecting that we'll want to discuss um, impacts in California to quillback rockfish um, and the uh, RCA line on the shoreward side where we expect the cool back encounters might uh, be coming from. So that's, I just want to flag that as um, 
something new that we've identified in our discussions this week that um, we'll be wanting to um, to work through as a result of the expected um, ACL and ACT for California Quillback. Um, I think that covers my remarks for, for this motion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Okay. Are there any uh, questions uh, for the maker of the motion? Uh, Keely Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Marcy. Um, I just had a quick question on copper rockfish. Um, and I was trying to look back at the SSC recommendation um, you know, following from the recommendation to pool together the two California copper stock assessments, um, there was also a recommendation, though, to recognize um, the differences in recruitment and estimated trajectory between those areas north and south of Point Conception. Um, and I don't see in your motion a specific recognition of additional management measures at that 3427 line. Um, and I apologize if this is expected to come through either in a, a separate motion or for further development at the March or April meetings, but I did want to make sure that I, I asked about it. Thank you. Marcy. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Keely, uh, for the acknowledgement on that point. Yes, um, I'm uh, very much um, alert to that potential need. I think we have the flexibility here under action item eight, um, the last bullet um, for copper rockfish off California include placeholders for harvest guidelines below the complex level both north and south of 4010. I would um, I would interpret that um, that gives us the flexibility for south of 4010 uh, if we wish to uh, establish a specific harvest guideline just for the area south of of Conception 3427. That uh, would be um, an HG that would fall below that um, that complex that's established for all of south of 4010. So um, I think by signaling here our intent to use harvest guidelines uh, as the tool, uh, we do have the flexibility to, to do that um, with it contained within this bullet point. Thanks, that'd be my intent, thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, Kaylee, does that address your question adequately? Yes, thank you very much. All right, are there uh, further questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on the motion? I'm not seeing any hands, I will call the question. All those in favor of this motion say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Uh, Marcy, thank you very much uh, for the motion. And let us continue this parade of motions. Um, I think we may have a, a motion uh, for tribal fisheries. Joe? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's all wait for Sandra to pull up the motion. Thank you, Sandra. So this deals with the tribal motion under E5 biannual measures for 2023 to 2024. I move that the council adopt the preliminary tribal set aside as shown in item E. 5A Supplemental Tribal Report 2, November 2021. All right, thank you, Joe. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? It is, Mr. Chairman. All right, uh, we'll look for a second. Seconded by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Joe, please speak to your motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so the Macaw and Coastal Tribe provided supplemental reports those being supplemental travel reports one and two respectively as part of this 
within the item uh, in regarding uh, their intent to harvest grown fish during the 2023 to 2024 management years. The intent of this motion is to adopt the preliminary tribal set asides requested by the coastal tribes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe, for the motion. Um, see if there's any discussion on the motion or questions for the maker of the motion. Not seeing any hands, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Uh, Joe, thank you very much for the motion. Um, I think we have next uh, a motion, uh, Heather Hall. Heather, you're, mute, you're muted. Thank you, Chair Groundlick. I knew you'd tell me if I were. <laughs> um, good morning, and uh, thank you, Sandra and Chris, for this, putting the motion on the screen. Um, I move that the council adopt the following preliminary alternatives as recommended by the GMT in supplemental GMT report to November 2021 for analysis. Action item number six, two-year trawl and non-trawl allocations. Adopt the status quo preliminary two-year trawl, non-trawl allocations. Action item number seven, amendment 21 allocation changes. Maintain the status quo 40% trawl, 60% non-trawl percentages for Lincoln South of 4010 North Latitude. And action item number 11, within non-trawl high-risk guidelines, ACTs or shares, um, limited entry, open access, and recreational adopt the preliminary status quo two-year within non-trawl harvest guidelines or shares. All right. Is that uh, language accurate and complete? Yes, it is. And before I ask for a second, I see that Todd Phillips has his hand up. Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Hall, I have a question regarding action item number six. You'll notice on the action item checklist, we have it broken out into six and six B. I just wanted to confirm that what you have here on the screen also uh, includes six B, which is rebuilding species allocations specific to yellow eye rockfish. Thank you. Evan? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Todd, for that. It it does include that. Sorry, it's not clear. All right. So, uh, Todd, you have something further? Okay. So, we have a motion before us, and I will look for a second. Seconded by Marcy Remco. Uh, Heather, please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, so, I, these, um, recommendations follow along what we saw from the, the GMT. They are largely um, looking at status quo. I know the GMT did a thorough job at looking at historical mortal mortality and sector attainment um, to evaluate the need for changes. Um, I would say uh, overarching here, we know that these are preliminary allocations for analysis and they can be further refined in April. Um, let's see. Okay. I think that's it. Yep. Thank you. Just making sure. Uh, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, uh, that's okay. I'm done. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. Thank you for the motion, Heather. Let's see if there are any questions for the maker of the motion. Any discussion on the motion? All right, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Heather, for the motion. 
So um, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I'd like to offer a motion. I move the council adopt the following alternatives for inclusion in the range of ground fish management measures in 2023 and 2024 for further analysis and review. Using numbering from E5 attachment one, November 2021, the action item checklist. Action item nine, within trawl allocations, remove this item from the checklist. Action item 10, within trawl set asides at sea whiting. Request that the GMT evaluate whether there's a need for an at sea set aside for Pacific spiny dogfish and to recommend a set aside amount if appropriate. Status quo for existing set asides. Action item 12B, directed short belly rockfish prohibition. Move this item out of the 2023-2024 biennial management measures process and in March 2022, underground fish workload and new management measure priorities, consider prioritization and scheduling of a standalone ground fish FMP amendment for this purpose. Action item 13, shore-based IFQ trip limits, status quo trip limits for non-IFQ species in the IFQ fishery. Additional spiny dogfish request Request the GMT, heard me, I'm comparing versions and I <clears throat> think that I owe Sandra a thanks for uh, catching a little bit of lost text there. Request the GMT to evaluate potential management measures to control catch of spiny dogfish in groundfish fisheries if the ACL is exceeded or projected to be exceeded including but not limited to the use of block area closures and bycatch reduction areas. All right, thank you uh, for the motion. Maggie, is the language accurate and complete? Yes, it is, thanks. And I'll look for a second. Uh, Heather Hall's hands been up. Heather, is that for a second? Okay, uh, I'll look for a second, seconded by Heather Hall. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Uh, thank, Maggie, please speak to your motion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, item nine is no longer necessary, as the GMT noted. Uh, those former allocations were converted to at sea set asides, as, or, or pardon me, set asides as part of Amendment 21. Uh, for number 10, uh, it's given the uh, range of specifications adopted for uh, Pacific spiny dogfish. I would like to ask the GMT to consider whether there's a need for set-asides for spiny dogfish uh, and what amount, if appropriate, um, recognizing that uh, analysis as well as further, uh, pardon me, I, um, I note that the GMT has already provided some information on sector catches in their report under E3 in the report one, and that that would be uh, helpful to inform an evaluation of this. For uh, the other set asides, um, status quo at this point, recognizing that further analysis and as well as the tribal requests under this agenda item could necessitate further consideration in April, 2022. For 12B, short belly rockfish uh, provided rationale uh, in the ODFW report earlier. Uh, this is not necessary to proceed as part of the millennial management measures package uh, on this time frame for implementation January 20, pardon me, January 1st, 2023. So I'm recommending that we consider it uh, um, uh, along with other potential ground fish management measures for prioritization and scheduling. My intent is not to lock us into a standalone FMP amendment process if in the future um, it seems that there is could be some efficiency gained by packaging it with uh, an FMP amendment that we are working on for another reason, but uh, simply to specify here that it will not be part of the ground fish management measures. Uh, process. Number 13, uh, the GAP and GMT recommended status quo. There were no requests for changes to the non-IFQ trip limits in that in the IFQ fishery. 
And then the additional spiny dogfish request coming back around to uh, thinking about the new specifications we will end up with for that stock, uh, like the GMT to explore whether management measures might be needed and uh, what could be used, including block area closures or bycatch reduction areas, uh, but potentially other measures that the GMT might recommend uh, or considerate for our consideration as well. Thanks. All right, thank you uh, very much, uh, Maggie. Are there any uh, questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on the motion? And not seeing any hands, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, uh, Maggie, for the motion. Okay, we still have uh, some items on the checklist uh, not yet addressed. I'll look for another motion. Uh, Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Grilnick. I have another motion to offer. Thank you, Sandra and Chris. Let's see. I move that the council adopt the following preliminary alternatives as recommended by the GMT in supplemental GMT report three. November 2021 for analysis. 14A, open access fisheries, open access fixed gear fisheries north of 4010 uh, for the open access stable fish daily trip limit, detail fishery north of 36 north latitude, look at the status quo, uh, which maintains a 600 pound daily limit in the detail fishery. Thank you. Option two, remove the 600 pound daily limit um, it, with the weekly and bi monthly limits remaining the same. Action item 14, open access fixed scare fisheries south of 4010, status quo alternatives. Action item 15A, limited entry fixed scare north of 4010 for the limited entry fixed gear sable fish fishery south of 36. Look at the status quo, 1,700 pounds per week with 5,100 pounds per two months. And in option one, that looks at 2,400 pounds per week and 4,800 pounds per two months. Action item 15B, limited entry fixed gear fishery south of 4010 north latitude. Again, for limited entry, fixed gear sable fish south of 36. Status quo um, alternative of 2,500 pounds weekly trip limit. Action item 15C, limited entry, fixed gear primary fishery. Uh, extend the limited entry, fixed gear primary sable fish fishery tier, sable fish tier fishery end date from October 31 to December 31. And under this one, provide additional guidance to the GMT um, for the above action items included in 14 and 15 to look at uh, trip limits, RCA changes, et cetera, that consider the new harvest specifications for copper, quillback, and vermilion or other species as needed. Action item 16 through 18 which is Washington, California, and Oregon Recreational. Um, the states and the GMT as needed will analyze routine measures such as bag limits, season structures, depth limits, and length limits, et cetera, that keep catch from exceeding harvest targets. Recommend that the GMT exploring, explore new and available data to inform species specific, depth dependent mortality rates for discards using descending devices for copper, quillback, and vermilion rockfish. If those values are readily available and can be incorporated into the current discard mortality estimation framework, the expectation would be they could be implemented for recreational discards as soon as possible, uh, for example, in 2022.
All right, uh, Heather, is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is. And I will look for a second. Uh, Maggie, your hand is up. I assume that's for the second. Let me know if otherwise. All right, so I guess that was seconded by Maggie. Uh, so please, uh, Heather, please speak to your motion. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just run through these here for 14 A and B. Um, this looks at routine ad adjustments for the open access fixed gear sector, um, north and south of 4010. It includes an alternative that, as I mentioned, removes the daily trip limit uh, for the sablefish detail sector. It captures um, an interest by the gap to look at that. Um, under number 15, um, looking at alternatives um, for the weekly and monthly um, limits for sablefish um, in the south under number 15, uh, status quo, status quo uh, at the time the, the GMT hadn't um, received any alternatives to explore over the winter. And then for the primary sablefish tier fishery, which is uh, 15C, uh, look at extending uh, the season date here through the specs process. Um, we know that under all of the P-STAR choices that the council's considering, uh, there'll be higher ABCs for sablefish. Um, having a season extension could provide uh, that sector with more opportunity to catch these higher limits. So it seems appropriate to put it in here. I didn't uh, hear any red flags from the GMT on uh, including this in the specifications uh, package. Um, and just calling out that um, in this analysis and, and looking at these trip limit alternatives, under um, action items 14 and 15 um, that the council hasn't um, included overhauling the stock complex, stock complexes in the harvest specifications action, um, but trip limits uh, will likely be needed so that we can effectively manage the individual species within a complex um, to their component ACL. And I should say that that is also going to be um, needed for numbers, action items 16, 17, and 18. So didn't mean to describe that just for 14 and 15, but um, we'll want that flexibility um, to, to be able to look at that um, in the upcoming biennium. Uh, Moving on to the recreational fisheries, this really just is the analysis of routine management measures like depth restrictions, bag limits, and size limits as needed for our fisheries. And again, um, looking at management measures that will um, help us uh, either through in-season or, um, or pre-season identify um, what is needed to keep stocks managed in a complex uh, to their component ACLs. And then the gap suggested the recommendation that um, we look at expanding discard mortality credit for the use of descending devices. I think uh, we know um, this will be important looking ahead if that information is available. And I've heard that there's already been some um, exploration of that um, and uh, that it's not a huge lift to look at that. I, I know all three states will benefit from the exploration um, as we look at into the 23-24 biennium. So that's it. I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Heather. Are there any questions for Heather on this motion? Keely Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Heather, for the motion. Um, I did have a couple of questions on action item 15C, the limited entry fixed gear primary fishery season extension. 
Um, I'll, the first question for you is um, noting that the council has taken this action um, as a temporary measure um, through emergency rulemaking uh, for two years in a row, and both times included an extension of the incidental halibut retention provisions for the portion of this fishery that is allowed to do so. Does your um, motion and your um, alternative suggested for further development include consideration of that or would that be something that is not being considered at this time? And I'll, I'll seek your answer and then I'll ask my other question if that's all right. Um, thank you for the question, Keely. I, if it's, uh, I, I, I'll be honest, I didn't think about that, um, putting the those two requests together, um, it makes sense to do that. Um, and if it can be done through the specs package, I'd like to clarify that if, if that extension of halibut retention um, could be allowed. But maybe since I haven't given it any thought and I don't know if others have either, it might not be appropriate to include it here. Do you have a Thanks. follow-up? I do. <laughs> yes, I, I don't have any further um, thoughts on the incidental halibut piece. I just realized it wasn't specifically called out. It also is something that um, I had not thought about. The reason being um, in our NIMS report under specs, um, as well as in the GMT report under specs, um, we note that um, we don't see a need for this particular measure to be implemented by January 1, 2023. Um, I am wondering if you could speak to a little bit more the reasoning behind including this in specs um, in light of these two reports noting the lack of a tie. Thank you. Heather? Yeah, thank you, Chair Grelnick. Thank you, Keely, for the question. Um, I did note in the GMT report that there wasn't a need for this to be implemented by January 1, but also that that there wasn't any red flags with the workload for including it. And in the GAP report, uh, similarly, um, just hoping to have uh, whatever approach would be the quickest to ensuring that this is in place uh, for, for 2023. And if the specs is it, you know, I'd like for for consideration, uh, at least preliminary. Okay. Keely. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just note that um, I am not comfortable with including this in specs at this time um, due to the other workload. Um, and so while everything else in this motion I, I see as very prudent uh, measures for further development, um, when it comes time to vote on this motion, I will abstain just for this sole reason that um, I really do think the council needs to be mindful of the overall workload of specifications. We have already projected for the council um, in this NIMS report that was released prior to the council meeting our concerns with all of the specific actions um, that are not tied to January 1, but did want to take this moment to explain my rationale um, for abstaining. Thank you. All right, thank you, Keely. A any further questions uh, for the maker of the motion or any discussion on this motion? Chuck Tracy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess I will just um, comment on, on Ms. Kent's uh, comments. Um, you know, I, <clears throat> I have started to see some things sort of uh, creep into the specs uh, in management measure process here that, um, you know, I, that uh, perhaps aren't essential for January 1 implementation. Um, I'm, I'm uh, pretty much in her camp that uh, to the extent that we can, we should keep uh, keep this to very essential uh, management measures, particularly when it comes to new management measures or, or sort of things that don't seem like a big lift, uh, but when you get uh, several of them um, included, and I, I suspect there's more coming, um, that we need to take a, um, 
take a look at what uh, what our capacity is. Um, I think there's some things that, well, I think there is some council staff capacity. I, again, I think there's trade-offs here, and I guess I would urge caution on just, you know, sort of the uh, incremental uh, increase in the assumption that things are not uh, too difficult to do, so let's do them. Um, again, I think there's some room for that, but I uh, just want to urge caution. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Uh, Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, um, Heather, Keeley, and Chuck, uh, for this discussion. Um, I guess I just like to offer my perspective on where we're at uh, here in November in um, building our range of alternatives and um, acknowledging that uh, each biennial cycle, we are always pressed with trying to keep the box manageable and that um, things uh, do have a tendency to come in uh, late and add um, analytical challenge. Um, but I think I'd also uh, reflect on what our intent is with our biennial uh, management measures process here. Um, I've always viewed this agenda item um, as the, the core of the work we do to manage our groundfish fisheries, and particularly with um, adjustments that I, I'm going to just characterize as routine, um, which include um, seasons, depths, bag limits, trip limits. Um, those tools um, have always been in this toolbox. Um, we have made seasonal adjustments um, in the specs uh, pretty, pretty regularly. Um, that's not to say that there aren't particular issues here that um, that should be considered on this particular uh, season request. Um, I certainly um, appreciate that there may be some, um, but I'm just considering the the general um, approach that we've always taken to specs. Uh, which has been to that this is the time every two years to reconsider uh, changes to those routine measures. Um, I know that, you know, in cycles past, we have made adjustments, I mean, just last cycle to, um, to seasons in California, um, changing some commercial seasons to allow additional months. Um, and then over the past several cycles, we've iteratively uh, increased season lengths um, per the advice of our stakeholders um, that we're seeking to um, maximize their number of fishing days or fishing opportunities uh, or to ensure um, more year round um, access uh, by markets to, to fish. So um, I don't have uh, any Real thoughts on the specifics here. Uh, I realize this is a long standing um, end date uh, that um, might require some additional uh, analysis and, and consideration, but I, I just um, wouldn't want to give impressions that this, this package that we do every two years um, isn't the place to be considering routine adjustments. Um, and for, for that reason, um, I, I do support continuing to keep it in the range for now. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Marcy. Uh, any further discussion on this motion? All right, uh, not seeing any hands, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Keely Kent. Keely Kent abstains. Uh, the motion passes unanimously with one abstention. 
All right. Um, I think there's still something left on our checklist, so I'll look for another motion. Uh, Marcy Remco. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that Sandra CDFW two. Thank you. So uh, this motion will address item 12 D and E in the checklist. I move the council approve the following items from action item 12 new management measures to be included in the range considered for groundfish management measures in 2023 and 2024. 12 B rebuilding analysis for quillback rockfish off of California. Per the GMT recommendation in agenda item E5A, GMT supplemental report three, include additional runs of an SPR harvest rate at 0.55 and 0.65 to further examine the trade-offs of alternative rebuilding strategies. Use a lower 2022 projected fishery mortality of 11.9 metric tons per table 11, agenda item E7A, supplemental CDFW report two. For copper rockfish south of Point Conception, a rebuilding analysis is available for use if needed. Moving to 12E, groundfish retention in the non-trawl rockfish conservation area using only non-bottom contact hook and line gear including no dingle bar, no long line, and no vertical hook and line gear that is anchored to the bottom, similar to requirements in the 21-22 management measures. This would be a management measure to reduce nearshore fishery effort and bycatch on overfished or precautionary nearshore stocks, while also avoiding bottom contact and benthic species of concern. All right, thank you, Green, accurate and complete. Yes, it is, thank you. And I will look for a second. Seconded by Bob Dooley. Marcy, please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll start with 12D, the rebuilding analysis for quillback rockfish. Uh, appreciate uh, and concur with the GMT's recommendation to include additional runs of the SPR harvest rate uh, to give us um, a little refinement um, in the alternatives so that we're able to examine the trade-offs. Um, we had previously acted on this and approved a, a tentative uh, list of 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and 0 0.7, and I think having some two additional uh, marks in there will, will help us um, make some decisions when the time comes. Uh, with regard to the projected fishery mortality for 2022 of 11.9 metric tons, uh, that number comes from our action under the in-season agenda item yesterday, where we took some actions to uh, reduce catch um, next year uh, in hopes that we keep some additional fish in the bank so that when we rerun the rebuilding analysis, um, it might uh, aid us with our, <clears throat> excuse me, our resulting um, ACLs for 2023 and beyond. Uh, speaking to copper rockfish south of Point Conception, uh, as noted by the GMT, um, a rebuilding analysis was adopted by the council under our action this week under E2. Uh, that analysis is there um, if needed. Um, we are expecting, um, per the SSC's recommendation, um, a combined California um, assessment uh, or, or combining the, the assessments for the, the two California uh, regions for copper rockfish um, that would then um, make um, a rebuilding plan for south of Conception um, not necessary 
but we are continuing to keep um, the rebuilding plan um, here and available to us uh, per our action under E2. Um, moving to 12E, this is about uh, groundfish retention in the non-trawl RCA. Um, this was a measure that was uh, brought to the council by the GAP this meeting. Uh, as you might recall, the GMT didn't have an opportunity to analyze it, um, but it is uh, on our list and available for consideration. Um, I'm thinking back to our discussion yesterday about the need for um, putting our heads together um, and thinking about um, how we effectively manage our nearshore fisheries um, in order to um, keep our coastal communities afloat. And um, this concept uh, would be a measure that would reduce nearshore fishery effort and bycatch on these overfished or precautionary nearshore stocks while also avoiding bottom contact and benthic species of concern. Uh, the approach uh, envisioned by the gap here is quite similar to the action that we took uh, in June of 2019 uh, for uh, the 2021 uh, or 20, 20 and 21 uh, management measures um, where we um, recommended the use of um, hook and line gear uh, in a portion of the RCA uh, north of 4010 in that region between 30 and 40 fathoms where um, hook and line gear would be authorized for use um, excluding dingle bar and long line gear. Um, additionally, a kind of a, a clarification of that language or an additional uh, uh, thing that has been identified that also um, should not be authorized is vertical hook and line gear that anchor that is anchored to the bottom. So um, what the gap is asking for and, and what I think we should be asking for or, or analyzing uh, as we head to March um, is a, a measure that would um, allow for hook and line uh, fishing in some portion of the RCA uh, to, to again, reduce the effort um, in the near shore um, and to minimize the uh, bycatch that um, is expected on quillback uh, and copper rockfish. Um, those bycatch um, events are expected to be quite significant just looking um, at the information presented to us in the in-season action um, in the CDFW report, um, once we reduce uh, the, um, the catch levels so that um, catch cannot be retained, um, we expect significant throwbacks and consequently significant uh, discard mortality. Uh, both to copper and quillback rockfish. So evaluating this management measure um, toward our goal of using our measures overall to attain our suite of groundfish specifications, um, I'd like to see this item included in the range. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Marcy, uh, for the motion. Uh, let's see if there are any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on the motion. Keely Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Marcy, for the motion. Um, I do have some questions on 12E, um, and maybe as a starting place, um, I was wondering if you could crosswalk um, us between what this alternative is intended to cover in comparison to what was adopted in the ROA earlier in this meeting under E6. I may have follow-up questions after that, but that seems like a good place to start. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Keely. Um, I guess I would note that um, 
I view these actions as separate. They are different. They are um, on their own trajectories. Um, I view our management measures that um, accompany our biennial specifications as being um, the, the vehicle that we've always used to um, make adjustments to measures so that we attain the specifications. I do not see the action in E6 being aimed at attaining the specifications. Um, so I view the, the goals of each being very different. I recognize there is some similarity in the content contained in the range proposed uh, or recommended by the council yes, uh, yesterday in E6 um, that does uh, have similar content. Um, but I also, um, I think, want to flag that um, the specs is a, is a different or the management measures associated with specs serves a different purpose. Um, I'd also note that we took a nearly identical action uh, just last June in 2019. Um, with that said, this particular recommendation for inclusion in the range would be um, limiting hook and line gear use in a portion of the non troll RCA uh, to exclude dingle bar long line and vertical hook and line gear that's anchored to the bottom, which is very similar, nearly identical to the requirements that um, e exist right now, uh, presently in regulation between our 30 and 40 fathoms north of 4010. Um, so in terms of the crosswalking, um, I'm not prepared to do that right here and now. Um, I can I can acknowledge that the the range, um, as it's been described in E6, um, does include similar, um, but not the same content. So um, I think I'd I'd leave it there. Thank you. Uh, Keely, do you have a follow up? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, I, I feel like I'm not getting the specificity that would be necessary to be able to provide um, feedback for the council the next time this is taken up. So I will keep asking to see maybe on these specifics. Um, you mentioned that this would be a portion of the RCA. So um, I take that, take that to mean that this would not apply for the RCA non troll RCA off of Washington, Oregon, and California. And I'm wondering if you can provide more specifics on what that portion that it will be considered should be. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Keely. No, I'm not prepared to offer that specificity here and now. And um, again, I'm, I'm looking at the fact that it's November. I'm looking at the council's discussion that we've had under this agenda item and our expressed intent that we look to find solutions so that we attain our specifications in 2023 and 2024. I believe this might be one viable solution. It's, a, it's something we've used in our specs uh, measures in the past. So um, I'm, I'm not hearing um, exactly why uh, there's a reason we cannot analyze it with more specificity as um, new information uh, uh, unfolds. Um, you know, I think we have to also acknowledge, as we have throughout this series of motions in this agenda item, that there there are numbers yet to come that we have not seen yet and considered in the full suite of materials. So it's very difficult um, without having um, a complete list of specifications and um, other measures such as uh, harvest guidelines, uh, ACTs. Um, it's very difficult, I think, to 
to add additional clarity or specificity on what may or may not um, or what what words may follow from this concept. So um, I apologize. Uh, again, I'm I'm not feeling like we have that type of specificity around any of these other alternatives that uh, we've approved here today. Um, and certainly I welcome uh, receiving some written um, input from National Marine Fisheries Service uh, in a report um, in advance of the next um, agenda item on this topic in March about what the sideboards are um, and what um, analysis will be necessary to um, accompany our recommended suite of management measures. Thanks. Keely, your hand is up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge, yes, I still feel like um, we would need more direction on what we would be providing input on. Um, I'm going to try one more time. Um, just again, I, I think there are similarities between what has been taken up under the non trial RCA action, and there have been some sideboards set up already under this, that action, and it would be easier to provide. Uh, the feedback that it sounds like the council is interested in from the National Marine Fisheries Service at the next meeting with some acknowledgement about whether those sideboards are being considered or not. So specifically, I'll note that um, we've had a lot of discussion under E6 as to whether or not we are moving the EFP gears that were specifically tested tested into regulation or if it's a broader take um, with more flexible gear types, um, such as including artificial lures versus baited lures. Um, also, that action looked at allowing the limited entry fixed gear folks to fish up to their limited entry fixed gear limits using this gear type in the, in the non-trawl RCA. So I'd be interested if that um, should be considered as something for further development in March or April under this agenda item. And then additionally, we have heard from the enforcement consultants um, related to some sideboards on the enforceability of allowing these gear types to be operating in a very large closed area, um, specifically additional declarations, gear definitions, and prohibitions on carrying multiple gears on board. Um, those kind of sideboards that we have discussed previously is what I was looking for to understand whether or not they are under consideration for this agenda item. I'll note that while there certainly there is opportunity for further development over winter, the rest of the specs timeline with meetings in March and April and then final action in June really doesn't leave a lot of time for further refinement between those meetings. And so if the council is seeking specific input from the agency, um, as well as from any other of our partners in management, um, including the enforcement consultants, it would be helpful to have um, to know whether everything is on the table or whether there are certain items that are not worth our time um, because the council is expected not to try to move those pieces forward. So. I think for now that concludes our remarks just in terms of questions, but I, I do, I have a broader statement, but I'll perhaps pause and see if, if Marcy has any further response to that. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Keely, if it is um, uh, desirable on the part of National Marine Fisheries for me to indicate now that um, the starting place for analysis um, of this alternative is um, consistent with the content in the motion for E6, um, that that's reasonable to me as a starting place. I, I honestly was trying to keep this narrow and simple. And there were a lot of things that came up in E6 that were, um, I'd say new. <laughs> Um, and I think we we took a very um, we, we did discuss them at length. And um, if there is a need um, in this in the management measures to attain the specs, if National Marine Fisheries um, identi has identified those needs and they must be um, accounted for in the uh, 23 24 management measures. Then yes, I would say that is that is my intent, um, 
if that is what is needed to keep this item within our range. So that again, the, I'm comfortable with um, agreeing that the that a starting point for analysis um, of this proposed item um, is consistent with the um, items that you just described verbally and that um, were an element of our E6 motion. Thanks. Uh, let me go to Chuck Tracy then before I go back to Keeley. Chuck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Marcy, for the clarification there. I guess, you know, when I, when I look at the motion that's uh, that's in, in displayed in front of us, um, I, I mean, if I was in, in my interpretation of this, if I was to be giving guidance to the GMT, um, that guidance would be that there, there aren't any new gears being considered, that uh, the area to be considered would be um, either, uh, or perhaps sideboards, either what is in regulation now and, or the entire RCA. Um, the, the, to me, those are the only two reasonable interpretations of, of what's on the screen. Um, and, and again, the, the gear is explicit um, as, as it's as explicit as it was in uh, 2019 when we adopted it for the current biennium. So, uh, to me, that would me that that's how that's how I would interpret that, and that's the guidance that uh, that I would be um, suggesting should the GMT need uh, need some, and I and I think they do need some uh, something to work with over the course of the winter. Um, particularly if, you know, uh, if the idea is that at some point um, at another council meeting in March and or April that um, some of these other concepts might come in, uh, that that's that's pretty late in the show for uh, for them to be tackling, uh, you know, a, a new type of analysis, I guess. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chuck. Uh, I um, and Keeley, uh, both, I think you have identified that it would help uh, the language of this motion to specify um, that we'd be considering um, ground fish retention in a portion of the non trawl RCA. Um, when I think about the uh, the swath of area covered in the non trawl RCA, it does extend um, all the way um, up into Washington. And I believe the action we took under E6 um, was limited to um, the area from uh, the Washington, Oregon border south to Point Conception. Um, so I'd be more than happy um, if, if that is the um, if, if that will help um, move this ahead, that, that type of um, additional um, specificity, certainly willing to entertain an amendment to do that. Keeling? Oh, my apologies. Um, I do have further remarks for discussion, but I, I will hold them for now. Apologies for leaving my hand up. All right, no worries. So um, we have a motion before us. There's been some uh, conversations about uh, perhaps um, making some changes to clarify scope. Um, as the maker of the motion, Marcy cannot offer that amendment. So if there is interest uh, here to do that, we'll need a hand. Maggie Summer. Uh, thank you, Chair. I would offer an amendment. Please go ahead. After, uh, on the top line, after non trawl rockfish conservation area, please insert, uh, pardon me, this would be the top line of 12E. Exactly there, thank you. Please insert 
between the Washington Oregon border and Point Conception, California. That concludes the amendment. Okay, Maggie, I see that language been highlighted. Um, it's simple enough. I can confirm that that is exactly what you said. Um, and so I will look for a second. Seconded by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. We're all getting tired here. Uh, please speak to your amendment as necessary. Thank you, Chair. Just following up on our discussion, uh, adding a little specificity in a geographic area that this would apply to, and this would make it the same as the area covered by uh, uh, this item in the Council's action under E6. All right. Thank you. Maggie, is there any discussion on the amendment? I'm not seeing any hands. I'll call the question on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? All right, the motion to amend passes unanimously. We're back to the main motion here as amended. Is there further discussion on this motion? Todd Phillips. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, this is just a clarifying question regarding the mo well, not regarding the motion before us on 12E. Um, two questions, or I guess three questions. First two regard that I want, would like to confirm that this is for LEFG, limited entry fixed gear, and open access fixed gear, and that is for directed ground fish as opposed to any other type of, uh, especially for OA. Um, additionally, that we are uh, looking at the entire non trawl RCA and not specific depths or depth boundaries. And also, um, would this apply in any way, shape, or form to limited entry trawl? Um, I don't, I think I know the answers to those, but I'm hopeful that uh, clarifying that would cement them, those facts in my head. Thank you. All right, thank you, Todd. Uh, I think we'll go to the maker of the motion, Marcy Remco, to provide any clarification on the intent of the motion. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, take the easy one first. Um, this action would be for the non-trawl rockfish conservation area, so would not apply to the trawl fishery. Um, I believe you asked about depth constraints. Um, I um, probably should have uh, requested um, the maker of the amendment to include the phrase um, of ground fish retention in a portion of the non trawl RCA between the Washington, Oregon border and point conception, because yes, I, I do believe um, the intent here would be to uh, look at um, using depth constraints, specifically waypoints, um, to define uh, the portion of the RCA for which we might allow um, access with these uh, limited Ear types. Um, so perhaps if if that is the if I guess let let me start with asking if I answered your question. Questions. Todd. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Remco. Um, the one I guess I need to qual qualify one of my questions regarding limited entry trawl. That, those were gear switchers. I want to make sure that they would be included in part of this action as well. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Todd. Um, I believe that when uh, limited entry trawl uh, permittees are fishing under the gear switch alternative, yes, they are subject to the non-trawl RCAs. Um, 
So I have no intention of, of doing anything differently here. Um, believe that's how things operate. So for those gear switchers, um, yes, they'd be considered part of the limited entry fishery um, using fixed gear. So that'd be my intent. Um, hopefully that clears it up. Thanks. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to, again, um, indicate I'd be happy to uh, have an amendment on the, the, port, the item regarding a portion of the non-trawl RCA. Okay. Uh, the maker of the motion is receptive to a friendly amendment uh, along those lines. If anyone wishes to make it or feels it's necessary, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair. I don't have an amendment to offer. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understood the, the distinction about a portion of, and maybe I'll just try stating my understanding of the motion before us. <laughs> uh, seek some clarification if I'm incorrect in any of it. Uh, but the intent would be to, uh, and and recalling that this is based on all the recommendations specifically under 12E that have been provided to us by our GMT and our, our ground fish, well, GMT did not have a recommendation, but the ground fish advisory subpanel. I understood the intent to be uh, allowing directed ground fish, open access and limited entry fixed gear fishing to occur in the entire portion of the non-trawl RCA uh, between the proposed northern and southern boundaries of this action using the specified gear types, which would be hook and line gear types, except dingle bar, bottom long line, and anchored vertical long line. Um, that, so that's my understanding of the intent. I, I did if I did not follow the additional discussion. I'm sorry on potential use of of depth lines. Uh, I assume that that is a reference to the potential for adjustment of RCA boundaries as needed to address catch of uh, overfish and other species. Uh, but I. I if I am incorrect in any of my interpretation, um, please, please, uh, please help there. And I guess I will also just say uh, in response to Todd's question about gear switching by the trawl fleet, uh, I, I had not contemplated that being a part of this action, uh, uh, although I suppose there is the potential for use of hook and line gear to access trawl quota under this action unless it is specified that that's not the intent. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Well, what are we gonna do here? Chuck Tracy, and then Mercy. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I, uh, first of all, let me just say that uh, I think Mark, um, I think Maggie and I are reading the, the motion in front of us the same, that this would apply to all depths um, within the, the RCA, whatever that is. Um, if the boundaries of the RCA changed, then that would apply to, to that. It would not, at this, the way it's phrased now, I don't believe it would um, allow this activity in some depth range of the RCA and not allow it in others, unless it's not just similar to the requirements in 2122, but is the same as those require those depth requirements in 2122. Um, but what I, I guess. Um, 
what I would suggest is that perhaps um, we take our morning break. Well, we have been at this for quite a long time. And so we will take our morning break here, unless there's any objections, and maybe some clarity will fall upon us. Um, we'll be back at 10.55.
All right, it's uh, 10.55 and we're back from our morning break. And uh, maybe we've got some, maybe we have some clarity here. So I'll look for a hand. And if I don't see a hand, I'm simply going to call the question because I'll assume there's no further discussion to be had. Marcy Uremko. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, uh, little bit of email uh, correspondence that I'm just trying to catch up with that came in over the break. Um, on the amendment language, um, I was reminded that um, copper rockfish is one of the species that we are looking to mitigate for uh, in this particular action. Um, when I indicated that I'd be willing to consider the physical geographic range uh, from the Washington Oregon border down to Point Conception. I was endeavoring to again be consistent with the content that we approved in agenda item E6. I started the discussion today not wanting to be consistent with E6 um, but felt like um, that was the will of others around the table. And consequently, I uh, felt that was a good starting place. Um, and I clearly heard some interest in limiting the geographic scope of application. Um, but that being said, I, I, I don't, I, on reflection, I do think it is not, um, not in our best interest to limit the southern extent of this action to point conception, but rather it should be extended to the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, we certainly are going to have trouble in Southern California um, achieving the new copper rockfish specifications. And we are looking for all tools to be able to do that. Um, so with that, uh, I would request that before we uh, take up the matter of the main motion, um, request maybe someone consider a friendly amendment to that to that item. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we've had that comment from Marcy uh, about the suggested need for uh, a friendly amendment. Um, I'll have to see if someone's willing to make it. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I would move to amend the motion by replacing point conception, this is under 12E, point conception with the U.S.-Mexico border. Okay, Phil, is that language uh, as you wish it? For the amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman, it is. All right, I'll look for a second. Bob Dooley, please speak to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As, as uh, Ms. Yurenko indicated that the issues that we have with particularly copper rockfish extend beyond and south of Point Conception. Uh, so the need 
to include the entire area from the Washington border to the U.S.-Mexico border gives uh, the council the flexibility to consider um, these measures um, throughout the range of copper rockfish. All right, thank you, Phil. Any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on the motion to amend? Not seeing any hands. Call the question on the motion to amend offered by Mr. Anderson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those no. Abstentions? And the motion to amend passes unanimously. We're now back to the main motion as amended. I'll look for any further discussion. Keely Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do just want to take a moment to recognize uh, my appreciation that um, we've made some additional inroads to providing specificity to this action. Um, I appreciate that um, some folks around the table weren't quite ready for that, um, but I do view this as really helpful in guiding um, what will come back next and our ability um, as, an, as the agency to provide um, the types of feedback that we think the council needs um, to see to further refine this action going forward. So um, express my appreciation. Um, I'll note um, I will be abstaining on this action, um, not because I don't think it's important to look at, um, but simply out of workload concerns. Um, I recognize, um, as I've stated earlier in this meeting, that what's happening under specifications um, is gonna bring a lot of um, difficult changes for several sectors of our fishery. Um, and I do think relief is needed, um, but I do see other viable pathways that could move alongside or in tandem with specifications um, should the council shift around their workload and their focus. So just recognizing that um, I think these kinds of flexibilities are important and should be discussed. I think there's still a fair amount of development that needs to happen. Um, we I will look to hear from our other management partners um, at the next time that we see this agenda item, but just note the limited time for um, substantial changes to what the council is looking at between the March and April meetings and the June meeting. Um, so simply out of workload concerns, we'll be abstaining. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that, Kaylee. Is there any further discussion on this agenda item? Rather on this motion, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do, and I appreciate its inclusion here um, as the maker of the motion under E6 that also contained the, the element similar to 12E here. I just wanted to speak to um, uh, the, the, I guess, the overlap between our actions on these two items. Uh, I think, you know, the, to use the words, uh, Keely just appropriately said, um, relief will be needed. Uh, due to some of the coming specifications, and that is relief for both our fishing communities, but also for the stocks of concern. And that, that latter part of it is really the connection I see here to the harvest specifications and management measures package. Um, it is does seem to be an important um, uh, element of the a suite of measures we will be uh, looking at and trying to put into place to provide some relief for Go back in copper and stocks of concern. So um, I am supporting its inclusion uh, in this pathway, uh, feeling that, that that is a tie to the specs package in the January 21st, 2023, pardon me, I keep going there, January 1st, 2023 uh, date of impl expected implementation of um, harvest specifications. And uh, so I would support it here. And, and obviously, if this proceeds uh, on this pathway, you know, Marcy acknowledged that maybe some potential differences. I said, I'm interpreting those as, as a little bit more the, the reasoning underlying these alternatives, uh, but would, would leave it to, um, to council staff. Obviously, we are not intending that there be a duplication of effort. Um, moving through these. So, you know, I trust council staff to, to efficiently um, uh, organize work on this under the agenda items and the pathways uh, that the council has laid out here. Thanks. All right, thank you for your comments, Maggie. Anything further on this motion? I'm not seeing any hands, I'll call the question. All those 
in favor of the motion as amended, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Keely Kent. Thank you, Keely. The motion passes. All right, I think we still have uh, some business under this agenda item. So any other motions? Phil Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I do uh, have another motion for the book before the council for consideration having to do with uh, short belly rockfish. And um, uh, with your permission, I would go ahead and put it in on the floor. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I move that the council adopt an alternative for further analysis within the 2023-2024 groundfish harvest specifications and management measures with the following language which would amend the groundfish FMP to describe the management intent for short belly rockfish. That language is, if fishery related short belly rockfish mortalities exceed or are projected to exceed 2000 metric tons in a calendar year, the council will review and investigate survey abundance trends and other stock status information as appropriate, consider changes in fishing behavior, consider changes in the market interest for short belly rockfish and other factors as appropriate that may lead the council to reconsider the EC designation for short belly rockfish. In addition, in response to the review of the information, the council may also recommend other management measures that achieve the council's FEP goals and objectives and goal two in particular for short belly rockfish. Other management measures may include, but are not limited to, area closures, gear prohibitions, bycatch limits, and seasonal restrictions. The language on the screen does accurately reflect uh, my motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Excellent. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, look for a second, seconded by Pete Hassamer. Uh, please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the council's indulgence in considering this motion. I want to say at the outset that this motion is meant to be an interim step for the council ultimately giving consideration to prohibiting a targeted fishery on short belly rockfish. The council recently, well, recently as in June of 2020, designated short belly rockfish as an ecosystem component species within our West Coast Groundfish Fishery Management Plan, recognizing its importance as, a, as forage in the California current ecosystem and absence of targeted fishing. Mm -hmm. Eco-component systems are not targeted or generally retained for sale or personal use and are neither currently sub subject to overfishing, overfish, overfishing, overfished, or approaching overfished status nor likely to become so in the absence of conservation and management measures. You'll recall um, as part of the council's June 2020 motion concerning short belly rockfish, uh, it, it said that if catches exceed 2000 metric tons in a calendar year, the council will investigate changes in catches and so on, uh, as reflected here in, in the uh, amendment language, proposed amendment amendment language. And it also went on to say that council may also recommend other management measures for short belly rockfish that meet the council's ecosystem objectives in the FEP. During the discussion and uh, on that motion uh, at the time, um, NIMS indicated um, that uh, our action, if approved, would not be captured in a regulation or in an FMP. So if we wanted to up to, to operationalize uh, this, the, the action that we took, it would need to be placed either in regulation or in an FE, FMP. And of course, here I'm suggesting that it, that we consider placing it in the FMP. 
I believe that the council indicated at that time its intent to follow through with the subsequent action that puts on what I'll call some teeth in our approach. Um, staff capacity and process roadblocks have frustrated our ability to take that next step. I understand this approach would not carry with it a workload burden on the specs process that would otherwise inhibit the ability to get that work done as it is a reflection of a previous action that we that we have taken. And I, I, I gained this understanding uh, from talking with, with both state representatives as well as National Marine Fisheries Service, in particular, Keely Kent. In case you uh, don't have uh, at your uh, at the ready what what uh, the FEP goal two is, let me just uh, read it real quickly so you'll know why I referenced it in particular. Goal two is conserve and manage species populations and the ecological relationships among them to realize long-term benefits from marine fisheries while avoiding irreversible or long-term adverse adverse impacts on fishery resources and other marine environment. There are two sub objectives under that goal. Um, one which speaks to under, better understanding the trophic relationships and the potential ecosystem of effects of fishing and to understand the effects of trends in marine mammals, seabird and other protected species populations. And the other uh, objective under that goal is assessing the variability in fisheries income and vessel participation rates to ascertain whether the California current ecosystem fishing rates have affected long-term stability and well-being for fishing communities. So that's the reference of uh, why I'm referencing goal two. I would uh, close by saying that I think the council uh, has held the same policy for shark belly rockfish as for our other EC species. Um, However, in this case, incidental encounters with short belly have been, a, have been of a different nature in terms of unexpected volatility experienced in recent years, especially in the whiting sector. This has made identifying management measures to enforce a prohibition on targeting while also allowing for incidental catch in existing fisheries more difficult than for some of the other shared EC species. And, and also, um, we, we have uh, had difficulty finding a place within the council's workload uh, to, to move forward and, and follow up on our June 2020 action. I would also note that if new interest in targeting short belly were to arise in the interim, interim that is between a time that we would put an FMP in place perhaps uh, hopefully and that reflects what's on the screen here or something close to it uh, and our perhaps an ultimate decision to prohibit a targeted fisheries. So if there is a new interest in targeting shark belly, we were to arise in that interim period, the council has several tools to address such unexpected situations, including consideration of a request for an emergency action to prevent it and place short belly management measures on its agenda as soon as possible if we found ourselves in that uh, particular position. I support, as, as noted with the previous motion uh, that was put forward by Maggie Summer, that we consider starting the process or considering a process for potential of prohibiting it as a targeted species at our March meeting. Um, so this action is being proposed again, to be part of the 2023-2024 specs process so that we can operationalize uh, the action that we took in June of 2020 and um, uh, provide uh, a greater degree of uh, the council's ability uh, to have it memorialized in our FMP uh, for future action if needed. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much for the motion. I'll look to see if there are any questions. I have two hands raised. Uh, we'll start with Keely Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Phil, for the, the motion. Um, I did just want to clarify 
um, the third paragraph, um, so, so talking about specifically management measures, um, just clarifying that management measures would be considered um, assuming we've gone through the process of what is in paragraph two and determined that this um, species is no longer, um, should no longer be considered an EC species. Um, reason I'm looking for clarification is just noting that, you know, explicit in that determination that the council made to move short belly into the EC um, designation is that it's not in need of conservation and management. And so recognizing that decision could change and you would change that decision prior to seeking management measures. Um, is that a fair understanding? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Keeley, yes, that is correct. Um, that our, our first step in, the, in this is, is if we get to a point where we're projected or we're gonna exceed the 2000 metric tons, then you go through that first step. Uh, in the event that you reconsider and take and remove it from the EC designation, then uh, there's additional um, potential actions uh, to address the situation. Uh, Did that you... answer your question? Can yes, you... thank you. All right. Uh, further uh, questions of the maker of the motion or any further discussion? Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, thank Phil for this motion. I'll be voting for it. Um, also, thanks to Maggie um, for the earlier motion made and to the report that ODF and W provided ahead of the meeting. Um, short belly is obviously an important forage species. The council has been discussing this for a long time. Um, we've heard from a number of stakeholders um, about its value to the larger ecosystem. Um, so just wanted to note that I, I appreciate this work to keep it moving forward. Um, and um, yeah, look forward to, to seeing these steps play out over, over the next year or so. Thanks. All right, thank you, Corey. Uh, Michael Clark followed by Heather Hall. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Phil, for the motion. Uh, as, uh, as folks know, Fish and Wildlife Service has the federal responsibility of protecting migratory birds, along with many other trust species. Uh, and we manage several national wildlife refuges and globally important marine wildlife populations, including seabirds and marine mammals at the Farallon Islands National Wildlife Refuge, uh, juvenile rockfish, and particularly short belly are an integral prey item for several of our trust seabird species, in including the uh, California least tern and the marbled murrelet. Because of their importance to fish and wildlife trust resources, we certainly have uh, some con concerns about uh, excessive take of short belly rockfish, uh, particularly concerns about the potential for a directed fishery on short belly. Uh, but again, I uh, really appreciate this motion and I think to protect short belly rockfish and their importance as a major prey species for seabirds, we believe this motion kind of strikes the appropriate balance between flexibility necessary to allows them inc incidental harvest while providing the, uh, the additional teeth necessary to protect short belly when populations are less abundant. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair. And I also want to uh, thank Mr. Anderson for the motion. I, I appreciate the, the next step that it takes um, with this issue and formalizing uh, what we started uh, back in 2020 into um, in, by putting it into the FMP. Um, and I also want to thank ODFW for the comprehensive report on this that they um, had in the advanced briefing book to help uh, really think through this. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, also wanted to just comment, I, I do think um, back to the exchange um, about when we could take management action. I think one of the ideas was that um, even with an EC species, we we can take management um, action if needed. Um, even before as as it is designated as an EC species. So it was um, just wanted to say that we could respond to that uh, before pulling it out of the EC uh, species designation. Um, so 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. Um, Maggie, and then I'll come back to Michael Clark. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you to Phil for the motion I, uh, and for your comprehensive remarks about uh, our approach and our, our current attention to short belly rockfish. Um, certainly support the motion as it codifies something the council is already committed to doing. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Phil Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And thanks uh, for those of you who spoke in support of the motion. Um, I just want to say thanks to ODFNW for their report. I, I, I plagiarized uh, <laughs> some of my rationale from their paper. This was this was a uh, this was a group effort that's being brought forward. This was not just me for sure. Heather and Marcy and Maggie and others um, helped. Um, and, and had great ideas on how we might move forward, take a step forward here in terms of how we're managing short belly rock, short belly rock fish, and, and um, I think as Maggie said, kind of codifying our previous action. And and um, so, uh, just wanted to acknowledge everybody that uh, played a hand in putting this together. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Phil. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, not seeing any hands, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Phil, for that motion. So um, before we finish this agenda item, I want to see if there's any other business. Um, Maggie Summer followed by Bob Dooley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to recognize that the analysis and workload related to the range of alternatives we've adopted for groundfish harvest specifications and management measures um, will be large. We've, we've touched on that in a number of, of ways. Um, I was a little bit slow on earlier, uh, but I did want to comment specifically on the inclusion of the alternative in the range to extend the limited entry fixed gear sable fish tier season. Uh, I, I, and I, my, I would uh, be inclined to advise staff and the GMT that that's uh, lower in priority than the 12E item that we spent uh, quite a bit of time discussing and suggest that they allocate their time and attention accordingly. And one of the reasons um, I am thinking about that is the, the time frame. Obviously that's an extension of the season that would come into play uh, later, later in the year. So um, as, as the council moves, or pardon me, as, as staff and the GMT move and others move through analysis of this and we'll uh, come back to it and, and have a chance to understand progress and status of the analysis um, next time we take up this take up the manage, the specifications and management measures and if necessary can make adjustments at that time but just wanted to offer my thoughts on relative priority there thank you uh keely kent followed by heather hall Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A um, few more comments. Um, I just wanted to note, um, I feel like I have been fully clear on my workload concerns, so we'll not belabor that, um, but just want to note, you know, what we will seek to do um, in the um, subsequent council meetings on this agenda item as things get developed to pro provide, you know, specific feedback, um, particularly just want to call out, you know, implementation steps. Um, and note that there may be items in this package um, that have that are beyond you know what we have done in the past, um, and you know there's some implementation steps related to other applicable laws um, that that simply may require more time beyond the very restrictive specifications rulemaking rule pathway that are, we are always held to um, to get final rule in place by January 1, 2023. 
And so I note that here just because um, I recognize that there are a lot of high priority items um, that the council is considering and there will be further opportunity for um, feedback and inclusion of that information. But um, I just want to make sure that the council is clear that um, even if all these items are fully developed by June, if there are additional implementation steps um, that cannot be completed um, in the required six month rulemaking time frame, uh, we may need to consider bifurcating the action um, and taking up some parts of this action in a separate rulemaking pathway that would not be implemented for January 1, 2023. Certainly we will seek to advise the council um, with those kinds of details um, when we come back to this um, in 2022, but I just do wanna make sure that that is um, out there as a possibility for folks um, so that uh, it's clear as to what the expectations for the rulemaking pathway is. I have um, a comment on the stock complex pieces, but I, I know that there's a number of other hands up, so perhaps I will um, wait my turn to come back to that. Um, so thank you. All right, thank you, Keely. Uh, Heather Hall, followed by Bob Dooley. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. And uh, I, I just wanna speak to the prioritization conversation that, that we're having here and definitely appreciate the comments from both uh, Maggie and Keely, uh, uh, specific to the, the LE fixed gear primary season and the prioritization for that, I, I think uh, Keely spoke to this nicely in, in our expectation that um, NIMS and staff would, would advise us on workload and, and really the hope is that um, effort will be given to um, prioritize items that really have the most benefit for going into place on January 1. So I just wanted to uh, support that approach as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Heather. Uh, Bob Dooley, and then I'll come back to Keeley, if that's okay. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a motion if on this subject, if, uh, if it's okay. No time like the present. Okay, I think Sandra might have it. I'd appreciate if you put it up. Perfect, thank you, Sandra, I appreciate that. I move the council add an alternative for analysis that would analyze a ramp down strategy, rebuilding strategy for quillback rockfish. This ramp down strategy would decline linearly over a three year period, after which catch will be at tar the target level that aligns with the council's quillback rockfish rebuilding plan. This ramp down strategy would be explored for the SPR equals 0.5, and the SPR equals 0 0.7 alternatives to enable a range of analysis. Okay, and the language on the screen is accurate and complete? Yes, it is. All right, I'll look for a second. Seconded by Butch Smith. Uh, please speak to your motion. We heard this week numerous testimony from, from industry and also council members, a concern that this quillback issue will cause great economic harm. The social and economic implications associated with the re quillback rebuilding plan will be extreme. The ramp down strategy is intended to meet our obligations to rebuild as quickly as possible while taking into account the needs of the fishing communities. My intention with this ramp down strategy is to enable the development of tools and techniques that will help us avoid quillback and improve their post release survival, such as tools to improve survival related to barrow trauma, spatial measures that can help better avoid quillback and the potential development of gears that may enable avoidance. I think this is a absolute important measure to, to analyze, to understand we've done it before in the past. I think that uh, we need to soften the blow that this, um, that the restrictions on quillback will, will give industry. So that's about what I have to say. All right, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, are there questions, <clears throat> make the motion or discussion on the motion? 
Marcy Remco. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first question is an easy one to the maker of the motion. Um, I expect you're simply referring to California Quillback. Um, my next question is I'm, I'm hoping that um, we can hear a little bit from council staff about what this analysis uh, involves. I'm extremely cognizant of workload. I, I just want to make sure that um, this analysis is necessary to help us complete our actions for the biennial specifications and management measures process. Um, I, I just don't know enough about it. It's kind of the first we've heard of it. Um, if this is something that wasn't uh, wasn't contemplated as the the teams went to work um that that's a perfectly good reason um to add it here to the list but i i just want to make sure i know what i'm i'm voting for thank you bob yes thank you mr chairman thank you marcy for the questions i of course i think this this applies to california absolutely um as to the other i i think that this is Absolutely, I, I'm concerned about workload as well, but I'm equally or not more concerned about the the well-being and turning over every rock we can to help our industry. And we've all identified how how painful and how uh, this could economically affect our our communities and fishermen. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And I see John Devore has his hand up, and I'm sure he has a little more to add. Yes, thanks, Bob. Yes, and, and John? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, how I would interpret this motion is we would, um, as as it states in the motion, do an, a linear ramp down to these uh, target levels, uh, target harvest rates from the 2022 catch levels down to a catch, you know, the, the new catch catches that are result from these to harvest rates. And we would compare those across all the alternatives, including the no fishing alternative, to see what the extended time to rebuild uh, would be relative to, um, you know, to all the other alternatives. To, and then um, we will need to really uh, explore what benefit we're getting from uh, doing this, like what is happening in that three-year period to uh, soften the blow and, and um, you know, things like uh, barrel trauma mitigation, um, designating areas that, you know, that you really you should warn people to stay away from because there's a lot of quill back there or whatever it is, you know. So it, as we go through this, I think that's going to be the real key for this ramp down is, is what are we buying with this uh, three year um, period? I, I think that right now that sort of captures my initial thoughts. Okay. Thank you for that, John. Keely Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, had a couple of questions. Um, one, I guess, just, um, you know, I don't want to assume intent, but i um, assuming that uh, the guardrails around this are, you know, the existing rebuilding requirements that, you know, whatever would be evaluated within this ramp down. Um, that, you know, the specific recognition that um, things to be considered are bound by the rebuilding requirements. Um, so I'm assuming that that is correct. Um, and then just also clarifying, um, I believe this would require new rebuilding runs. Um, and so be, um, I am chatting right now, but uh, may also ask um, for sp specific input from the Science Center um, potentially on the years requested um, that for these rebuilding runs. Um, so would you be seeking, so Mr. DeVore just mentioned 2022 as one of the years, um, or if that would be extending, starting in 2023, extending through 2025 or 2026, um, some clarity on the additional rebuilding runs um, for the Science Center I think would be helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Bob? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Keeley, for the question. Um, I may vote a friend on this, but I think that uh, I think it is for over the three-year period starting in 2022. I, I believe that we need to have that analysis to understand the difference in the rebuilding timeline and and whether this this approach would help and the, to which degree it would help. So I think this analysis is is critical to to helping our industry absorb this blow. John DeVore. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, just to be clear, um, I was using 22, uh, 2022 as the starting point for determining the slope of the ramp. And I was assuming that um, we would uh, be getting to the um, target level of harvest by 2025. But, you know, if, if, if I'm wrong on that assumption, now would be a good time to clear that up. That's the way I intended it. All right, further questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on this motion? Not seeing any hands, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? All right, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Bob, for that motion. All right. Um, Let's see if there's any uh, other business on agenda item E5. Uh, Phil Anderson, followed by Keeley Kent. Uh, no other action, Mr. Chair. Just um, there's a there's an appendix B in the Pacific Coast Ground Fish Fishery 2019-2020 harvest specifications that speaks to the LOI rebuilding plan revisions. And if you go back into pages like 16, 17, 18, you'll find where there's a description of the additional kind of mitigating measures that were that were taken in response uh, to the ramp down to to or not in response, but as as part of the ramp down, that might be a good place for people to go look for ideas. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Keely Ken, followed by Brad Pettinger. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to make a um, quick remark on the stock complex issue. Um, we recognize um, the council has taken some interim steps um, in the motions passed today on addressing mortality of stocks of concern currently managed in complexes for the 23-24 biennium. Um, we do view these as interim steps, um, and as we have discussed earlier in the meeting on the stock complex issue, we see a need for further examination of our stock complex management structure and possible consideration of larger changes beyond the scope of what is possible for this biennium. Um, we will bring this for this issue forward again, um, likely the next time um, the council sees the workload and new management measures agenda item. Um, and we will specifically seek input from the council, the SSC, the GMT, and the GAP and others um, on developing pathways to carry out this comprehensive evaluation and if needed, subsequent development of changes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Keely. Uh, Brad Pettinger. Um, yes, thank you, Chair Grolnick. Um, it's come to our attention that, that we need to amend a previous motion under E2. Um, there's a discovery of a grammatical error um, by staff that uh, needs to be um, corrected. Um, I think it'll take a, a couple motions to get there to fix it. Um, and um, with uh, your permission. Oh. I share Penger. Let me let's wrap up E5 first, and then I will hand the gavel to you for E2 if that's okay. Is that okay with you? Um, I, I, I think you keep the gavel. How's that sound? Okay, I can keep the gavel for E2, but let's, we're on E5 right now. So I just want to cleanly finish E5. Um, and then we can come back to an issue on E2. If, I think that's the best way to proceed. Um, so let me just see if there's anything further on E5, and then I'll turn to Todd and make sure we've completed our business on E5. 
Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, looking at your council action, I would agree that you have uh, met all of those items, one, two, three, four, and five. Um, thank you, council, for the very vigorous discussion and the motions. We will uh, we'll get to work on those as soon as possible and have something for you back in March of 2022. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Todd, and thanks, uh, Council, for the hard work on E5. As Vice Chair Pettinger mentioned, it has been observed that there is um, an, an issue with the previously adopted motion on E2. Um, so, Brad, I will now call on you to address that issue. Um, thank you, Chair Grelnick. Um, as I understand, it takes two motions to get us there, and so um, I would... Uh, a move to amend, well, I guess I'll wait till the language comes on the screen here, very short. Um, I move to amend the previously adopted E2 ODFW motion, and the language is correct. Okay, and um, I don't have a meeting record in front of me, but I'm assuming there was only one motion offered by ODFW under E2, is that correct? That is my understanding. All right. All right, so it's been moved by Brad Pettencher. Look for a second. Seconded by Bob Dooley. Um, please speak to your motion as necessary. Um, thank you, Chair Grelnick. Yeah, this motion this, this um, motion is to um, open it up to make the amendment to the um, to the um, previous, um, previous motion. Okay. Um, and I guess when we get to the next motion, we'll find out what the change is. So let me uh, see if there's any questions or discussion on this motion to amend. And not see any hands, I'll call the question. But who, who seconded? Okay, so Bob Dooley seconded that. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Uh, Brad, you have a further motion? I do. Thank you, Chair Grolnick. Um, I move the council amend the E2 ODFW motion as follows. Strike agenda item E2 attachment 6, September 2021. To replace it with agenda item E2 attachment 6, November 2021. And the language is uh, on the screen is accurate. All right, thank you for that motion, Brad. Look for a second, looks like it's seconded by Butch Smith. Uh, please speak to your motion as necessary. Um, yes, just uh, fairly simple here. Um, uh, thankfully, uh, council staff uh, cut this and it needs to be addressed and we're doing that here. And so um, I would stop there. Great, any discussion or questions? Not seeing any hands, I'll call the question. All those in favor of this motion say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you, Brad, for the motion. Let me ask Brad if there's anything further under E2. Um, no, I'm good, thank you. All right, well, that completes all of our business save for future council uh, meeting agenda and workload planning, which especially for November, since we're planning March and April tends to be a big item. Um, and we're not gonna get that done before lunch. So we're gonna take our lunch now. Um, I would suggest we keep it to 45 minutes instead of a full hour uh, and be back here at 12.30 and try to get through C10 as efficiently as possible. Before we run away, let me see if Chuck or Merrick have any announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, no, no further announcements at this point. All right. All right, we'll see everyone back here at 1230. When I got out of high school, I jumped on dad's rig and it just gets in your blood. I didn't have a problem getting up and going to work every morning. I enjoyed being on the water. 
And when I found that the fishing regulations were so complicated, I was angry. It is really frustrating to not have a say in what is happening to you. It's not just will the fish live or die, it's will the fishermen live or die. Well, why is this happening, or why is this, or why is that, or they just want to shut it down, and... Am I going to be able to survive? It's hard. I first heard about MRAP from two fishermen. Got a hold of me and said, hey, I've got this great opportunity for you. It's a program that, that's by and for fishermen. I was very skeptical going into that meeting, and uh, very enlightened coming out. MRAP gives you the recipe. Where does the data come from? How do people use the data, the laws, and the steps that one goes through to translate into a regulation? I was afraid of the rulemaking process, but I think they listened to what everyone there had to say, including myself. MREP was really helpful in how I can be an active participant in the management of my fishery.
All right, it's uh, 12 o'clock and we are on agenda item C10, future council. Yes, sir. Who was I that? I just wondered if you were sure that it was 12 o'clock. Is it 12 o'clock in California? Oh, it's 1230, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, I didn't want everyone to reset their watches to the wrong time. Um, I'm not a not an authority on such things. It's just that it's been a long meeting. So it is 12.30, and we're going to get started here on our last agenda item. Uh, and I'll turn to Chuck Tracy. Agenda item is intended to refine general planning for future meetings, especially in regard to finalizing the proposed agendas for the March and April council meetings. Um, the following attachments uh, are intended to help facilitate council planning. Uh, we've got attachment one, which is the year at a glance. Um, and uh, attachment two is a March quick, um, quick reference agenda. Uh, April number three is April quick reference agenda. Uh, we've updated those over the course of the week. Uh, so they are now um, attachments. Uh, four, five, and six. I believe supplemental attachments four, five, and six. There has not been much change in those. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but in order to facilitate schedule planning and stabilize expectations for those two meetings, um, we try and uh, settle as much as we can uh, for both meetings here at this uh, at this November meeting because the time between those two is so short. We really can't make a lot of major changes. Uh, we can't expect uh, staff to react to um, a lot of changes in that short time frame. Um, so again, I'll, I'll walk through these. Uh, we've got um, some supplemental materials. We've got a number of statements from advisory bodies um, and some uh, management entities that we will uh, consider, um, take some public comment, and then, uh, then I will just uh, kind of walk through uh, each of the upcoming meetings um, and then I think at the end, we'll have some consideration of um, some more logistics of how we plan on conducting our uh, March and April meetings. And um, I'll probably have Merrick lead that. I will have Merrick lead that uh, discussion since that's going to be his, uh, it'll be his responsibility at that time. <clears throat> so uh, with that, Mr. Chair, um, if there's questions, I'll be uh, happy to answer them. Um, if not, I will say a couple things real quickly about the uh, the supplemental attachments and then we can move to advisory body reports. All right, thank you, Chuck. Are there any questions at this point? Uh, not seeing any hands, go ahead, Chuck, with your follow-up. Okay, uh, well, looking at, uh, at uh, supplemental attachment for the year at a glance, um, you know, again, the, the convention here is that um, shaded items are tentatively scheduled. Uh, unshaded items are uh, more firmly in, in the agenda. Uh, any changes since the uh, advanced briefing book are noted uh, underlined or, or struck out. Um, again, looking across here, there, we haven't made much, many changes. The council hasn't really taken uh, many actions uh, that would help us um, define some of those changes. So. Uh, we will be doing uh, most of our work here today. Um, so I, I would note that uh, there's some marine planning uh, placeholders put in for June and November. Um, and I think that's about, really about all we've got other than some change in some of the time estimates. Uh, if you look at it, um, supplemental attachment five in the, the candidate item box, uh, we've got uh, some change in the, in uh, some of those items there uh, in, in the time required. So uh, again, so those are uh, most of the changes. We, we did add a fiscal matters uh, agenda item in March as a result of the fiscal matters discussion uh, here today. There's also been a few changes to the advisory body um, meeting meetings and dates, but, uh, but again, pretty, pretty minimal changes at this point. So that, that's, uh, that's my quick overview. Uh, again, if there's uh, no questions about that, we can move ahead with um, the reports from the advisory bodies and management entities. 
All right, thank you, Chuck. <clears throat> Look again to see if there are any questions of Chuck at this point. And not seeing any, we'll move on to uh, the reports we have, and then we'll follow that with public comment. Uh, so first we will have um, the GMT, uh, Mel Mandrip. Welcome, Mel. Good afternoon, Council. I was not really intending to read this, but uh, I'm here, so uh, I will read it for you. Uh, okay, Mel Mandrup with the Crownfish Management Team, um, reading agenda item C10A, uh, the GMT report on future council meeting agenda and workload planning. The Crownfish Management Team reviewed the draft year to glance, agenda item C10, attachment one, and the draft March and April agenda is also under this agenda item uh, that contained, that were contained in the advanced briefing book, as well as the status of ongoing projects and offer the following for consideration by the Pacific Fishery Management Council. March council meeting, the GMT notes that the update on the 23-24 har yeah, biannual harvest specifications and management measures in the candidate agenda items shaded box and not, and not currently shaded. The GMT recommends that this item be added to the March I agenda item. The March updates have proven useful in recent cycles by providing council members an update on progress, as well as an opportunity to provide an additional uh, or clarifying guidance to the analyst. Given the potential for standalone agenda items to be created through the council action during agenda items E3 and E5 at this meeting, such as short belly rockfish prohibition, Calcutta conservation area, groundfish retention in the salmon troll fishery, and the primary tier fish, sablefish season extension, as well as stock complexes. The GMT believes that the prioritization exercise under workload and new management measure priorities should remain on the agenda for March 2022. This discussion will ensure that the GMT's limited capacity, especially during the harvest specification process, is used as effective, efficiently rather, and reflects council priorities. Once the council prioritizes these items, the GMT will consider where they may best fit on the GMT year at a glance, which is in appendix one. April council meeting. The final preferred action for the 2324 harvest specifications is scheduled for midday on Sunday, April 10th. The management measures agenda item is scheduled for mid morning on Monday, April 11th. The GMT re reports, more likely reports than just a report, for management measures would be due about the time the harvest specification items item is concluding on the council floor. The GMT needs the results of the harvest specification item to conclude our discussions, analysis, and report writing on the management measures agenda item, requiring a minimum of 24 hours between the conclusion of the harvest specifications item and when our reports for management measures would be due. Therefore, we recommend that either the harvest specifications agenda item be moved to either, either item be moved to earlier in the council meeting or the management measure item be moved to later in the meeting to provide the work time needed by the GMT. GMT year at a glance. The GMT reviewed the council year at a glance and made recommendations on the March and April 22 meetings which is above and then also in the appendix one uh, GMT year at a glance. The team held off on review of June through November in light of the potential new prioritization of the items above that may happen in March, 2022. 
at the time of statement writing, the range of alternatives for the non trawl sector area management measures, including rockfish conservation areas, has not been selected. The GMC recommends revising this agenda item scheduled for April 2022 to reflect that April 2022 involves either a non trawl management check in slash update on the analysis or preliminary, preliminary preferred alternative selection, depending on the state of analysis and urgency to respond to fishery needs. The GMT recommends the council move the trawl catch shower review scoping and the, the ground fish strategic review items until later in the year and anticipate scheduling those in coordination with the additional items prioritized in March. Transition back to in-person meetings. As the council advisory bodies transition back to in-person meetings, the GMT reminds everyone to keep in mind days needed for travel. Over the past two years, travel days have not been needed nor of concern when scheduling virtual meetings. However, for most people involved in the council process, traveling to and from meetings often requires a full day. Carefully scheduling, careful scheduling will be especially pertinent for pre-council meetings, pre-council briefings, or webinars that have wide interest across fishery management plans. Given the, the varying travel days for advisory bodies and council members, the GFT realizes the increased efficiencies when we are all in person. However, the team would like to reiterate the desire to only be in person when the whole team is able to do so. Winter work session. The GMT anticipates the potential for need, potential need for winter work session to facilitate our work on the biennial harvest specifications management measures. Depending on the council, depending on what the council adopts under agenda E5, item E5 at this meeting, the work session has not been scheduled, but typically occurs in mid-January to early February to avoid conflicting with the IPHC annual meeting. At this time, the GNT is unsure if that meeting will take place virtually or in person. If in person, the location. Scientific and Statistical Committee proposed workshops. The, science, the SSC has proposed several meetings or workshops that are ground fish related which are referred to in uh, agenda item C10, supplemental SSC report one uh, at this meeting. The GMT anticipates participating in those workshops and schedule, when scheduled. Winter, weeding, winter meetings outside of council meetings. Uh, here's a, a five items that uh, we are looking to be involved with between meetings. That would be the RECFIC, REC, FIN, Tech, committee meeting, the IPHC interim meeting, the stock assessment postmortem, the IPHC annual meeting, and then as well as the, the winter work session, if that is scheduled. And then finally, you have the appendix, which is um, our the GMT year at a glance, and uh, suggesting what items could be removed. Um, and that looks to be the end of the report. Sorry for being caught off guard there. <laughs> All right, sorry, Mel. Um, thank you for the report. Uh, are there any questions of Mel? Uh, I'm not seeing any hands, but I, I have a question, Mel, and it's only because it's an issue that'll probably come up again during our conversations the rest of the day. Um, you indicated that the team um, only desires to be in person when everyone is able to be in person. Um, and I focus on the word able. Are you referring there to government mandates or government restrictions prohibiting travel? Or what are you referring to when you say able to attend? Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, that's majority of it that, um, uh, well, I could speak uh, for California 
uh, at this point, I'm not aware that we uh, CDFW uh, staff are allowed to travel uh, out of state yet. Um, so having us um, not being able to travel is is it's limiting to the the rest of the members on the team as well as the folks that can't travel. Um, so pretty much um, that it yeah dealing with strict, the restrictions of uh, from each state, whether or not we can travel. All right, uh, thanks for that, Mel. <clears throat> Any other questions of the GMT? All right, thank you, Mel. Uh, next, we'll hear from the Science and Statistical Committee, uh, Dan Holland. Welcome, Dan. Hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm Dan Holland, Vice Chair of the SSC. I'd like to read uh, into the record agenda item C10A, Supplemental SS Report 1, Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on Future Council Meeting and Agenda Workload Planning. <clears throat> the SSC discussed workload planning and has the following updates to our September 2021 statement under this agenda item. The SSC recommends continuing to convene the annual SSC Ecosystem Subcommittee Meeting with the CCIEA team to review additions to the IEA report in September and holding the annual salmon methodology review in mid-October. The SSC notes that the proposed salmon management schedule for 2022, agenda item F2, attachment one, leaves very little time for the SSC to review the STT's preseason report one. It was suggested that a draft version of preseason report one would be provided to the SSC earlier than the final publication date to allow the SSC sufficient time to review forecasts and estimates informing status determinations for major stocks. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee will hold the post-mortem post review of the groundfish assessment process in January of 2022 to discuss lessons learned from this assessment cycle and potential improvements for the future. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee has three workshops and two methodology review topics planned for 2022 that they propose to address in two separate meetings, each with methodology review and workshop components. The SSC recommends a meeting in late 2022 to discuss the integration of ROV survey data in assessments and to review ODFW's proposed acoustic ROV survey methodology for semi-pelagic rockfish with the participation of a Center for Independent Experts Scientists on Acoustic Abundance Estimation Methods. The other meeting to be held in the fall of 2022 would encompass the review of the species distribution model in template model builder along with the workshop on the treatment of indices of hook and line survey data, accounting for spatial closures in assessments. Pairing the methodology review with related workshops will reduce the number of meetings and reports through consolidation and provides time for proponents to work on requests while other topics are being discussed. The outcomes of the methodology review and workshop meetings will inform the ground fish stock assessment accepted practices but are unlikely to be held in time to inform revisions of the terms of reference for stock assessments for review by the council in June of 2022. In addition, a workshop is proposed for consideration of alternative harvest control rules for spiny dogfish to reflect its lower productivity and the findings from the most recent assessment that SPR 50% harvest rate may not be sustainable. Planning will be discussed further at the Groundfish Subcommittee's workshop planning meeting in January 2022 and the post-mortem review of the SOG assessment processes. The SSC supports the idea of the Council engaging with the climate change adaptation tools for California Current Fisheries Project presented by Dr. Pierce Chapman under open comment agenda item B1B supplemental public presentation one. Members of the SSC Ecosystem Subcommittee could attend meetings or workshops with the research team in order to support development of their decision support tools at the request of the council. That concludes my statement. All right, thanks very much, Dan. Are there any questions of Dan? Marcy Remco. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dan. Just a question on uh, your second recommendation regarding the salmon management schedule and SSC review of pre one. Um, are you, I'm just curious what, um, what you're really asking in terms of, of how early 
you're looking to get this draft. Um, the STT is always, uh, you know, down to the wire, getting everything done according to the preseason schedule. But I, I, I don't think you're suggesting here a change in their scheduling, but more just a dissemination of the outcome of their discussion before it's actually culminated and posted. Is that what you're, you're recommending? Yeah, yeah. That was what we were asking. I think it was suggested by someone from the STT that, that we could get an early draft of that um, document before it was finalized. Otherwise we're, I think getting it, you know, four or five days before our meeting. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Um, uh, Greg Bush, Enforcement Consultants. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be reading agenda item C10A, Supplemental EC Report 1, Enforcement Consultants Report on Future Council Meeting Agenda and Workload Planning. And I would make a note that this is in the event that we are meeting in person. The enforcement consultants have reviewed the documents pertaining to agenda item C10, future council meeting agenda and workload planning, and has the following comments. The EC requests to change our initial meeting time to 1400, 2 p.m. on the day prior to the main council, to when the main council meets. This change provides time for the EC to provide supplemental reports to council staff for day one of the council meeting and travel the same day as the meeting rather than the day before and will not affect the EC's contributions to the council process. This concludes my statement. Thank you very much, Greg. Any questions for Greg? Thank you, Greg. Uh, there is a gap report. I, I don't have a name for that, so someone will need to speak up. Uh, I am here for you, Mr. Chairman, if you need me. Yes, please. Um, so, yes, yeah, Dan Waldeck with the GAP reading our um, report on future council meeting agenda and workload planning. The GAP reviewed the documents under this agenda item and offered the following comments. For the March 2022 council agenda, uh, the GAP recommends the following Unshade G9 stable station gear switching review update, and number two, Unshade G10 the fixed gear logbook update. NIMS is already scheduling meetings with fishermen, and this may proceed to implementation earlier than expected in 2023. Referring to the April 2022 Council agenda, the GAP recommends the following. Unshade the G6 Whiting Treaty implementation item. U.S.-Canada Hake Agreement decisions are expected to have occurred. This is a routine part of the Council process. And number two, unshade the G8, the action to adopt a PPA for the non-trawl RCA item and subsequently schedule it for final action in September. The GAP recognizes the analytical burden may increase based on council action under agenda item E6 this meeting. However, our preference is to maintain the current schedule because of the importance of this agenda item. And then referring more generally through the year at a glance, number one, retain the LE fixed gear stable fish gear fishery five year review on the calendar because this is an important topic that should be addressed in coming matter. Number two, unshade the non trawl RCA in September for selection of an FPA. Number three, unshade the stable fish gear switching PPA agenda item for June. The GAP supports maintaining the PPA action in June and understands the June and the June agenda item will be influenced by council discussions and actions under agenda item G6, stable fish gear review update in March. Number four, continue to move the process forward for getting the Emily flat. EFT into regulation. The gap is unclear whether the council will proceed with moving the Emily Platt Yellowtail Rockfish Jig EFT into regulation as a standalone item or whether it is part of the non fall RCA process. The gap notes this is one pathway, an important pathway, to increase effort on the shelf and take pressure off near shore stocks. The, the use of midwater gear to access shelf stocks will become imperative in the next few years and thus. The GAP would like to see this continue to move forward in 2022. And finally, number five, the GAP understands the trawl catch year program review scoping needs to be scheduled sometime in 2022. It is currently a candidate item for March. The GAP affirms its interest in getting the scoping process started 
so industry members can discuss the extent of the review process necessary to meet the original intention of an efficient program and successful fishery. However, we also note that weather utilization and gear switching, two items from the first five-year review, have yet to be finalized. Although we do note that uh, mothership utilization FCA is scheduled for March 2022. Changes in National Fishery Service and Council staffing, new advisory body members, and competing workload intensive agenda items, for example, the specs, may preclude a comprehensive scoping agenda item early in the year. Therefore, the gap suggests scheduling the initial program review item, possibly in March, to discuss process and general review content. The GAP would like to see the, the inclusion of this opportunity to make recommendations on program improvements as part of the process. That ends the GAP report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Are there any questions of Dan on the GAP report? Thank you very much, Dan. All right. We now will hear from the CPS management team, Lorna Wargo. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Grelnick, um, Lorna Wargo, and I will be reading the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team Report on Future Council Meeting Agenda and Workload Planning. The Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team reviewed the draft proposed Council Meeting Agendas for March and April 2022 under Agenda Item C10, Attachments 2 and 3, and the Pacific Council Workload Planning Preliminary Year at a Glance Summary Agenda item C10, attachment one. The CPSMT offers the following for council consideration. CPS fishery management plan management categories. The CPSMT recommends the council schedule final action for this agenda item at its April 2022 meeting. Stock assessment prioritization or SAP. The council's year at a glance currently has SAP scheduled for April 2022. Instead, the CPSMT recommends this agenda item be considered at the November 2022 meeting. By taking this up in November 2022, the Council is resuming the intended biennial schedule adopted in June 2019 and could then consider, consider assessment priorities and needs for 2024 and beyond. The assessment schedule is already in place for 2021 through 2023 as listed below. And there you see the CSNA um, or Central Subpopulation of Northern Anchovy, a full assessment in December 2021, so just in a few weeks. Uh, Pacific Sardine update assessment in 2022 and a full assessment in 2023. And finally, a full assessment for Pacific mackerel is scheduled in 2023. Central Subpopulation of Northern Anchovy Assessment Review. The April 2022 agenda includes CSNA stock assessment review, consistent with the proposed revisions to COP9, which incorporate the CSNA framework and flowchart. The CPSMT recommends moving this agenda item to June 2022 as CSNA stock assessment and management measures. CPS essential fish habitat review. The CPSMT recommends moving this agenda item, which currently appears shaded for April on the year at a glance, to June 2022. The CPSMT anticipates providing the Council a report on the objectives and scope of Phase 2 of the review. The report would be used to inform the subsequent Phase 2 action plan that would also include the staffing requirements and timelines to complete Phase 2. CPSMT work session and meeting. The CPSMT anticipates scheduling a session in January or February 2022 to plan and initiate work for the upcoming year. In addition, although the CPSMT is not meeting at the March Council meeting, we plan to hold a one-day work session after the advanced briefing book has been posted to address marine planning, ecosystem, and any other agenda items that might pertain to CPS. And that concludes the management team report. Thank you very much, Lorna. Are there any questions on the CPS management team report? Thank you, Lorna. Thank you. And the last report we have uh, for this agenda item and for the meeting and for the year is Mike Okanuski with the CPS AS report. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be reading from agenda item C 10A, Supplemental CPSAS Report 1, November 2021, Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel Report on Future Council Meeting Agenda and Workload Planning. In discussion on this agenda item, the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel has decided that for the upcoming 2022 meeting, if the Council makes a decision to meet in person, the CPSAS would like to meet virtually. Since there are no CPS agenda items on the March 2022 agenda, the CPSAS believes they can conduct the meeting effectively using the Ring Central site. For the April 2022 meeting, the CPSAS would like to meet in person if the council decides to have an in-person meeting. And that uh, concludes our statement. I would like to express the advisory subpanels, uh, many thanks for all the work Diane and Al have done over the years. Uh, kind of got dropped there, and uh, I meant to uh, say something earlier. And also for Mr. Chuck Tracy, I wish him well in his retirement and hopes he uh, can find a, a lot to occupy his time, which I'm sure he will. And lastly, we'd like to welcome Mr. Merrick Burden. And that uh, concludes what I have to say. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. All right, thanks uh, very much, Mike. Any questions on the CPSAS report? All right, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Mike. I believe that concludes all of the reports and takes us to public comment. We have seven uh, public comment cards, I believe. So, um, wait, is there a Habitat Committee report? I didn't see one. Am I missing a report? Mr. Yes, Chair. there is a Habitat Committee report. Okay, Habitat Committee, please go ahead. This is Corey Green, Vice Chair of the Habitat Committee. I'm reading agenda item C10A, Supplemental HC Report 1, November 2021. This is the Habitat Committee report on future council meeting agenda and workload planting, planning. The Habitat Committee is experiencing significant turnover, losing at least six members between now and the next meeting in March 2022, including, I might add, the chair. Two others whose terms are expiring have been nominated for the seats they currently occupy. The HC is sorry to lose so much talent and institutional knowledge, but looks forward to new members whose expertise will benefit the HC and the council. Nonetheless, there will be a learning curve for new members and the HC appreciates the council's understanding and support as we go through a significant transition. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions of the Habitat Committee? Okay. Um, we'll go now to the HMS management team. My apologies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, members of the council. Uh, I'm Stephen Stos, HMS management team co-chair. And I will be reading from agenda item C10A, Supplemental Team Report 1. The Highly Migratory Species Management Team reviewed the proposed scheduling of HMS agenda items on the Pacific Fishery Management Council's preliminary year at a glance summary and offers the following comments for council consideration. Regarding candidate agenda items for the March 2022 council meeting, the team recommends scheduling the Swordfish Fishery Management and monitoring plan item for the March meeting, but removing the HMS Essential Fish Habitat Review Phase 2, given the current lack of staffing to support work required to complete the assignment. The uh, SMMP agenda item provides an opportunity to coordinate work on various council assignments under its scope, including Grisbill net hard caps and bycatch performance metrics, and could also support completion of the Council's November 2019 assignment regarding sources of West Coast swordfish supply. The team believes that the June 2022 Council meeting is a better fit than the March meeting to allow for completing an analysis 
to support selection of a preliminary preferred alternative on PGN hard tax. The team believes this is consistent with the approach the Council suggested under Agenda Item H3 discussion. If the Council desires, the team could provide a DGN hard cap analysis update under the SMMP agenda item at the March 2022 Council meeting. The team further believes that scheduling a joint discussion between the team and enforcement consultants in conjunction with the SMMP agenda item could be helpful for producing an analysis of the range of alternatives for the Council. Given the amount of HMS management team meeting time that may be required to complete the work on hard caps, analysis of sources of West Coast storage fish supply, and bycatch performance metrics. The team requires significant meeting time to finish these complex assignments on a timely basis. And in summary, the team provides the following recommendations to the council. Regarding candidate agenda items on the March 2022 council meeting agenda, Drop the EFH review phase two, but include the SMMP agenda item and consider an update on development of a hard caps analysis under that agenda item. Secondly, schedule selection of a pre preliminary preferred alternative for drift kill and hard caps on the June 2022 council meeting agenda. And finally, schedule interim management team meetings as needed to complete work related to SMMP related agenda items on the council's year at a glance schedule. Uh, that's the end of my report, and I will take any questions. Thank you. All right, thanks very much for that report. Are there any questions of the management team? John Ugaritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Dr. Stowes, for the report. Just a couple quick questions. Uh, the team notes uh, choosing a preliminary preferred alternative for drift gill net hard caps in June. Did the team specifically discuss the need for a preliminary preferred alternative uh, or would the council's selection of a final preferred alternative be reasonable in June as well? We didn't discuss that specific question and uh, I have no comment based on what I know. Thanks and following that, uh, through the chair. Um, with regard to swordfish monitoring and management plan, if the council uh, chose to have discussion of that through another method, not on the floor of the council, some sort of workshop, uh, would there be an objection to not having swordfish monitoring and management plan in March? <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, was that question directed at me, John? You said the chair. Through the chair, thank you, okay. yes. Uh, Steve directed at you. Oh, um, well, uh, as, as we detailed in our report, uh, we think of the SMMP item as a uh, meeting of broader needs than just for first um say one specific agenda item. So there are several um, swordfish management and monitoring plan agenda items that we mentioned. So I'm not sure what the implications of not including that might be for kind of coordinating uh, various tasks and workload um, as well as uh, uh, sort of having time to address analyses in progress. So I wouldn't, um, I mean, the, the team's recommendation is, is based on the number of different um, swordfish items on our agenda. There might be other approaches that would work to address those, but um, our recommendation was to put that on the March meeting. Okay, a any further questions on the management team or any further follow-up, John? Okay, I'm not seeing any, any further hands or any further follow-up. Thank you very much for the management team report. You're uh, welcome. Thank we you. have one more report. It's a verbal report from the National Marine Fisheries Service. 
Mr. Ryan Wolf. Thank you, uh, Chair. <clears throat> and I did want to uh, raise something before the council um, uh, and put a, I guess, a placeholder in, if you will, <clears throat> um, on a, on a what could be a potentially urgent issue for us. <clears throat> um, in particular, I wanted to speak to the Sank Coho <clears throat> agenda item uh, that we had earlier in this week. Um, we raised a number of concerns with our motion at the time. Uh, we have had a number of, of conversations uh, with states and the, and the tribes uh, over the, the days since. I, I don't think we will have the ability to address that uh, in our concerns um, at this meeting. Uh, however, um, some of those concerns that we've raised, um, as well as the fact that due to the substantive amount of new information regarding Sankoho and the effects of the of council fisheries that have come out of the work group process, it's very likely we will need to reinitiate and, and that consultation, ESA consultation will be complete prior to the March meeting. <clears throat> so for both the Magnuson side of the house as well as the other applicable law side of the house, if you will, um, there are potential concerns from NIMPS that uh, may lead us to the unfortunate conclusion we can't approve that motion um, or that action. So uh, we are in discussions. I wanted to at least put out there so the council is aware of the potential for a request to have a half day emergency meeting in December to revisit that issue. Uh, again, I, I don't, it's not a firm request at this time because there is still um, some discussions that uh, at least folks we need to coordinate with um, between NIMPS and the states and the tribes uh, that I don't think we'll be able to do during this agenda item, but we'll be able to do immediately after this meeting. And I wanted to at least raise that issue and make the council aware of it um, should there be uh, a ask for such an emergency meeting um, for the all the reasons that I just stated. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ryan, uh, for that heads up. Are there any questions on the NIMS report? Uh, Joe Oatman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks, Ryan, for those. Uh, comments regarding uh, potential for a, a emergency meeting for December. Um, I, I have reached out um, to uh, individuals uh, who represent um, both the uh, Valley and the uh, Iraq and um, haven't received a response uh, so far. Um, so I think this is one that, you know, the tribe could um, potentially support. Um, and if I just want to provide those additional comments. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, any uh, other questions? Uh, I have a question for you, Ryan. What is the timing um, what is the timing requirement that it needs to be in December, say early January, and and when in December were you, if if it's going to happen, when do you think it would you would be requesting it, Brian? Yeah, thanks. Well, I think Magnuson requires at least five days of notice, I believe, or at least the headquarters five days before or the notice. Um, so uh, I guess I was thinking in December because of the time frame needed to uh, complete the ESA consultation prior to our guidance letter in the March meeting. Um, uh, we haven't, you know, like I said, we have a number of meetings set up immediately after this ends to, to get these, you know, get more specifics on this and how this would play out. Um, my initial thinking um, was uh, um, the week of December 13th, sometime in that week. But again, um, I recognize that this is a meeting not on people's calendars. We would need a quorum. Um, so I think NIMS would be willing to be flexible uh, and whether where exactly that might lie uh, in December would probably uh, be based on conversations with council members and calendars um, shortly after this meeting, if it, if it is in fact needed. All right. 
Thanks, Ryan. And the reason I asked about January is because obviously um, it gets exponentially more difficult for uh, people around the holidays. So we'll see where it goes. Uh, nothing. If there's nothing further on the NIMS report, um, that will then complete the reports. I made a premature announcement earlier. And we will now go to public comment. Um, and the first uh, speaker is Jeff Chester. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I believe Mr. Anderson has his hand raised. Oh, well, my apologies, Mr. Anderson. Please go ahead. Oh, quite all right. And my apologies for being slow. I, um, I just wanted to acknowledge the outstanding service that we've received from Lauren Wargo as acting as the chair of the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team. This will, uh, fortunately, we're, we're not losing her, but uh, this is her last meeting serving as chair. And uh, she's just done an outstanding job. And I just, I, I failed to uh, acknowledge that when she provided her, her last report serving as chair of the as team, at least, uh, in the for, in the near future, foreseeable future, I suppose. But thanks for letting me um, get that in. Thanks. Sure, Phil. All right, Mr. She Dr. Shester, please go ahead. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the council. This is Jeff Shester representing Oceana. Um, Thank you again, um, uh, Executive Director Chuck Tracy, for your many years of service. It's been a pleasure working with you, and we wish you the best in your retirement. Um, wanted to go through and just uh, mention a few things in terms of uh, our requests and suggestions for future workload planning. Um, with respect to uh, ground fish, we uh, very much appreciated um, uh, Mr. Anderson's motion, the council support for that. Uh, we believe that it is an important interim step demonstrating the ongoing commitment to uh, short belly rockfish prohibition. And we um, uh, urge the council in, in March to actually create a vehicle and schedule an FMP scoping amendment for a standalone ground fish FMP amendment to prohibit a directed fishery for short belly rockfish. With respect to uh, uh, coastal pelagic species, um, we uh, concur with the management team recommendation um, that you schedule a adoption of a final preferred alternative uh, to complete the anchovy management categories um, fishery management plan amendment in uh, April of 2020. Um, we also uh, support the um, scheduling of the anchovy stock assessment and management measures that would put in new specs under the, under the new anchovy framework. Uh, in June of 2022, also uh, concurring with the management team on that. Uh, we do, uh, as we've stated before, uh, in addition, however, we would uh, ask the council to add a new FMP amendment scoping uh, of an amendment to include the key elements of the anchovy framework in the FMP at the April 2022 meeting. Uh, we've also noted the management team has mentioned some other housekeeping items that could also be included in that FMP amendment. And we, uh, in our conversations with council staff, uh, they confirmed that this is a, a reasonable request uh, and, and, and timeline given uh, council and staff resources um, and the, uh, the completion of the fit management categories item at, this, at, at the April meeting. So we ask that you schedule that for April 2022. And then last Lastly, um, we've continued to raise concerns with respect to the uh, EMSY uh, harvest rate for Pacific sardine. Um, this, this is uh, causing us great uh, concern with the, the recent specifications, as well as the uh, rebuilding plan uh, for Pacific sardine. And we would ask that the council schedule a reevaluation of that formula for setting the EMSY harvest rates for sardine. Uh, currently, as you know, it's based on a cal coffee temperature index that has uh, since it was adopted, been shown not no longer to be uh, an adequate or a reliable indicator for sardine productivity, and we've seen a major difference between what that temperature index is providing uh, in terms of sardine productivity versus what has been shown in recent stock assessments. So that there, there's definitely uh, an importance to reevaluating that, which has been expressed both by the SSC and the CPS management team. 
Uh, lastly, on, on highly migratory species, um, we uh, we also uh, had, I guess, a similar uh, question or, or request uh, that as to the one that Mr. Ugrich raised. Um, we would like to see uh, the council adopt a final preferred alternative by June. Um, we, we note the management team did mention perhaps they could come in in, in March with uh, with some preliminary analysis. We think. That would be helpful, uh, but don't see any need to wait until till June to pick a PPA uh, and not do a final preferred alternative and would hope that the council can finish that item up by, by the June meeting. Also, um, uh, we see the swordfish management and monitoring plan on the agenda, um, whether it's a part of that discussion or whether it's a separate discussion, we, we believe the highest priorities are to uh, for the council to uh, reaffirm the 100% observer coverage requirement on the um, on, on the drift gillnet fishery, as well as removal of the unobservable uh, vessel exemption, uh, and and actually amend the fishery management plan to phase out the remaining federal drift gillnet permits on the same timeline as per the California legislation of January 31st, 2024. Uh, so we, we, we don't see a, a major need to deal with the swordfish monitoring management plan uh, unless uh, it's going to address those items or those those items could be uh, scheduled separately. And we would love to see those uh, scheduled for the March meeting as well. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, it's been a great meeting. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to everyone um, and uh, we'd be happy to take any final questions. Thank you very much, Jeff. Let's see if there are any questions. Uh, not seeing any hands. So uh, you have a good Thanksgiving yourself. Uh, Bill James. Mr. Chairman, members of the council, my name is Bill James. Um, I'm here with the Port San Luis Commercial Fishing Association. Association. As long as my voice holds out. Um, I think uh, the planning, uh, I, I, I really uh, want to thank uh, California um, for uh, really pushing forward on the uh, access to the RCA. It's uh, mitigation for the bunch of years that we have been really harmed as far as, especially we're you know, down in the Morro Bay, Avila area. We really haven't had access to the shelf um, since 1990 with any kind of fish that were available in an uh, economic uh, viable situation. So again, um, it really needs to go in as soon as possible to get this, um, basically what you passed on here with the allowable gears, for the protections, the gears that aren't allowed for the whole part, because different parts of the RCA hold different kinds of different species in different areas. So. It would be hard to do anything different than put the whole area in. Um, and as far as uh, Bob Dooley, I, if we can, uh, if that's going to give us more, uh, a more easy uh, to get this impacts into um, quillbacks, if it eases that a little bit, that would be great as long as it gives us more fish. So thank you, Bob, for doing that. It's wonderful. Um, I I didn't pay attention to whether it's going to be a um, in person, or there's going to be also virtual. Myself being disabled, I'm going to have a hard time getting getting anywhere at the moment. So uh, I'd like to have clarification on that. And also, some of our fishermen, it seems like right now it's really the day to go fish. So a lot of my guys are out, out fishing because it's one of the few days that's available right now. That awful weather this year. So, you know, again, virtual meetings really do help the people that just can't be at this. And I know they're, they're all committed. Dan Platt's committed. Harrison's committed. Everybody's not a really, Gary's committed. But we all need to have some sort of time and not always be at a meeting. So um, one other thing that I, I haven't touched on before, and I'll make it as quick as possible, that this fiasco with its stock assessments, I think that when the SSC and NIMS start talking about um, the language and what to do and when to do it. I really think uh, I would request GAP to be involved in some of the preliminary ideas 
um, because in reading the document under C4, which I was too busy with the other stuff, um, now, you know, it's done in isolation of some, uh, who it's going to affect. And, you know, we went in, into this assessment basically with lack of data. And it's a data situation. It wasn't, it's not overfishing. I mean, I, I can prove that a gazillion times. But uh, so if we were in there and we waited till we got the, the enough data and people were to give us the numbers of fish or how to get it, we could somehow make sure we got it so we could have a good assessment, which we all want. Um, and, and everybody have a good Thanksgiving. I, I really appreciate everybody who's taken so much time and really listened to the, this open access, you know, the, the non um, for all guys, and uh, I'm happy to take any comments and questions, criticisms. Sir. All right, thanks very much, Bill. Are there any questions of Bill? Thank you, Bill. Uh, Teresa Labriola, followed by John Keppen. Welcome, Teresa. Teresa, I see that you're unmuted on our end, but we're not hearing you. We will come back to Teresa. We'll go to John Keppen. Welcome, John. John, you're, you're muted on your end. There you go. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is John Keppen. I, I, let me confirm that you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking to uh, C10 Administrative Matters, Future Council, uh, Meeting Agenda and Workload Planning. I'm speaking for most of the small boat commercial fishermen between Crescent City and Morro Bay, California. There are hundreds of voices behind my words. And simply put, we feel like we've been, run, we've been run over and ignored. We're not pointing fingers. We know the council is challenged and overwhelmed in finding time for all the analysis and scoping you're asked to do. We are not interested in finding fault. What we want is direction towards a solution in a timely manner on agenda item E6. Listening to the council staff report on E6, we feel no one listened to our request made over the past two years. Issues have been accountability, contact with sponges and corals, and changing boundaries. Harrison and I back and I presented a shovel-ready proposal in the April 2020 council meeting, which was developed with the guidance given by members of the GAP, the GMT, California Fish and Wildlife Department, and members of the Fishing Association community. We have consistently shared the urgency of increasing access to the RCA for the open access non-trawl sector. Early in the process, 20, 2019 to 2020, we were told those efforts could see actions by 2021, 2022. Imagine, imagine our disappointment and frustration learning the council process is now considering 2023 to 2024 and likely beyond. We feel the salmon and crab commercial fishermen in California who make up the small boat fleet and teeter on the blink of brink of financial disasters just were thrown under the bus. Per our original request in 2019, which was allowing access south of the 4010 and using existing RCA boundaries, we request the council to provide leadership in allowing access to the RCA for the struggling small boat fleet by directing the GMT and GAP to prioritize their efforts by including this agenda item in their 2022 meetings with a goal to have final action no later than the November 22 council meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John. Are there any questions of John? Thank you, John. 
Uh, we'll give uh, Teresa Labriola another shout here. Teresa, are you with us? Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Perfect. Um, thank you, Chair Gorelnik and members of the council for the opportunity to speak today on future workload planning, specifically regarding highly migratory species. Um, in September, the council discussed the idea of developing gear performance indicators for conducting and evaluating research into alternative gears in our highly migratory species fisheries. And um, members expressed, expressed some support for scheduling a, a gear performance indicator agenda item for June. Um, and this would complement the council's review of exempted fishing permits. However, uh, this item does not appear at the written glance and I'd encourage the council to schedule um, a, a scoping of a gear performance indicator item um, in the beginning of this year. Um, gear performance indicators, they're one way to express our collective performance thresholds and requirements or expectations for new fishing gear. And by agreeing to certain criteria in advance, managers and stakeholders can objectively evaluate an EFP application as well as the results. And in turn, the public can have confidence in management decisions based on EFP research. And I've done some thinking about how to tackle this issue without reinventing the wheel um, and looked towards several of the um, programs that evaluate fishery performance already. And well-known examples would include the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program or Marine Stewardship Council. Um, Council member Krista Svensson pointed me towards the Seafood Task Force, Vessel Audible Standards, and there's others like Fair Trade USA. Um, I, I, I focused on Seafood Watch as a, an example of a well-respected independent program that reach, researches and evaluates the environmental impact of wild fisheries. Um, I, I looked at the way that they have set up their principles and then evaluation methods and um, submitted a letter under this agenda item asking you to consider using the Seafood Watch standard for fisheries as a starting point or, or maybe just as an example of how you might go about developing gear performance indicators. Um, their standards includes principles for sustainable wild caught fisheries and set priorities such as ensuring that the affected stocks of a fishery are healthy and abundant, that uh, the affected stocks are fished at sustainable levels, that their fisheries mineralize bycatch, um, and avoid negative impacts to um, habitat, um, among others. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I'd, I'd ask the council to um, consider agendizing this in um, the, the coming, the first half of this year and provide um, a suggestion that is a first step towards developing gear performance indicators for HMS EFPs. Um, we could task the highly migratory species management team with reviewing the Seafood Watch standard for fisheries, specifically their guiding principles, or reviewing other standards, and using that as an example to um, propose a list of indicators that um, for review by the council um, to align the council's goals for near new gear. And then finally, to provide a suite of possible tools for evaluating performance, such as precise metrics like X percent bycatch or a sliding scale of one through five, just some examples of, of what's been done elsewhere. Um, for us at Wild Oceans, gear research is a really important part of creating a sustainable fisheries in the future with minimal bycatch. Um, of fully exploited or overexploited or protected species. And we think gear performance indicators can help the council define its objectives and then objectively evaluate applications and the results to adopt new gear that can support resilient fishing communities in our changing ocean ecosystem. Uh, thanks so much for your attention and a special thank you to Chuck Tracy for his leadership over the past several years and especially for navigating us through COVID and through remote meetings and remote participation by the public, um, which I found very helpful. Uh, we've all learned a lot about hosting and engaging in remote meetings in the past two years, and I hope we can integrate some of the positive aspects of this into future meetings, such as um, how it's allowed for increased opportunity for public participation, it's decreased our carbon footprint, 
and decrease travel expenses for um, many small organizations and uh, industries. So thank you so much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Teresa. Are there any questions for Teresa? Thank you, Teresa. Uh, now, Anna Weinstein, followed by Sherry Flumerfeld. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and just to reiterate what Teresa said, uh, thanking Mr. Tracy for his service and guiding the council through the remote process. And in case I forget to say so at the end, uh, wish everyone a very happy and blessed Thanksgiving and Hanukkah and Christmas. Um, and so I'll be brief with my comments. Um, uh, first of all, um, on Short Belly Rock, is very appreciative of, um, on behalf of our, should say on behalf of our hundreds of thousands of members on the West Coast, Audubon members, um, and all the public who weighed in for this meeting, we're very appreciative of the motion um, made by Mr. Anderson um, uh, to uh, include an alternative for analysis for the 23-24 specs um, for an FMP amendment to um, solidify the 2000 ton trigger, uh, incidental bycatch trigger uh, actions and strengthen that. Those provide some very important safeguards um, that are very meaningful. So we really appreciate that. And a suggestion um, on the other motion on short belly um, to uh, in advance of the March um, new management measures consideration where a, a directed fishery prohibition will be a on the list of um, management measures to consider um, <clears throat> for rulemakings or other um, mechanisms, uh, bringing forward some analysis to help inform the council's discussion would, would be good uh, analysis on, um, on you know, what the options would be, whether a SIBO one approach would, would work, why or why not, that kind of thing. And anchovy on CSNA, um, I thank the management team for its report um, and moving forward on um, putting a, a final action for the management categories of FMP in place um, for, on the April agenda. And um, uh, like Dr. Shester said, um, it's important to also schedule, look, look for when we can schedule or you guys can schedule an FMP amendment um, focused specifically on including elements of the management framework um, for, for clarity. Okay, thank you so much and um, really appreciate all your hard work this meeting. Thank you very much, Anna. Are there any questions on Anna Weinstein's public comment? Okay, uh, Sherry Flummerfeld, followed by Louis Zim. Hi, can you hear me? You bet. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the council, my name is Sherry Flummerfeld, and I'm with the Monterey Bay Fisheries Trust. And we're a nonprofit that works to support our local fishing community and increase our community's access to local sustainably harvested seafood. And I want to start by expressing my appreciation to the council members and staff and advisory bodies for all of your hard work. I know you have a lot to juggle and a lot of different stakeholders with differing priorities, and I appreciate that and all that you do. I am commenting to ask you to please ensure discussion and action regarding the non trial RCA remains a top priority and is not dropped off of future agendas. Salmon and Dungeness crab have been the primary fisheries for our small boat fleet, but we all know what challenges these fisheries face. This has increased the need for more stable year-round fishing, something local fishermen can get from rockfish. But our small boat fleet needs to have more access to the non trial RCAs, and our fishing ports need these stable landings to maintain important port infrastructure and to create resiliency in these times of uncertainty and change, especially with climate change. But it's not just about meeting the needs of fishermen and fishing ports, it's also about meeting the needs of the public and our coastal communities. I know we all agree that the public should have access to local sustainable seafood, including rockfish, and shouldn't have to rely on seafood imported from across the world often caught unsustainably and with questionable labor practices. The COVID-19 pandemic and the chaos happening with international supply chains right now has shown us how important seafood is to local and regional food security. But again, our fishermen, fishermen need to be able to access their fishing grounds. When I started working at the Monterey Bay Fisheries Trust more than seven years ago, there was a lot of excitement around the recovery of rockfish stocks. 
I remember speaking with local fishermen back then about how best we can help rebuild those markets for rockfish. And the feedback they gave me then was that until they can access the non-trawl RCA, there's no point as there won't be enough supply to fill those markets. That was seven years ago. And since then, fishermen have been hit by so many other obstacles. There's a real sense of urgency in our community. Small boat fishermen have been working so hard to collaborate and present proposals to the council, but they're not as well represented and don't have the backing and resources that larger businesses do to help ensure their issue remains a priority. While I'm grateful for the progress being made by the council, I worry about further delays. Our fishing communities really can't afford to wait another seven years. I understand that there's a lot that goes into these decision, decisions and you have to consider issues like accountability and that takes a lot of time. But I ask that you keep this a top priority. Don't drop it from the workload. It's just too important for the many reasons that I've mentioned. And I would also like to put a question forth to the council, which is what steps can our fishing communities take now to expedite the process? Are there things that we can be doing now to prevent delays in the future? And I'll leave it at that. Thank you for the opportunity to comment and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you, Sherry, and happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. Are there any questions for Sherry? Thank you, Sherry. And uh, last but not least, uh, Louis Zim. Good day, Council. Good day to you. Thank you. Chair Gronick and members of the Council, my name is Louis Zim. And I'm an advisor to the Sport Fishing Association of California and Waymaster of the San Diego Yacht Club Anglers. First, I wish the council for appointing me to the GAP. I really appreciate this and will endeavor to contribute to the best of my abilities. You may wonder why you haven't heard from me uh, at this meeting. I have been listening with uh, open ears to all the work that you have been doing and really appreciate it. And uh, I'd like to thank council member Bob Dooley specifically for his motion and also thank the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, members of the GMT, and especially council member Marcy Yorenko for their dedication to sustaining our fisheries and communities. The arduous background work for the GMT and stock assessors that the new moderate level type assessments of quillback and copper rockfish demand were unexpected when I was on the council last winter. Combined with the challenges we've experienced with the pandemic, who would have predicted last winter that these stocks would be deemed depleted or in the precautionary zone? And now that I've been appointed to the gap, I will endeavor to bring into the GAP agenda for the March meeting discussion of this proposal of a ramp down rebuilding strategy for quillback rockfish. I foresee that the GAP will be looking to council staff and the GMT for guidance on how to proceed with this important subject. And I am personally very much looking forward to working with all you and uh, appreciate all of your hard work from all the states and all the staff and uh, and from our out, from our uh, outgoing uh, director, thank you so much for so many years, Chuck. Uh, as long as I've been in this process, you were there twice as long, and you've always got it just right. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Louis. Any questions for Louis? All right, thank you. So that concludes public comment. Um, and I believe all of our management entity and advisory body reports, which takes us to council discussion and action. And at this point, um, I'll ask uh, executive director Chuck Tracy to uh, pick up the microphone and walk us through these agendas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I guess what I'd like to do is uh, just maybe go over a few of the uh, um, issues uh, with the March and April agenda item. <clears throat> uh, I want to touch on uh, 
council staff workload capacity as well, uh, since those are related. Um, so uh, let me just start with uh, with one thing that I think is not on uh, either of the uh, any of these agendas, your at a glance or the quick reference, that I think the council uh, needs to take into consideration um, based on the discussions that occurred at this meeting. Um, I believe there's some interest in uh, scheduling an electronic monitoring agenda item sometime in the spring. I believe we're uh, kind of waiting on an answer from National Marine Fisheries Service on some of the questions regarding um, uh, third party uh, contracts, uh, sole source contracts and uh, cost recovery fund usage. Um, and I believe uh, it would I, I believe the council should hear back from National Marine Fisheries Service on that. Uh, obviously, the council spent some time um, considering the composition of its gym pack and gym tack uh, to uh, consider some of those issues. So I would put it out there that I think um, March or April would be uh, appropriate time for that to occur. Um, I would, uh, I guess I would note that uh, um, March is already uh, pretty jam packed. Uh, putting it in April might provide a better op better probability that National Fisheries Service will have an answer, but uh, um, but I, I will leave that up to the council to um, to weigh and to consider when they would like to schedule that. Um, a couple other uh, a couple other things, I guess um, we did hear some recommendations from some of the advisory uh, advisory bodies. Um, and uh, so I'd like to maybe address some of those so we can perhaps take some of the, deal with some of the low hanging fruit, I guess. Um, so uh, for March, uh, while we didn't have anything directly related to the uh, scheduled agenda items, there were some um, recommendations for the candidate items in the box there. Um, for example, the uh, uh, HMS business, the team recommended uh, delaying the central fish habitat review. Um, they did recommend uh, including the swordfish management and monitoring plan for March. Um, for ground fish, uh, the GMT recommended the, uh, the check in on the 23, 24 uh, specs and management measures. Um, I think that's, uh, it, I think we certainly need to have that uh, in the in in the box. We've got two hours scheduled for that. I'm not sure that that is uh, going to be adequate for that. Uh, I'd also like to dis discuss the uh, you know the action that might be considered or, or the you know the, the scope of that agenda item. Uh, this is listed as an update. Um, I would urge the council to discuss whether it, it might be more than an update and require some action uh, so that we could correctly frame that and, um, and set the uh, necessary council action. Um, I did have uh, um, one question about the uh, fixed gear logbooks update. Um, so that, that's uh, in the candidate box in March for an hour. Uh, I know that there's been some uh, discussion under um, the specs process um, that may relate to the use and then uh, utility of having uh, fixed gear logbooks uh, considered under the specs. So I guess maybe just a question of clarification uh, on uh, how those two uh, items are related or not and uh, whether they need to be kept separate and considered uh, as a standalone agenda item there. And then finally for March, uh, the Sable Fish Gear Switching Review Update. Well, I did notice some support in the advisory bodies for that agenda item. Uh, it's currently scheduled for uh, six hours. Um, and we've had some internal discussion among staff as to whether that is even realistic to uh, get it done that quickly. Uh, we've only got four hours of um, floor time. So I think um, I think it's unrealistic to uh, consider uh, having sable fish gear switching in March uh, on the council floor. Uh, that's not to say that there wouldn't continue to be some 
some level of work done on that in the interim. Um, again, depending on what the other uh, priorities the council identifies and how much work we have to do in specs and other agenda items. But but I would uh, expect there to continue to be some um, some progress there. I, I believe uh, Dr. Seeger has uh, been and uh, and Jesse Dorpinghouse have been working on uh, some some way to get some um, initial information out to staff and interested folks in terms of a description of the alternatives, um, perhaps some uh, videos or some something to uh, to make sure that people continue to think about this and and find ways to, uh, to better understand it going forward. So I will uh, I will pause there and um, see if there's any thoughts about how we might handle March. John Ugritz. Thanks uh, for that overview. And I think you've highlighted the fact that uh, March is jam packed and we've got more things in the possible items than we could possibly deal with. I agree with the uh, HMSMT's recommendation to postpone essential fish habitat review. I don't think they're ready for that, and I don't think there's uh, the information yet available for them to do that. Um, I think I, given what where we are with swordfish monitoring and management plan, that. I really think that some outside work is necessary before this comes to the floor of the council again. Um, I would be happy to see and participate in a workshop regarding that plan that includes the management team and advisory sub panel and members of the public. I think we've heard some good input, including uh, what Ms. Labriola said about possible ways to look into gear performance for potential future EFPs. I think all of that needs a pretty significant amount of time and discussion and that if it happened outside the council and then came back to the council at a later date, it would be much more effective. Um, and, uh, and I think if anything, a very brief update from the team on progress towards analysis of drift gill net uh, hard caps um, would be useful. Uh, I'm thinking on the order of 30 minutes, um, but that the other items should be held for a later time. Thanks. Thanks, John. Yes, you uh, you did raise another item that uh, the council needs to schedule some time for, and that is the drift gill net hard caps. And so um, um, I, I gather from your comment that you are suggesting there be at least some something uh, in March on that. Um, so I, I guess I would uh, maybe just ask if there's other thoughts about the scope of that and how that uh, how that agenda item might uh, be scheduled in advance to take more substantive steps than, um, well, than what you described, I guess, as a, a brief update. John? Yeah, thanks. Um, and, and I'm not opposed to not having a discussion in March on that item. I think the team has identified that there's a pretty significant work to be done. Uh, they also mentioned a meeting with the enforcement consultants, which I think would be useful. Um, so I, you know, if there's not time in March, I would suggest waiting for June when they can give us their full analysis. Um, and we can make some more concrete decisions in June. Uh, if something did come in March for hard caps, uh, again, I think it would be more of an update and uh, letting the council know about progress and perhaps any very preliminary results. So I don't anticipate the team will have much by March. Thank you. I, I think with that, um, I, I, I do think it would probably be a better use of council time to wait until there's a little more complete analysis and the council can take some more concrete steps and uh, wait until June for that. So I guess that's what I would recommend and, and we'll see if there's any other uh, thoughts about that. Uh, Ryan Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Um, 
couple of things across the board on March. Um, you know, we're talking March here, but since you mentioned EM, I just did want to support all of the statements that you made on it. Um, I, uh, I think we definitely 100% need an agenda item for EM um, in the spring, uh, but it's probably um, since you just raised the issue, whether it's March or April, I wanted to at least weigh in here that I think it's probably okay if that is April. Um, we NIMS could still utilize uh, our reports uh, to provide any update, at least on some other questions, and give a little more time for the new um, newly constituted jump pack and jump tack to meet. Um, but I do think it's, it's imperative to have on uh, at the very least April. Um, regarding uh, HMS, I mean, we. we since John just went, um, you know, we were supportive of the uh, MT's um, recommendations, also supportive of moving the FH. Um, and uh, um, I actually think it's possible a 30 minute or very brief update uh, on our caps is, is possible, but um, I also see your point, Chuck, too. So, um, however, the council goes, at least. And I think there may be at least some update, but John is, I think, completely right. There's not going to be um, a lot of analysis or anything full already. Um, and they have stressed that June uh, was probably more appropriate for, for that. Um, uh, or would also support the, um, there was a, in the HMS and report on the international too, and, and having a presentation on the new Albacore app, and would support that under that agenda item. I, I also note it's now down to an hour. I think that's about right for international at this meeting. Um, and then uh, finally, turning to um, ground fish, um, you mentioned fixed gear logbook, Chuck, and, and, and from our perspective, we really would like that to be a separate agenda item and very strongly would advocate for that to be on the March agenda. Um, you know, we want to keep on a timeline to get that in place by January of 2023. We'd love to have a proposed rule out in May. In order to do that, I think we need a separate agenda item on this in March. So that is um, a strong recommendation for NIMPS. And we can also support um, two items from the GMT report, which is the, the fisheries in 20 through 24 check-in that you also noted, Chuck, and, and support that uh, and, and moving the uh, trawl catch share scoping uh, off the March agenda. Um, and then finally, I, I said finally, but I think I got one last one here. Um, trying to pull up the administrative item nope I, sorry that's that's um not march so oh no yes sorry um c2 the B, regional bsia framework um i know march is slammed here i believe i've confirmed from the science centers that that is an agenda item that could be in april uh, we do need it before may i think is our deadline so we do need it in the spring but i think that could effectively be moved to april if the council is looking for an extra hour I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Um, Maggie. Thank you very much, Chuck. Um, my first recommendation uh, is regarding the scheduling of the ecosystem work group and the highly migratory species management team meetings in conjunction with the March meeting. Uh, it is not in the HMSMT's report, uh, but was brought to my attention that they overlap for part of that time. And um, that presents a conflict for, I believe, for multiple members. And so uh, request to consider staggering those so they don't overlap. Uh, while I am thinking about meeting scheduling, I will just uh, reiterate a comment I've made before. This is uh, just something to keep in mind in general, and I think has been illustrated during this council meeting. Um, the, the sooner the council has an opportunity to, to see advisory body reports, the better. Uh, it will help us move through decision making. So. Um, I know there are an awful lot of logistics and challenges that council staff work through in scheduling all this, but if there is uh, some opportunity to 
hold some of the advisory body meetings earlier to provide their uh, output to the council a little bit sooner, I would be in favor of that. I have some specific uh, additional comments on the council's agenda for March. First is uh, the gear switching item. I understand that uh, that you know, as as you said, and I've had a little bit of email exchange uh, with Jim and Jesse, and understand that there are plans to develop some information for the council and the public prior to the March meeting, whether that's videos and or uh, some other means that would help everyone understand uh, the alternatives as adopted and the areas uh, in need of clarification. Uh, and I would suggest that we uh, re we do not schedule a gear switching check-in for the March meeting, but instead uh, we we plan. You know, we that you go the council staff go ahead and produce that information. Council members should review it prior to the March meeting. Anyone else uh, can review it, and we can consider then under our future meeting planning um, when to schedule it and whether it might be necessary and appropriate, for example, to convene a meeting of the SAMTAC committee before uh, a meeting when we actually provide guidance so that the SAMTAC could potentially help inform um, a, a much more focused response to questions uh, on areas that still need clarification. I think uh, I'll offer my other comment regarding March. Um, I'm sure there might be some discussion on, on the gear switching approach, uh, but is that I, I think we could leave the limited entry fixed gear review item on March. I understand that uh, we're not expecting a lot of changes in the review document since the last time the council saw it. Uh, some updates and some completion of, of some requests that the council made uh, at the last step. And we would then be able to put it out for public review after that. Um, and that seems like an efficient uh, approach rather than prolonging it and potentially then needing to go back and, and redo and refresh some of the information in it, uh, you know, the farther we get out from, from what's already been done. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Maggie. Uh, any other thoughts about March? Maggie, did your hand go back up? It did. Thanks, Chuck. I just uh, forgot that I had one other brief thought about March, which is that um, I do think the fixed gear logbook item should be put on the March agenda item. I think we um, will want that to proceed through the process. I do think that the, uh, the check-in on the 2023-24 specs, specs and management measures would be good to put on, uh, but that should be an update with an opportunity for council guidance, uh, but not council action on any of, of those alternatives. And just an observation that um, I wonder if the amounts of time scheduled for G2 workload and new management measures, uh, ground fish, two hours and C8, future council meeting agenda, workload planning, one hour might be uh, a little short of reality, even understanding that uh, the April meeting will already be pretty set. So that all factored into uh, my, my recommendation on not scheduling a, a six hour sable fish gear switching item in March as well. Okay, thank you. And, and yeah, to, to your last point, the um, well, one of your last points there about the ground fish workload management uh, prioritization process. Uh, two hours, uh, I agree, is um, is light. Um, I think there's a lot of work to do there. Um, and um, as far in uh, the, fu the uh, future council meeting agenda and workload planning for an hour, um, uh, again, if, if April is pretty well set, I think uh, I think we've been able to keep that close to that. Uh, so I, I guess I would like like to try and do that, and then do the heavy lifting in April uh, when we start to look at June and the rest of the year. So um, I guess I'm inclined to keep that one uh, about there. But uh, but I think uh, adding to the um, 
to the workload and new management measure priorities for ground fish is uh, would be prudent. Um, well, I guess just to just to kind of pause here, I guess what I what I see here is um, uh, the the fixed gear logbook and the fisheries check in, which I, again I think two hours is probably uh, light for. Um, so if that was uh, if that one was three hours, the fixed gear logbook was one, and then we increased the workload and new management measure priorities for ground fish to three. Um, that would uh, that would put us over about an hour. Um, we did hear from Ryan that uh, it might be possible to move uh, the, the BSIA framework to April, which would give us that hour back, and would probably uh, fill up March uh, just about just about right. Um, so uh, that would leave research and data needs out, but uh, and then we've there's already been some discussion about the swordfish, the HMS items um, being delayed. Uh, so I guess what, what's left out uh, besides sablefish gear switching would be the troll catch share program and intersector allocation review. Um, so um, I guess, uh, you know, um, I do think, you know, that this ground fish workload is um, something that we need to look at uh, pretty hard at this meeting. Um, with the specs and, and the new management measures that are being considered for it. Um, you know, uh, I, th I think we need to try and um, keep our uh, priorities in, in front of us. Um, we will have some more staff capacity. We have, we will have Jeff, Jesse on staff. Of course, she's kind of been on staff, uh, at least on contract and working on uh, a number of these things. Anyway, um, you know, even last year she did a fair amount of work, or last uh, cycle she did a fair amount of work on the specs for um, uh, on contract. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're not uh, necessarily gaining a lot over what we had last time around. Um, obviously, she's been working on a lot of other things like non troll RCA and um, whiting ship utilization and um, gear switching. Um, so, uh, so we, we have some capacity, but uh, but I do want to make sure that the specs is the priority and that we don't expect staff to do it all um, as, as has been the case in the past. So um, so I guess to that end, uh, I am I am all right, uh, more than all right, uh, delaying the trawl catch share program in intersection allocation review uh, till after, um, well, after April, at the very least, if not uh, if not longer, depending on how uh, you know how much workload the the uh, specs are, are in, in entail. Um, so, uh, Corey Writings. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I just. I guess I'm looping back here a bit, but I um, wanted to support John's proposal to do a workshop on the swordfish management and monitoring plan, in, in including the EFH, um, excuse me, EFP gear performance metrics that Teresa Labriola talked about. Um, that th seems like a real um, thoughtful and smart way to get some of this work done and be efficient with the council's time. So. Um, I, I would like to see that move forward, um, and I'm, I'm happy to help personally with that as well. Um, also, uh, I heard Maggie talk about the AB's meeting sooner, and I support that as much as possible. Um, I, I think it's a better, more open, more transparent process when council members in the public and the entire council family can read reports ahead of time and allow more cross-fertilization of ideas. And, um, you know, regardless of whether it's done um, virtually or in person, I think that that's really an important step that could be taken to improve the process and, and hopefully reduce some of the um, stress and the workload for folks like the GMT too. So uh, just throwing it out that I think that's something that we should work towards. Um, thanks, and I'll stop there. Thanks, Corey. Uh, Mercy. 
Thank you, Chuck. Um, just a, a few comments on March. Um, I think I'll start with um, echoing Ryan's support for the fixed gear logbook uh, agenda item um, and that perhaps an hour is optimistic. Um, I'm hoping that we have um, a lot to talk about in that item, um, especially acknowledging the desire for a somewhat um, rapid timeline uh, for rulemaking action. We may only get uh, a couple of looks at this. So um, I think the the sooner we take that up and in um, uh, as much detail as possible, um, the better um, acknowledging the need to have this measure, uh, to have our recommendations on this measure um, to NIMS early enough for them to incorporate them. Uh, into the rulemaking. So certainly support that. Certainly support the check-in uh, G7 uh, for specs. I think that's going to be important uh, as a, another opportunity for us to hear the latest and provide some feedback. Um, I'm wondering about G2, the new workload management measure priority discussion that we have. Um, I'm a little concerned that there's going to be a lot of bleed over between the content of G2, G7, um, and C8. Um, and just wonder if um, and and recognizing that we are not uh, looking at a new managed or a, a, a non trial RCA item anywhere here on this list. Um, I just don't want to spend too much time rehashing things that really are on a list right now or have a home. Um, so I'm I'm just wondering if we really in fact need G2. I know there are other things that have kind of been dormant on that list that we haven't looked at in some time. Um, but acknowledging, as you indicated, our priority being the specs, um, just not sure that we'll accomplish a lot here in G2 in March. But that's just my perspective. Um, also want to think back a little bit, um, actually not all that long ago. Uh, we viewed the March meeting for groundfish as being a light or a non-existent meeting. Um, and just seeing up to potentially 10 groundfish items in March, um, you know, it's a little, um, little concerning. It certainly changed from how we were looking at things not all that long ago. Um, and just want to, I think, re-emphasize that March is a very heavy salmon meeting and always has been and really, um, you know, does take um, a lot of our time uh, for good reason to work through all of the salmon matters. Um, and that's always been a focal point uh, in March. Um, so I think also with that, I want to speak to the SSCs statement a little bit about the um, draft version of pre-1 and certainly acknowledge their interest in getting a copy as early as possible so that they have some time to uh, think about it um, and prep for their uh, statement development. I, I guess, you know, the without really knowing more about the proposal um, that they have in their report to us, um, I, I don't know that the council needs to weigh in on it um, other than to say I wouldn't want the SSC to bring us a review of the content of a draft that then changed. So that's my only flag on, on that. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Marcy. Uh, yeah, I think we can, we'll uh, work with the STT and the SSC Salmon Subcommittee to see uh, what we can get to them sooner rather than later. Um, you know, obviously, our, we want to make sure that it's, you know, remains under wraps, I guess, 
Uh, we don't obviously don't like uh, preliminary information or draft information getting out there. And you probably don't want to answer the questions of, well, what about this when you haven't seen it? So uh, <laughs> that that's kind of that's kind of part of the reason. But uh, but we we also understand, you know, uh, the need to uh, to get a look at that stuff early, you know, which is why we've had some suggestions of trying to look at it, uh, you know, even over the course of the summer or fall uh, of, of the previous years, just to make sure that the methodology that, uh, you know, there's there's uh, no change in the methodology that they've had an adequate time to review that. Um, getting back to um, the uh, ground fish workload and new management measure priorities, um, I, I do have some concerns about uh, delaying that, and um, I, I know that we've um, we basically tabled uh, any review of that over the last few meetings, and and I think that's okay um, because we obviously have uh, plenty on our plate already. Um, but the idea behind that, and particularly the March meeting, the one meeting where the priorities are set. Um, I, I think is uh, is worth uh, taking a look at and, and considering because um, you know the intent there is that the council uh, at, at this stage identifies uh, what their priorities are once the specs is over and uh, we we didn't do that last time around we waited and uh, what inevitably happens is that by the time the council uh, settles on, what they want staff to work on in the off specs cycle. Um, they've missed uh, the window of opportunity to get going, uh, you know, soon after the specs is sufficiently complete uh, to, uh, to dedicate some time to that. So it's, it's, it's a really, it's a strategic uh, planning uh, concern uh, that I think the council really needs to uh, look at um, in, in, a, in a big way, I think, um, in the near future. But um, this is, you know, it's still a pretty big part of it. But uh, but it's one strategic planning process that we've got in place, and I would uh, encourage the council to use it as it was intended, and uh, so that we can take advantage of of things and uh, and get things done in that interim. If you start late, you end late. If you end late, you're still doing it while you're doing this next spec cycle. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So I would uh, I would strongly encourage the council to keep that, uh, keep that agenda item on there and um, make an effort to, uh, to set the priorities. And, and again, you know, it may be, very well may be that uh, we've already got enough on our plate for the next, uh, you know, that next uh, period after the specs are done. Uh, so, um, so maybe, maybe that's, maybe it's not a heavy lift, you know, to do, to take that step, but I think, but I think it is important to identify that stuff and make sure staff is uh, ready to jump into uh, two items um, that are the council priorities uh, in that window of uh, opportunity and not not uh, not delay that. Uh, Krista. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chuck. I um, will lend some support to the um, swordfish workshop, um, although I would be really interested in hearing a little bit more about the mechanics on that. Um, I am hesitant about including the gear performance indicators um, fully into that workshop um, and and taking it off. I had thought we had agreed we were gonna put it at least tentatively associated in the June meeting. Um, and my concern about it being um, part of the swordfish conversation isn't that it isn't integral to that swordfish conversation, but that it's bigger than just swordfish. Um, and so just, I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that your performance indicators really is about any EFP um, in HMS, but potentially for anybody else. And so um, it may be appropriate to start that conversation there, but I, I just don't want that to totally fall off the um, 
council list um, and then to pivot a little bit um, just commenting that based upon the amount of conversation and discussion we had on fiscal matters at this meeting um, and having a prioritized work list we we may be a little light on 30 minutes in March but just an observation so thank you thank you Krista Butch yeah, thanks, Chuck. I, and, and I'm sorry if this is in the wrong place. I still learn in this, but um, you know, maybe remind everyone, um, you know, in <laughs> the salmon, you know, have a placeholder for salmon, but not only uh, that, but you know, not the the normal, you know, thing issues we have north of Falcon, but you know, uh, Sant Coho is probably gonna take up, you know, some pretty huge time between you know, California and Oregon figuring out the whatever they're going to figure out the tribal piece and then how to model all that to create fisheries. So um, there will probably be a little more council time taken up um, by that issue this March that um, might not be accounted for right now. So I just thought I'd throw that out there as a maybe a, a reminder. Um, it's changing it's going to change people's lives so anyway thank you chuck thank you butch um we will uh we'll take a look at our salmon schedule and um, and see what we think about uh needing to make some adjustments there all right uh corey niles uh thanks chuck i don't know if ryan's hand went up i don't know if you had something on that same topic if so mm -hmm. i can can wait to not bounce around too much. It looks like he put his hand down. Um, yeah, not to go back. Well, uh, we here at WFW are liking the direction, but just on on speaking to this ground fish workload priorities. Um, yeah, Marcy brought up some of the, some, of the, some some of the same questions about sequencing, um, and I think Chuck, I'm having you echo in my head right now from past meetings about repeating the same things over again under some of these agenda items. Um, but yeah, just maybe encouraging to think about how the, how these items would be connected. E, the proposed G7 with with G2 and then this 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 item, this equivalent item at the March meeting. Um, not, to, not to have that discussion here now, but some thought on a sequence of those would seems to be in order. And then separate question, um, on the ecosystem items, any I'm curious as to why they're at the end of the meeting. I think it's usually, you know, maybe something nice to kick off the meeting with. Um, in the past, but yeah, you know, not a pressing, urgent question, but if you had thoughts there, I'd be curious to hear them. Uh, thanks, Corey. Um, I guess in regard, uh, just maybe I'll see if I can. Um, maybe get some clarity from you. And I, I know Marcy mentioned this too, the sequencing of the ground fish items. I, I guess uh, I'm not sure how the G7, the fisheries check in, um, that that's related to the specs. Um, and so I view the workload in new management measure priorities, not related to the specs. It's related to the time when we're not doing the specs. And then, um, and I mean, you always have to, you know, at some point, get together and fit them in with uh, the rest of the world, the salmon and the HMS and the CPS and the FEP world. Um, so um, in regards to the uh, ecosystem business, um, we've, uh, well, um, we've struggled with that from time to time. Uh, uh, particularly when we were meeting in person, we had them uh, tried to have them early or have their um, advisory body meetings early so that they could overlap with the other advisory bodies since those are cross FMP issues. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, typically we had the agenda items pretty early in the council meeting too. Um, with um, Particularly, I think with the virtual meetings and some other opportunities and some more, you know, to uh, be able to attend virtually and uh, not have to coordinate people quite so much. We've um, we've scheduled things so that we can 
uh, make sure that the advisory bodies get the information um, uh, on, on the ecosystem issues um, and or have enough time to uh, develop statements on these and, and get them into the um, get them onto the council floor uh, without uh, being overly rushed, I guess. And so that's why we've kind of started uh, putting things, uh, ecosystem things, a little later in the agenda, just to give more time for uh, for all the FMPs, uh, which don't necessarily all meet uh, at the beginning of the meeting. Um, you know, time to. Um, receive the information and, and process it and fill up their statements. So uh, so th that's kind of why, I guess, um, if, if there's a desire to uh, reconsider that, we could, we could. <clears throat> Follow up, Corey? Yeah, no, and I think that makes sense. And just to um, try to quickly articulate what, I don't know if Marcy was thinking the exact same thing, um, but what, in the sequencing of the ground fish, you know, we just this morning, the council, you know, put a bunch of, uh, a number of items in the management measures um, of, of specs, but not knowing if they were gonna um, stay part of it or not. For example, the the tier fishery season extension item is an example that pops to mind. But so if those, if those come out of the specs, um, then they become something to talk about priority wise. That was just one example of what was in mind. That, that's that's a fair comment. Um, so it might be that uh, the um, fisheries check-in should come before the workload management agenda item during that March meeting. Is that is that the gist of that? I I think I would think that would be my my take. But yeah, just okay. that was me. Give some thought to it was my comment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's that's a good comment. Okay, Ryan. Well, thanks, Chuck. Another issue, two issues I wanted to raise. Um, one, we've heard some additional comments on uh, in the SMMP related workshop, and I just wanted to um, number one support what Krista said. I, I don't really. I think for gear performance metrics, it's much broader than that. It's also um, kind of adding a new item there. And I'm not sure I would support having that as part of uh, an assessment workshop when we really haven't had an SMMP agenda item yet. And I'm also a little concerned of the overall workload um, of workshop with the MT already coming here on existing workload. Uh, for the current SMMP test they have and for hard caps. Um, so that said, if there is one, however, um, uh, I think it should be much more tailored uh, in focus on uh, some of the uh, analyses and work the MT has done or is close to, closer to completing um, from those 2019 tasks. So that would be my um, reference there. Um, and then um, lastly, since we look to be kind of wrapping up on March, I mean, I'm not sure if I heard you mention, Chuck, whether or not this was going to be in person or or, or virtual, um, but that said, uh, I'll defer to you if I missed it, my apologies. Uh, my comments though, uh, regardless of that, um, are um, just that NIMS has been doing a lot of thinking. Um, I think you've heard it in some other comments from other council members uh, about, uh, in, in public comment, just about the lessons we've learned uh, from the past, um, Couple years here in a virtual setting, uh, I would hate to see us just immediately presume once we are back in person that it's it's back to exactly the way um, that it was, or at least without a just some sort of discussion of whether or not there is any uh, improvements or changes to the council process uh, that uh, could be supportive, could help us um, do our business more efficiently, or. Um, increased participation, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to note that here since we are talking about March, um, I will would like to have uh, discussions between uh, this meeting and the March meeting with council leadership and um, as well as uh, anyone else who's interested to see if there are any kind of uh, proposals that could be put forward at a future meeting. But I wanted to at least raise that issue here to, to let folks know that that's um, on it's mine. Thanks. 
Thanks, Ryan. Uh, yeah, as I, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the agenda item, uh, Merrick's planning to speak to the council about the uh, sort of logistics venue business uh, for the March and April meeting. So he'll he'll do that uh, when we're done planning the agenda here. Uh, we're planning for five and a half days for March and April, whether it's virtual or hybrid or in person. So uh, so I'm kind of operating on that assumption that we're just targeting five and a half days now, and we'll uh, we'll let. Merrick and, uh, and everybody deal with the, the, the rest of that. And uh, he can talk about it a little bit later. To your, to your point about, you know, uh, just, you know, flopping back to, you know, back to the future of 2019 or whatever, uh, you know, we, we certainly uh, recognize um, that there have been some uh, benefits of uh, our experience here in the virtual world. I think I talked quite a bit about it uh, under the budget fiscal matters agenda item and uh, the fact that we've been looking uh, at ways to uh, to hybridize the advisory bodies. Um, and certainly uh, we're looking at all of our options in terms of, yeah, sort of the three possibilities um, for both council and advisory bodies, in-person, hybrid, we're you know, half half the half the folks meet in person, and the other half are able to join remotely, and then uh, um, fully virtual or in person. You know, being the uh, the other two extremes. So we're we're definitely aware of that. Uh, we recognize the you know the benefits. We don't want to throw the the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Uh, so you know, we, we were you know we're looking very hard at at um, ways to accommodate uh, whatever the future uh, needs to bring. And I'm sure there'll be opportunities for discussion about that uh, with council leadership and uh, council staff in the future. Okay, uh, well, I'm not seeing any other hands to talk about March. So maybe we can talk a little bit about April then. Oh, there's Brianna Brady. Go ahead, Brianna. Thanks, Chuck. Um since we're on April, I just wanted to speak in support of all the aspects of the management team report and moving the various CP items around in the YAG per the MT report. So I think that might free up some space for April and CPS items. And also just to note support for the CPS advisory subpanel request for their meetings as they outlined it. Thanks. Thanks, Brianna. Okay, uh, well, um, then let me just kind of go over, uh, some, since you wanted to start with CPS, let's talk about it. So uh, one, I, one item uh, that the management team recommended was moving um, E4, the central subpopulation of northern anchovy assessment, uh, to June and including uh, management measures as part of that uh, agenda item. Uh, so that would, uh, that would free up two hours. Um, they also talked about... Um, I think uh, moving the EFH uh, phase two report to June. So that's something else we would not have to move up in order to, uh, in order to do that. Um, uh, let's see other things I think that uh, came up in terms of June. I, th I think those are the two things I noted uh, on, on CPS. Um, uh, I'm getting some uh, indication that there's some um, consideration of moving the stock assessment prioritization to November. Was that in the management team report? Okay. Um, so if that's the case, I, I apparently missed that. Um, that would that's another hour. Um, so I think what we have to uh, still have to deal with, though, is uh, we did move BSIA from March to April. Uh, that's got a May uh, deadline. So um, do we have an hour for that, I think? Um, the other thing we talked about was adding an electronic monitoring agenda item here. I'm not sure what to uh, what to think about the, the time necessary for that, but that tends to be um, something of great interest. Uh, there could be some pretty 
substantial discussion about that, uh, public comment. So um, I don't know, staff, we haven't really talked about how much to, to put in there, but uh, but I would think at least two hours for that. Um, uh, so I think, oh, and then, uh, Um, I guess the other, my, I had a, maybe a question for uh, for some of the ground fish folks. I see we've got in-season management here for an hour. I know we've got an in-season management item in March as well for ground fish, um, uh, which is scheduled for an hour and a half. And uh, I guess um, just wondering how realistic that is, um, you know. In March, you don't really know that much, but in April, I think you know a little bit more. And it, I, I guess I'm concerned that that might uh, require a little bit more time in April. The other item I think uh, I'd like to have a discussion about is the non troll rockfish RCA. Uh, that's in the candidate item box for, uh, for three hours. Um, I think there's obviously still some unknowns about that, uh, particularly in regards to how much of that's going to end up in the um, specs and what sort of workload is associated with whatever winds up in the specs. Um, and, the, and this is kind of, I think, where we get to the um, staff workload issue. Um, you know, I, again, council staff's done quite a bit of work on that. Um, Council staff and Jesse under contract have done a lot of work on that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we expect them to shift gears and spend uh, the majority of their time on groundfish specs. So I'm not sure how much um, we can expect uh, staff to be able to um, work on that uh, over the course of the winter. Uh, so um, I guess I'm not, at this point, I'm not confident that uh, whether we have uh, floor time or not, that we will have uh, adequate staff time to advance that uh, that agenda item. So um, I'd like to have maybe a little discussion about that as well. Um, but uh, I guess in the bottom line is, I think <clears throat> there, I think there probably is a little bit of, uh, there might be a little bit of time for some, some of these other um, other issues, uh, I guess, uh, in terms of Sam, and I'd like to hear from California um, on their thoughts about the uh, Sacramento and Klamath Conservation Objective and the Sacramento Aid Structured Assessment Agenda items. I know those have been uh, just kind of placeholders. We've um, pushed down the road a couple times. Uh, they're an outgrowth of the rebuilding plans uh, for those two stocks. And uh, I know there's some desire to uh, to uh, get to those uh, as soon as we're able, but uh, I guess I'd like to hear uh, their thoughts about that. Uh, I think that's all I've got. So uh, Ryan, I'll uh, call on you first. Thanks, Chuck, and I appreciate your overview. Um, yes, uh, we didn't put it on March, so I would strongly advocate for an electronic monitoring agenda item here um, in April. Um, uh, I would also fully concur that two hours at minimum, um, potentially three uh, for at least potential planning. Uh, we could obviously adjust and we'll know more on specifics um, by the March Council meeting. So I uh, can make any changes in that workload planning session if need be. Um, also wanted to speak to the non troll RCA issue. Um, I fully concur with all of your comments. Uh, on workload, um, I do not support having this in April. Um, I mean, we also have a GIS component that needs to be done to support that analysis and we won't have that, we're still working on that contract, we believe. So um, April is gonna be too early. I mean, June is most likely the earliest and that may um, be challenging as well. Um, uh, I would also, or some, uh, similar to some of the other reasons raised in 
uh, ground fish issues, I would uh, support leaving off the strategic plan scoping, um, but I would uh, be okay and would support having the Whiting Treaty implementation um, discussion. I don't think that will be a long, take a long time, and I think it's worth having on this April agenda. Um, I think he already spoke to, and Brianna already spoke to CPS, just wanted to support that, moving that into the agenda item to June to uh, be consistent and aligned with the new COP9 change that we just did. Um, and then uh, for, oh, and you already mentioned BSIA, so that would need to go here, for, not in March. Um, then on salmon, uh, I actually would probably recommend, at least at this point, adding a 30-minute NIMPS report. Um, I'm not sure if we'll need it yet, but I will know uh, by March. But uh, if, if we don't use the full 30 minutes, we know. But uh, it's possible that we may have some updates there as well um, if there's time on the agenda um, and that could be squeezed in. Um, and then you mentioned, I think, the, the conservation objectives in the, the age structure assessment. Um, you know, we have, uh, we support inclusion if there's time and if, and if folks can accommodate the workload, um, but understand it may be a, a challenging salmon year. So I'll, I'll defer to, to others on that. And that's NIMS views on April. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Uh, Maggie. Thank you, Chuck. Um, it certainly doesn't seem like we we would be prepared for a non trawl RCA preliminary preferred alternative step in April. Uh, but I I understand it could be helpful for staff and and for the future analysis steps uh, if there is a check in and potentially further refinement in particular of alternatives five and six, which I think uh, you know we're left. A, with some areas that will need to be filled in. So uh, I guess I just put that out there, suggest that if we have time and, and the relevant parties are prepared, it might be helpful to include it on there. Thanks. Thanks, Maggie. So just to clarify that, I guess just in terms of the scope of the action or the scope of the agenda item, so uh, would not, not be prepared for PPA, but this would uh, modify the range of alternatives potentially if there's more feedback on five and six I think you mentioned thanks Chuck I think that would be the case okay uh, thanks Ryan yeah sorry I forgot something um I did because I don't, I'm not sure if Brianna mentioned it or if you mentioned it and maybe did and I just didn't hear, uh, but there was a recommendation uh, for adding um, management categories, final action in April from the MT report for CPS and we would support that. Um, and uh, uh, and I think that's it, that, that's the one thing I forgot, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, that was adopted for public review at this meeting, so that would seem appropriate. Uh, okay, Marcy. Thank you, Chuck. Um, to respond to your inquiry on salmon um, and the two items in the candidate box, um, you're right, these uh, items have been on the year to glance as placeholders for some time. Um, just, I think, so we didn't lose sight of them. Um, I would agree that we're not ready to kick off any discussion on either of these two items um, in April. Um, I'd note that the SDT <laughs> is gonna be going through a lot of um, learning and um, we've got many new members uh, in that group, and I'm sure that just completing um, the tasks associated with the season setting process um, is going to be all consuming, um, especially um, acknowledging that um, we'll have some, you know, new, new 
needs um, with regard to, you know, NIMF, expected NIMS guidance. Um, I think that Butch referenced. Um, so STT uh, is, I think, one one place where, you know, we we should be cognizant of, of the capacity. Um, similarly, CDFW uh, staffing is a concern here too. I think um, both of these items are going to require significant coordination and engagement from our inland fishery um, counterparts uh, in our regional offices um, and in our fisheries branch. And um, we haven't made a lot of progress yet on identifying um, folks that are going to be able to engage in, in um, an overview of this magnitude for either stocks, um, either of these stocks. And I'd also add that um, with regard to at least Klamath, um, there was some discussion earlier this week about postponing um, certain things until after, um, you know, Klamath Dam removal. Um, I think that's certainly uh, something to be mindful of. Um, that timeline is um, quickly approaching. And so um, it would seem that, you know, at least in the case of Klamath, we keep that in mind before kind of scheduling a major new review um, of the Klamath Fall Conservation Objective. Uh, so I think that covers salmon. Um, on groundfish, uh, I I would note under the um, candidate item G7, the strategic plan, I'd reference our discussion in the fiscal uh, agenda item this meeting and some interest in maybe broadening the scope of uh, the strategic plan discussion to be more holistic uh, about other uh, strategic plan, uh, about comprehensive look at our um, strategic plan for the council and all of its activities. Um, I think, I, I'm not sure uh, where I'd prioritize that, but I would just acknowledge that um, maybe we don't, um, that the time is not of the essence with regard to groundfish strategic planning uh, here in April. And I guess I'd wait to hear more about thoughts uh, as we talk about um, our fiscal priorities and, and where that uh, proposal lands. Um, so I think I'm, I'm certainly comfortable putting this off uh, any any time, you know, soon. Um, I also want to support the recommendation to uh, pick up an EM agenda item. I think we've had a lot of discussion um, this meeting on our newly formed uh, committees and look forward to getting that work underway and would expect that uh, we'll have things to talk about uh, pretty quickly and uh, identify that as a need. Um, on G8, the non RCA uh, item, I support the discussion that um, you and Maggie just had uh, with regard to um, some form of a check-in and let's see where we are with specs and how that affects the content um, in this item and uh, agree with N Maggie's assessment that I don't think we'll be ready for a PPA um, in April. Uh, but I, I again support that the narrowed focus and the the thinking of council staff that a check in um, might be useful in April. I think that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Marcy. <laughs> um, a couple other things uh, to note. I, I guess as I look look at what we've added and taken away from April, I think we're uh, probably reasonably close to uh, to having our uh, five and a half days uh, here. We might be over an hour, an hour or so over, um, but uh, um, we will see. I, I, I think there will be some time to, you know, refine this a little bit in March. Um, I, uh, I will note, uh, Merrick just pointed out, we had talked about the possibility of 
uh, having a, a fiscal matters agenda item in April to adopt a, a an operational budget. We talked about April or June, um, so uh, that that's another decision that I think can probably be uh, figured out in March. Um, I w uh, we we have done an operational budget in April in the past once or twice, um, but more often than not, it's been June. So uh, I don't think that that's necessarily a time critical uh, time critical issue. But um, but uh, uh, I, you know I do hope that in March there's uh, a, a good discussion about um, some of those uh, contracting issues in particular. Um, you know, how those, how we might uh, address some of the council priorities for um, things like the uh, troll catch your review or electronic monitoring relative to the cost recovery aspect of that. Um, so uh, I guess I would just expect those to occur in March with, uh, you know, further guidance on where to uh, follow up, whether in April or June. So uh, given that, I think we're close enough on April to um, um, to I guess uh, be done with that. But uh, but I see Corey's that's Corey Niles has a comment. Thanks, Chuck. Just you know, it's that time of the meeting for me. We're really slow on the uptake. But did you mention the Whiting Treaty implementation? Is that um, out of the box? Uh, thanks, Corey. Uh, Ryan did mention it. He he advocated for it, um, and so I was I was including that. Uh, we've got thirty minutes for it. I uh, I don't think it'll take any more than that. So uh, that that was my my thoughts on that. Thanks, Maggie. Maggie. Thanks, Chuck. Just wanted to offer a thought. Doesn't need any decision now, but in response to Marcy's comments about uh, the ground fish strategic planning and our, our previous discussion about overall council strategic planning, I, I will say I have been thinking of those as different different things. I think we have been wanting to do some strategic planning in, in terms of how the council operates and does business, et cetera. And then I think within the ground fish uh, kind of FMP realm, there's probably a, a need for a lot of thinking about just within that content area, strategic planning and, and prioritization and how we approach what is really a, a very heavy um, workload, but overall just topic for the council. So just thought I'd hear uh, my thinking that those are different things. Thanks. Thanks, Maggie. Well, I'm sure the council will have lots of good discussions about that. Um, well, then uh, I don't have a whole lot to uh, um, talk about in terms of the year at a glance out beyond uh, April, um, other than just to note that uh, um, we have at, at this point decided to move the uh, anchovy assessment review and management measures to June the uh, EFH phase two report, CPS phase two report to June and the uh, CPS stock assessment prioritization process until November. Um, I, 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 I have here and, I, and I, this is one I need to, uh, to check on you with and that is the hard caps uh, discussion. Uh, I, I've, I put something here in June. I don't know if I did that during the course of our meeting or if that was a note to myself as a suggestion, but uh, but that's where that's where I've got it. Um, we do we don't have anything on the year at a glance uh, for hard caps. So um, let me just check in and see if that's an appropriate place to uh, for that to land right now. Um, and then one other thing I think we need to talk about at some point. Um, I believe the salmon EFH review is uh, is due, and so at some point um, I think we need to look at that. Um, I, I will note that uh, that Kerry is uh, pretty fully subscribed now between uh, the marine planning business um, and the other two EFH reviews that are ongoing, and uh, and staffing the habitat committee. So uh, I I want to. Uh, maybe just be cautionary about actually scheduling 
something uh, or raising expectations that if we put something on here that it's going to happen. Uh, but I do just kind of want to draw to the council's attention that uh, that five year review period is uh, is is up. Um, and that's about all I've got for the year at a glance. So uh, I'll turn to Ryan and see what he's got. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Just on your questions there, yes, we, we do need to have hard caps put on, um, and we would support uh, a preliminary preferred in June uh, for the AG. Um, I'd also note, since we're not putting the swordfish monitoring and management plan uh, on March, I don't want that to be lost either, and so I want to make sure that is also shaded on the AG. Um, and, I think June is appropriate, um, and then we can obviously revisit it in the spring uh, if need be, but I don't want that to be lost. Um, okay. I think those are my two main comments. Okay, thank you. And Corey Niles. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah, and that was what we heard uh, for the, drift, uh, the hard caps as well. Um, but on Ryan, I, I don't think I quite absorbed what Ryan spoke to last time, not not just now, but before on the swordfish uh, management and monitoring plan. Um, and, and there was a number of folks who spoke to um, the need benefit of of having some off the floor type workshop or or team advisor sub panel meeting. And we heard from some analyses that were being produced. Um, have been produced and we heard about these since September and in the timely nature of those and the information in those. So I just, I guess I wasn't hearing, maybe I'm, maybe I misheard what Ryan said earlier, but wasn't sure what's going to happen there on the planning front of, of there being um, some work done before it comes back to the floor and apologies, Ryan, if, if I misunderstood what you said, but uh, just yeah, wondering if, if you know, not today, but clarity at some point on next steps there. Okay, well, maybe we can get some clarity at the March meeting. We'll have the team and the advisory sub panel in session and uh, do a little planning on that. So that's about all I've got really for the agenda business. Uh, I did want to um, mention a couple other things, workload uh, planning or assignment sort of things. Uh, one, um, well, so the SC is uh, planning their methodology review um, schedule. I think that's important to uh, to work in. Um, the uh, they also advocated for some participation or working with uh, uh, Dr. Chapman and his um, his project uh, that we heard about uh, under open comment in regards to um, some climate change modeling efforts. Um, I think uh, his request or his plans are to conduct some workshops over the course of the winter and uh, was interested in having some participation um, from the council or the council advisory bodies uh, on that. Uh, their focus is uh, the California current ecosystem. Uh, so I guess I would uh, uh, indicate, I guess I would indicate my preference that uh, the, 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 if the council is okay with it to, uh, authorize um, some participation from our advisory bodies. Typically, you know, we authorize, uh, you know, maybe two people, chair and vice chair and or the designees to attend if those are in person. I doubt they'll be in person. But um, but uh, but anyway, I guess just to acknowledge that uh, if the council is um, all right with it to uh, to sort of participate in that that effort um, and it may uh, there may be some fruit that is born from that, and uh, maybe we can um, get an update at our March meeting under some one of the ecosystem uh, agenda items. Um, so uh, I'll just, I think those are the two main things I wanted to talk about. Uh, Marcy. Thank you, Chuck. Um, I guess on that point, um, I... I have a few initial concerns with that idea, but maybe um, you can clarify and I, I won't be concerned. Um, 
I, I think our advisory body rosters are posted in public. Um, and I think that means that folks can contact representatives kind of on their own accord. Um, I'm one, I'm concerned about workload and about um, folks participating in a venue, I think, like that and actually representing the council or the advisory body. Um, on, on the flip side, I think it's completely appropriate for them to be representing the industry that they represent when they come and serve on an AB. Um, I think, you know, this, this cut, I, I'm worried about slippery slope. Mm -hmm. um, there are an awful lot of requests like this that we get and um, I think we have to be mindful um, of our limited resources. And, um, you know, we ask a lot of our advisors and I don't know that I want to put this on their plate um, from our end again, acknowledging that there's a, a way that they can be contacted and um, queried um, already with the fact that we have the, the roster available. So maybe you can clarify a little more. Uh, yeah, thanks, Marcy. You're certainly right about the, the requests um, that we get for things like this. Um, but uh, you know, I, and I guess that's why uh, when I talked to Dr. Chapman, I suggested that these be, you know, uh, his workshops, um, so that um, you know it's not something the council is uh, sponsoring in any way um, or has any responsibility for. Really, um, my thoughts about sending or uh, permitting. Uh, advisory body representatives to attend is that um, I think it's good for the council to uh, have an opportunity to take advantage of any um, outcomes of the workshop and the research that's going on and to be aware of it and for our advisory bodies to be aware of it. Um, so, uh, you know, this wouldn't be an assignment. It would be, a, 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 you know, an opportunity uh, Maybe with a little bit more um, awareness of the of the topic, rather than just uh, relying on somebody to solicit their uh, their input, um, you know, out, outside of the council process. Again, the S SSC, uh, you know, recommended this particular one, uh, so that carries some weight. Uh, it's not it's not just you know somebody asking, but it's, it's, I think it's had some consideration from the scientific community. And again, I think, um, you know, the fact that it's uh, focused on, on the West Coast and um, sort of tears off of our community and uh, climate communities initiative, I think is, um, you know, some reason to, uh, you know, to con consider it, I guess, maybe a little more seriously than, than, uh, than some of the other requests we get. Um, and again, this, uh, you know, I, I don't. I don't know that there'll be. Uh, I, I would. I don't know if there'll be uh, expenses associated with it um, if they're virtual. And at this point, that was the last conversation I had with uh, Dr. Chapman. Indicated that that was what was likely. So I don't. I don't think there's, you know, a, a tremendous financial burden or risk to that. Um, and uh, my guess is there would be some interest, and in, uh, you know. I don't know. Uh, so maybe I'll just stop there. Okay. Well, um, if there's uh, no further uh, discussion on that and no objections to it, then I, th then I guess I would take that as uh, affirmation that we might uh, consider those requests as they as they come up. Um, Marcy. Um, yeah, thanks, Chuck. I appreciate your explanation. Um, 
I guess my my feeling is um, I'm still not comfortable, but I'm I don't think this is something to vote on. I I, I just um, would express reservations and concerns about um, how deeply we engage and and you know oftentimes you 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 know I mean there are certainly other <laughs> activities like this out there that are um, vying for our time. And I, I think we do need to draw some lines in the sand. And um, even if we did hear some support from the SSC, I, I don't know in what context that support came um, relative to other activities that folks might have on the plate. So, um, you know, that said, uh, you know, if no one else has concerns, um, you know, I'm, I just would like to, to flag that I do and, um, you know, would encourage a, a different route, um, with them reaching out directly to individuals, but, um, I guess more to come, maybe my concerns aren't founded and there won't be future requests like this, um, but I just see somewhat of a slippery slope. Thanks. Okay, well, any more discussion on that or any other aspects of, uh, of uh, the agenda or uh, other sorts of assignments? And if there's not, um, I will turn this over to Merrick to talk a little bit about um, the logistics of the March and April meetings. Go ahead, Merrick. Okay, thank you. Uh, this might be the only time I get to say this, but thank you, co-director Tracy. <laughs> Actually, Corey Niles asked me last night, have we ever had two executive directors at the same time? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, but here we are. So, um, yes, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'd like to um, switch the conversation a little bit and, and start thinking about, as, as Chuck indicated, um, logistics for March and also April. And in particular, this question that um, we are increasingly asking ourselves, which is, um, will we return to an in-person um, type of meeting? And if so, what does that look like? And so, um, Probably unsurprisingly to everyone, I, I do not have all of the answers, but um, we have um, given this a, a fair bit of thought and I've managed to talk with staff um, here and, and some of you about how we might start structuring, um, structuring ourselves to start moving away from um, a purely remote setting into something that allows for some face-to-face -face interaction, which I think we would all agree is important for our process but do so in a way that is responsible given the, the current pandemic um, that's in compliance with various policies of uh, health guidance for the different counties and cities where we plan to meet. Um, and also does so in a way that um, capitalizes on some of the, the things that we've learned here over the last um, year and a half or two years as we've been in this lockdown situation. So, um, let me try to start us off with some um, framing and some thoughts that uh, I have about how we might be able to move forward. And then I very much welcome the discussion with you all um, about where your heads are at, um, what you're comfortable with, and where we should go from here, and in particular, into March and into April. So when I start to break down this, this issue, um, I start to make a, a few assumptions. So, so, so one is, as, as we look out and start reading the news through the holiday season, you know, the pandemic is still here. Um, case numbers are on the upswing again. Um, that's expected um, as far as I'm aware. And then there is a time period after that where perhaps and hopefully things start to get back uh, down a bit um, case wise. And so um, if you're like me, that creates that bubble creates a bit of concern. Um, but at the same time, um, or, or sorry, before I go there, um, what that starts to tell me is that um, when we get to March, we will have a situation where um, it seems to me that it's unlikely that everyone would be 
able to travel, that everyone would be willing to travel, um, and that we would be in a place that would not have restrictions. And I, I put all of that together, and my assumption is that in March and likely April, um, the options that are in front of us are either a pure remote setting or a hybrid setting. Um, I, I think it's in my opinion, it's probably unrealistic to, to think about a full in-person meeting in March. Um, I welcome your reactions to that. Um, so if we are uh, looking at, at a situation where we have an option of a hybrid setting or a pure remote setting, we know how to do the pure remote setting. Um, we've been doing that effectively here. I think this council has done it better than just about anyone. Um, but something is still lost, in my opinion. Um, our process really thrives on a, some facial interaction um, that builds trust in the process. It helps us um, navigate some of these complex issues more effectively than trying to do so over text message and what have you. Um, so in, in spite of all of the success we've had, there is still a lot of value in FaceTime, especially as we start to think about the turnover in many of our, our advisory panels, the turnover in our staff, um, and turnover from Chuck to me. Um, so there, there's value in, in um, a hybrid setting, in my opinion. So the question is, can we do that safely? And can, can we do that in a logistical and technically effective way? So um, on the, the latter point, um, I've had a chance to talk with our IT staff and, um, you know, they're highly capable and we've been more or less experimenting with a hybrid setting a bit at this meeting. So um, if you haven't picked up on it, there are several of us gathered around a table that looks like a council meeting. Um, we have screens in front of us and there's enough room for probably every council member if they wanted to be here. Um, and it's gone pretty smoothly, as I'm, I'm sure you would agree. And we did this on purpose um, to see how it would go. Um, as I've chatted with, you know, Chris and Sandra about um, what this would look like in a different city, um, we undoubtedly start to face some challenges and questions about um, how we would pull all these different threads together. And as I think about um, doing a hybrid model, um, I, perhaps this is my preference, but I start to think about doing this in a way that's incremental because we have to do these meetings successfully. There is no other way. So um, I, I think of an incremental approach of a hybrid meeting if we were to do one that's here at the Portland office. Um, that's where my mind lands. And so then the next question is, can we do that safely? And um, certainly there are um, health measures and health guidance in place. In this case, uh, the Multnomah County guidance is what we would be following. And we also, we also have lessons learned about how to do this. And, and um, so I think that hybrid meeting, if we were to do so, would be hybrid option made available to council members and alternates. Um, we don't have the room here for advisory bodies and technical teams, so that would still be remote. And I envision a, a remote um, public comment um, opportunity as well. And so maybe that, as I sort of introduce this, uh, this thought, that starts to sound like a bit of a proposal, and I think it's because it is. Um, I think we should be considering a, a hybrid model in March if we can do it safely. Um, I do think that given our, our need to make sure we pull off a meeting successfully, um, that, that what that looks like is a, is a meeting that's here in Portland in the council offices. So I'd, I'd like to um, just gather your thoughts and reactions to some of that and um, hear your, your thoughts about my assumptions and my, my view of the world and um, see where we can go from here. Mark. Thank you, Merrick. Um, I'll hazard to go first because I know um, <laughs> people may be reluctant to get started here, but I, I think it's important. I appreciate you laying out that plan. And I think that certainly a hybrid meeting is something that, that needs to be needs to be an option. 
Uh, the March meeting is four months away. Um, we don't know if things are going to be better. We don't know if things are going to be worse. I will say that for the March meeting in California, things are getting better here. We're not seeing the trend we're seeing in other places. Um, and so I think while we want to keep a hybrid meeting as, as an option, um, uh, if we plan for hybrid meeting and things go are going great with COVID, we'll not be able to uh, have an in-person meeting um, because that decision will already be made. On the other hand, if we plan for an in-person meeting, we always have that option of, of the hybrid meeting. Um, that, that technology exists in the council office. Um, and so my, my preference would be, well, I appreciate all the work that's gone into creating that technology and I, I know it works well. Um, it's not a substitute uh, for an in-person meeting that can be held safely. And I think it's premature to assume that it cannot be held safely. Um, and so uh, there may be an issue with a council member or two. I'm not going to, I, I don't know what everyone's feelings are, um, but I don't think that if we, unless there's a ground spell from the council to have a, a hybrid meeting uh, I, I don't think that's something we should, in the first instance, be planning for. I think we should be planning for an in-person meeting. And I think we should be planning for an in-person meeting in a location that can accommodate advisory bodies. Uh, the March meeting, um, and I'll only speak from my experience um, with Salmon, because I served on the Salmon Advisory Subpanel for some years, um, that process loses a lot from a remote, for, for remote participation. And I've not heard any advisory body suggest yet um, that they want to meet remotely. So I think that it, my feeling is that we should we should plan for an in-person meeting with the remote as a backup in case things go sideways. And of course, no one has a crystal ball. Uh, and that we should plan for at least some advisory body uh, participation. In a, you know, and and. Again, because of my salmon background, I, I would support the salmon advisory subpanel being in, in person, um, and I, I think that that uh, and that means meeting at the planned location um, in San Jose. Um, I may come back to this after some more comments, but I, I think that that's my preference. I think that the goal to get back to regular order means planning to go back to regular order, and. Um, with a meeting four months away, I just think it's premature to uh, to be that conservative. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Butch Smith. Yeah, Mayor, congratulations. And I got stuck with my three-year-old grandson. So if something crashes, you know, you know what happened. I apologize ahead of time here. <laughs> um, I, I am I am going to concur uh, with the, with the chairman and um, the. the you know, we, we, we have learned a lot from this hive or this process that we're in over the last, you know, almost two years. And I think there's some room for uh, more public um, participation online than we, we realized. And I think that's a good thing. I think that can be improved on. But um, this process is, is a very important important process to do in person and and the and the chairman was right we, we've lost a lot in interactions to be able to go out and meet with the states and and do uh, do what we need to do in the business that we need to do it in especially with our you know in the salmon press all the processes I, I hear this from all the all the uh, uh, different count different uh, advisory panels that, that you know they're missing that too so I, I know we I think we plan for both the best and the worst and, and hopefully in March you know we're still going in the right direction I think there'll probably be a little bump up for the holidays and and hopefully it won't be too bad but uh, I, I am I am voting uh, if safe and practical it, it, it it's time that we we bring this process um, together again and uh, and 
you know, we definitely will not be able to start probably where we left off, but get, get back to what we consider um, a, a more normal uh, PFMC process. And uh, thank, thank you. Thanks, Butch. Uh, Bob Dooley. Yeah, thank you, Merrick. I'm, I'm on board with what Mark and Butch are talking about. I think that we, this process suffers from not being in, in, uh, in person. And I think that we, the point you made about um, turnover, I think we've done a really good job of, of trans, you know, doing this virtual thing, but it's because of the relationships we all have, in my opinion, that we've fostered over the previous years. As we see massive turnover in some of our, our, our advisory panels and on the council change that's, that's happened, those personal relationships aren't developed as well as they should be. And that that's how that's how we do our work. We we you know we 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 get together and we we talk about things. So I I think that we need to that needs to be our first priority is to get back together. Now the reality every every state is different. Every community is different. Um, I know there's some restrictions in San Jose that that are there now, but might not be there in March. And it or it might be worse. So I, I, I think we have to be flexible and understand that we may revert to some uh, hybrid model. But our first choice ought to be proactive and get back together. I think this is, uh, we're getting to a point now, at least it seems, there's a little bit of fluctuation in this COVID up and down. I don't see massive outbreaks of in our area, at least, I think it's it's pretty stable and don't hear a lot, you know. But it's different everywhere, so we need to be able to walk and chew gum. We need to be able to do that. But I'm I'm for getting back to normal as much as we possibly can. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Mark, you still have your hand up. Um, Next up would be uh, Marcy. Yeah, um, thanks everyone. I guess I, I look at this um, a little bit differently. I, I, I break it down <laughs> before I roll it up and um, certainly agree with the sentiments on, you know, first priority is getting back together. Um, but when I break it down, um, I break it into groups of how do we deal with council members as one, one category of discussion. How do we deal with advisory bodies? That's the next category of discussion. Then how do we deal with the public and public comment uh, into our process? Um, and then fourth, uh, how do we deal with delegation, which is another essential element of our process that um, we may not often discuss about a lot. Um, but when I think about starting with the council member piece, um, it would seem to me that uh, one, one important uh, role of council members um, as individual representatives is their right to vote or ability to vote um, on matters facing the council. And um, allowing for remote uh, participation by a council member um, to me seems like a high priority. Um, we wouldn't want a council member to uh, feel penalized um, for not being able to weigh in on items um, if, for example, they were quarantined and weren't able to travel. Uh, that would be very unfortunate. So I think finding um, an ability to participate for council members only remotely um, in a situation like that is um, is warranted. Uh, moving to advisory bodies, um, I would I guess note that we have a policy that allows for alternates. Um, 
which isn't the case for seated council members. I think that's important to acknowledge. Um, we might want to look at our um, alternate policy uh, with regard to substitutions um, and our kind of requested timeline for those um, substitutions, acknowledging that uh, if an advisory body member becomes ill or is quarantined, I, I think they need to stay home and they're not able to travel and um, allowing them a substitute voice is, um, is a good solution. Um, but with regard to uh, staff uh, using electronic technologies on all of the advisory body meetings, um, when they're happening concurrently, it's, I, I can't even envision how that would be accomplished um, by the IT staff. Um, it has been a wonderful feature in a remote setting uh, that um, folks that are distant can listen and participate in some of the uh, AB discussions. Um, I've benefited from that myself. Uh, I appreciate it, but I don't know that we can meet um, or that we can offer a continued opportunity for that um, looking forward, acknowledging our limitations. Um, then I think about uh, the public and um, the opportunities for public participation that we have in the council process. Um, I'd also, I think, acknowledge um, the audio stream feature that we've had for many years um, that has <laughs> been a wonderful thing, a huge development and um, allows for folks um, in all places to be listening live to the discussion. Um, wouldn't want to lose that. I think it's fantastic. Um, but that possibly we could allow for um, our public comment agenda items to the council to have a remote element um, where folks would be listening to the audio stream and then submit a public comment card and then be able to comment um, via phone or via some uh, remote technology. Um, and then we get to delegation and I would... Um, kind of treat that situation the same um, as the advisory bodies that um, there's really not, um, I think, a viable way to have a hybrid alternative there. Um, I know myself, it's, um, I can't imagine trying to get from, uh, physically get from, you know, a hotel room to a delegation meeting, have an in-person delegation meeting, or um, and then concurrently have a virtual delegation meeting, then disconnect from that meeting, physically take myself and my equipment into the council meeting chambers, re-log into the Wi-Fi in the ballroom and try to, you know, facilitate a combined in-person and remote uh, dialogue myself. So um, I guess, you know, with that said, just kind of some thoughts and, and how we organize our thinking, or at least that I organize my thinking, and um, some weighing in on the priorities. Um, with an ultimate goal, I think of prioritizing getting back together first, and then looking at how we can incorporate, you know, some elements of remote uh, as we go. Thanks. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, you raised a couple of points I'll come back to. Um, but for now, let's see, um, Ryan Wolf. Uh, thanks, Mark. I just wanted to say, you know, I take the point here just from a NIMS perspective so folks know where we are. Um, you know, our travel approvals are um, based on uh, a four-phase system based on transmission rates. Um, it's phase zero, one, two, and three. Um, 
in phase zero being the highest uh, level of concern and transmission rate to phase three being, you know, at some point back to uh, a better place pandemic wise. Um, so for phase zero and for phase one um, counties, uh, we are only approving travel for mission critical and mission essential activities. Now, of course, the council meeting is that. So um, the NIMPS seat uh, and the designees that fill it, um, I believe, um, or at least it, some subset of those would be available. So for the actual council actions and the NIMPS seat, we will have the ability to participate in an in-person meeting. It is not clear whether or not we would get approval for a group travel at the level that would include all of our advisory body reps. Um, so if that was the case, I just, I mean, it's, I don't know where things will be in March, but we are tied to this phase system on transmission rate and I'm positive that will not change by March. Um, so I just wanted to say that and then echo, I think where Morsi was going to with her comments that um, we need to uh, be cognizant of that uh, and uh, whether it's some sort of additional hybrid um, model that allows some remote participation, especially in advisory bodies um, or, or alternates. I'm not sure. I'm not sure alternates would actually help us in our situation. So we may be in a situation in order to have full advisory body presence, uh, there would have to be some sort of hybrid function. Um, at least at this point in time, if things were to stay. Now, of course, um, four months from now, uh, things could be different, but that's current NIMS guidance. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Bill Anderson. Uh, thanks, Merrick. Um, gosh, I don't know where to start. Um, my... Um, for what it's worth, the Pacific Salmon Commission, we're going to try meeting in a hybrid way where the commissioners are, we're all going to be in Vancouver, British Columbia, and, and our ancillary groups are going to be meeting um, remotely. I, I think that's where we ended up. Um, uh, I The thing I'm struggling with is, um, well, there's several things, but what is what what is the threshold where you where you make the decision that yes we can meet in person versus no we can't if we it, so if we go out from this discussion and let's just say um we're going to try to have a full on in person meeting in march um what is what, what what's the threshold what what has to happen for us to step back and maybe go to a hybrid or step back and go to a fully virtual meeting? What What is that criteria? Um, I'm as anxious as anybody uh, and see and, and share the, the feeling about the benefits of us being together. Uh, and, and I also don't, you know, I don't, we're, we're not going to be in a place where this, this where COVID-19 isn't going to be a part, uh, uh, isn't going to be with us, you know, for some time, whatever, whatever I don't know how long that is, but it's, we're, we're going to have some level of COVID going on in this country, I think for a long time, I don't, and uh, at some point, um, we're going to need to, we're going to need to decide what those thresholds are that we're going to say, okay, it's maybe it isn't totally safe from a transmission perspective that, that you're going someplace where you have, you don't have, you have zero chance of, of transmitting COVID, but um, there are, so there's that threshold question that I struggle with. And I, I will note, you know, like the, the GMT, for example, told us, for them, it's that it, for them it's all or nothing. We, either everybody can come to the meeting, all the GMT members do a GMT meeting, or they want to do it virtually. Uh, and I'm kind of that same way when it comes, even if we break it down to the 
council versus our advisory body that at a council level um, that it's all of us or or we're going to be virtual i i I loathe the thought of a of a hybrid where some of us are in the room and some of us aren't but none of that is very helpful in trying to decide what to do here. I realize that, but it my biggest again my biggest thing is where where's the line what what has to happen for us to say no, we're not going to do it or if we stay above certain a line or certain lines that we are going to meet in person and just Merrick, maybe you've thought about that and could offer some thoughts. Yes, thank you, Phil. Um, your your question, Phil, actually is um, related to, I think, some of the points that um, Marcy and Ryan were raising. Um, I start by first thinking about it from a logistical perspective. Um, so one one bookend is that we 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 do not have the the capability right now to run concurrent um, advisory body and technical teams in a hybrid manner. We touched on this earlier in the week when we started talking about um, you know our financial savings and what that might take to to purchase microphones and you know electronic brains and things that would be capable of, of doing that and that's a significant expense to the tune of a hundred thousand um, and I'm getting the thumb that I think that number is low so um, it, it's significant so that's one bookend which is um, if we're wanting in-person advisory bodies at this point it is an all or nothing um, like I said before though that's probably not the same case for the council. And I well, it's not the same case if we were to have just the council meeting. Um, we've been running a meeting here um, in a hybrid format, um, trying to test this out a bit. So we're in a position of saying um, we're, we're capable of running a hybrid council member meeting um, with remote for everyone else. Um, we could also fully meet in person. Uh, and what that threshold looks like when we fully meet in person and we're confident that we would have a quorum and our uh, technical teams would be fully staffed and everything. I don't have a good window into that. Um, much of that is based on, you know, agency policies and, and risks that those agencies are willing to take. And um, I, I think I'm just not in the best position and maybe some of our agency folks can speak to some of those thoughts. Mark Gorelnik. Well, I'm not an agency person. I'm sure that's clear to everyone, but um, I, I wanted to see if we can maybe try to converge a little bit here. So um, I, I, I understand uh, certainly from the GMT uh, that it's an all or nothing uh, for them. And I think that I got Ryan's point that it's unclear at the moment whether NIMPS staff will be able to participate. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. It's four months away. We simply don't know what that is going to be. And so while for management teams and maybe some advisory bodies, that may be an all or nothing thing. It's not all or nothing for every advisory body. Well, let me rephrase that. Some advisory bodies have, for example, in management teams have NIMPS representation. So that's a case where you can forecast that you won't be able to get everyone together because it's possible that the NIMPS folks will not be permitted to travel. But most of our advisory bodies, um, generally, I mean, other than maybe the Habitat Committee, don't really have NIMPS representation, the Salmon Advisory Subpanel, uh, yeah, basically the advisory subpanels or basically industry and community folks. And, and what I would suggest the solution there is to leave it up to the advisory body. If we have an in-person council meeting, does your advisory body willing to meet in person realizing there's no virtual alternative or would you rather be hundred percent virtual? 
uh, that may work for some for some advisor bodies being in person. It may not work for others. But just because it doesn't work for some doesn't mean it doesn't work for others. And I think that there's general recognition that meeting in person has its benefits if it can be safely done. Um, to Phil Anderson's point about when do we know whether it's safe enough, I think that we have to rely in the first instance on the local health authorities. What do they say about meetings? Are they permitting them or are they not? Do they have requirements for masks or testing or vaccination, whatever those are? Um, th they are presumably the experts and, and we are not. So I think in the first instance, that's the place we, we, we defer. Uh, but I think Phil is right. This uh, COVID-19 is endemic. And um, it's going to be with us in some way, shape, or form, probably for years, if not forever. It's going to get managed. It's not going to disappear. And so, um, you know, I think that we're at the point now where we either decide to meet in person or at least attempt to meet in person, if that can be done safely or not. And so what does that mean? It means the council. And it means, the, in my mind anyway, the advisory bodies that are, are able and willing to, to meet in person and with, with a virtual option for the others. I don't have a solution for the challenge that Marcy raised about delegation meetings. I think that's a tough nut to crack, um, for which I apologize. <laughs> but uh, anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else? Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, Merrick, you know, just in my meetings with other people around the country and particularly in the MREP part of this thing, other councils do think, do are doing several different ways, hybrid meetings, remote voting, things that, you know, uh, like that. It might be good to get some, just to take the temperature if you haven't already done it of what other councils are doing. I'm sure you probably already have and maybe unnecessary comments, but it seems to me that we're, uh, we're not inventing the wheel here. Thanks, Bob. Um, Chuck? Thanks, Merrick. Just to... Uh, touch on Bob's point. Um, yeah, we've had quite a few discussions about what's very regular discussions over what other councils are doing. And there are, I mean, just about every council has uh, has started doing hybrid meetings. But many of them have been doing them for a long time, like the Western Pacific. Uh, so, that, so this is not a new thing. Uh, it, you know, the ability to be effective and to provide access to people in various in-person or remote forums is quite doable uh, and, and has been done quite well for a while. So, so uh, as, as Bob said, we're not, we're not reinventing the wheel here. Um, so I, I will just leave it at that. I see Brad trying to raise his hand next to me, so I'll just call on him. <laughs> uh, um, well, I will say that uh, one thing, it's been, uh, it has been a joy uh, to be here uh, back in the council office amongst staff and our two directors and to experience somewhat what it used to be like, um, sidebars, um, having dinner afterwards, talk things through, little nuances um, that make a meeting go better. Um, that's not lost on me. I'm sure it's not lost on any of you as far as we want to get back there. I was under the mistaken impression that um, um, that we could have, I, I, was, I was thinking about having a meeting where the council could be in person, 
the advisory panels could be in person and the management team, since the, the government restrictions from the makeup of that, those uh, those bodies would, might um, hinder getting together and that they could meet virtually. Um, but uh, having talking to Chris here about that, it's, uh, that's really not doable. It's all or nothing because um, all this, his equipment is here and he's got to run them and, and he oversees those meetings. And, um, and I think that's why um, uh, Merrick has floated what he did as far as having here, as far as get the baby steps get going. I just never really quite personally didn't quite get that until my discussion with Chris. Um, but with that, um, you know, failure isn't an option in this process. We got a lot of stuff to get through. Um, salmon meetings are pretty important. Uh, a lot of um, a lot of um, back and forth has to happen between groups. You have advisor panels that have a lot of new members that need to get to know each other to uh, work cohesively uh, into the future. And so um, I'm kind of leaning towards what Merrick maybe has proposed about meeting in Portland um, because the advisor bodies could be here, the advisory panels could be here in person. Um, and we could still do virtual for the management teams um, at virtually no cost. And I think that sounds to me like the best option right now. Um, sometimes it takes baby steps uh, because as Phil mentioned and others, um, you know, this thing is not going away and uh, we just need to deal as best we can. And um, I think that that's probably the, maybe the best start from my perspective. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Um, just for the benefit of myself, um, what you were suggesting is a uh, hybrid with the council in Portland, an advisory bodies meeting at an adjacent hotel in person, and technical teams meeting uh, virtually. Is that correct? Um, yes. P preferably next door at the embassy suites. So. <laughs> Any other comments from anybody? Uh, Joe Oatman. Uh, thank you. I haven't provided any uh, comments so far on this. Um, pretty difficult for me to do so. I know at the uh, March meeting uh, that including the salmon item where we typically uh, get the most um, participation by the tribes uh, for that. Um, so the challenge, at least based on our side, I believe, is you know I represent you know 26 sovereign nations and uh, you know the COVID and uh, health and safety of uh, any um, member from these tribes who may or typically do um, participate in salmon meetings, you know, it's something of critical importance to them. Um, so I haven't had any uh, direction provided to me by uh, any of the tribes uh, so far. Um, and so it leaves me um, uh, in a difficult spot to, you know, add anything constructive here. Um, but I think speaking for myself as a council member, I'm certainly open to um, a, a hard rate um, approach. Um, I certainly feel comfortable, um, you know, being able to meet in person. Um, and when we have advisory bodies uh, meet, you know, in proximity to us, you know, I think that's certainly something for uh, tribes to uh, consider. Um, uh, nonetheless, uh, I think my ability to um, coordinate and sidebar with tribes um, will still be a challenge uh, if it were a hybrid approach. Uh, even a full remote approach, it, it's a challenge, as, as I can attest to from certainly this week. Um, so, I, again, I don't think I'm really adding anything constructive here, but I just wanted to. Uh, give the council uh, and executive directors, um, you know, some thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, 
Maggie Summer. Thank you, Merrick. Uh, thought I'd weigh in from one of the agencies. Uh, certainly, ODFW recognizes the value of getting back to in-person meetings and and having the, the in-person contact uh, and communication. We are uh, fine with a concept of hybrid meetings uh, if necessary, and certainly recognize the potential benefit of uh, starting off with that from Portland, as Brad described in his proposal just a minute ago, that made quite a bit of sense, and really recognize the benefit in the uh, advisory sub-panels getting together in person if possible, given all the, the turnover in particular and, and starting off you know, new, new working relationships as a group it would be great if uh, those are able to be in person. And then finally, just recognizing that uh, yeah, it might not necessarily, it might not be, there might not be a one size fits all approach for the management teams either. And I'm, I'm just thinking in particular that that they may operate a little bit differently from each other and interact with their relative relevant um, advisory sub panel a little bit different. So, for example, if the salmon technical team. Um, would benefit from meeting in person along with the salmon advisory sub panel and that its members and agency representatives were able to do so, you know, that I imagine that's the kind of thing that could be determined as we get closer to the meeting. Great. Thank you, Maggie. Any other comments, uh, Heather? Thank you, Merrick. I'll, I'll chime in here too. Um, and I, as the conversation's been going on, I've been trying to wrap my head around um, how these, these hybrid meetings would work. And um, yeah, still struggling with that. I think the point that um, Maggie just mentioned about the STT and the um, Salmon Advisory Subpanel maybe needing to be together, maybe think about the GMT and the gap and how collaborative they are and how important those collaborations are. And um, I'm not saying it, it would it couldn't work, but then the idea of the, the gap being in person and the GMT um, working remotely and, and how they have those joint meetings um, are just things that are coming to to my mind, and you know, I I know I talked in our delegation meeting a couple times this this week about how uh, much I'd like uh, for us to all be together, and um, so I I I appreciate the conversation, but it, it's um it feels not as easy as we either do hybrid or in person. And one thing that I keep thinking about is uh, one of the one of the barriers to getting back together, it sounds like really are these transmission rates. And I I don't know what they are or if they're coming down. And I, I must say, I've just, I haven't really paid attention about that or to that. I don't know if there's uh, any trends that we're looking at that would point us to maybe by March, we could be in person, um, uh, in person, after talking about what hybrid means seems like the easiest option. But um, anyway, those are just some thoughts I'm having. I um, yeah, I don't have a, a any guidance or preference, just, just thinking out loud. And I think Marcy's point about uh, just transitioning from our state delegation meetings in the morning uh, to the council room, it's challenging in my home office to do that and you know it it's um and it's just switching from one meeting to another but the idea of potentially um holding a delegation meeting uh in our hotel room or a conference room at the advisory or the uh, embassy suites and then walking over to the council office uh, i just think that's a, a something uh, real to think about um, about how we do it. I'm not saying it's not um, a problem that we can't solve. I just, I think it's a real, um, something to really think about. So thank you. 
Thank you for those thoughts, Heather. Um, Corey Writings. Thank you, Merrick. Um, I am sort of sorting through this, so apologies. My thoughts aren't perfectly organized here. Um, but thanks to you and Chuck and Chris and Sandra, especially for um, getting us to, to, to this moment as successfully as you have. Um, in terms of hybrid meetings for the council members, it seems like um, this week has proven that that can be done at least mostly successfully. Um, I'm generally supportive of that concept. I think that, and it, I've heard other people say this too, I, I think there's tremendous value in being able to have eye contact and read facial gestures um, and be able to increase that direct communication between members. Um, and also respecting the fact that we, we don't know where we're gonna be in March and there may be some folks that don't feel comfortable to be in person inside just yet. So that seems hybrid seems like a reasonable option to keep on the table. Um, I, I did wanna voice some concerns about the sort of if ABs are in person and they're sort of mandatory in person, I, I worry that there actually might be a, a significant number of folks who wouldn't be able to make the meeting. Um, and given the fact that we have quite a few new folks, um, that that might be an even bigger lift in terms of figuring out how to do alternates and that sort of thing. So um, not to say that's not a hill that can't be climbed, but just something to keep in mind. And um, if that were to move forward, maybe there'd have to be some sort of um, outreach effort by council staff to make sure folks had an alternate in mind or, or had plenty of time to sort of think through how those meetings were going to happen. Um, I'm not sure if this is sort of a crazy idea or not, it probably is, but to the point that none of us have a crystal ball and we, we don't know transmission rates and that sort of thing, I, I don't know if it makes sense to try to revisit this in late January, um, if, that's, if that's even a possibility sort of logistically. Um, but it, it might be helpful if um, council staff sort of took some of the discussion we're having today and, and maybe threw together some options on paper and and the, the council could consider it at a, um, a point in time that was closer to the actual meeting um, and, and maybe have a slightly more structured discussion there. So um, anyway, that, that's my thoughts. Thanks very much. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Marcy. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Merrick. I, I just want to make sure that um, I clear up um, a deficiency in my earlier remarks when I spoke about advisory bodies. Um, I intended to be referring only to um, our um, industry based advisory bodies, not our management entities. I, I think they are yet a fifth category that needs their own special scrutiny and treatment. Um, the management entities, uh, certainly, you know, as a, as a state agency um, person and as a state agency supervisor, um, I certainly cannot um, require my staff to travel to a meeting. Um, the good news is most of them usually very much want to go to a meeting. Um, but um, just like with council members in an event that they were unable to travel, um, I don't see that substituting them out is a, a possibility at all. Um, we have folks that are carrying the lead on items that, you know, it's their um, their knowledge of a particular issue that um, has them uh, heavily involved in a discussion or doing an analysis. And so um, it would not serve the council well at all um, to not be able to offer some um, technical support to a management team that was meeting. And I guess I would note that um, it's been actually several years, I believe, that um, the STT and the GMT have offered um, some form of hybrid approach to their meeting in the sense that um, folks haven't been able to travel, they've participated by phone uh, or virtually, um, 
with a pretty good effectiveness in, in engaging in the management team uh, discussion. I think the challenge there, though, is that um, those weren't meetings that co-occurred with a council meeting um, that I can recall. So I think it's it's a question of um, timing and alignment of the management team meetings with the full council and and thinking about how that operates. Um, I'm just acknowledging there's there's only one Chris to go around and uh, one Sandra to go around and uh, the other council staff that contribute to the IT operations. Um, they, last I checked, um, have other um, obligations as well involved with council meetings that um, keep them busy. So um, appreciate the conundrum there. Um, and at the same time, I, I I, you know, would not um, think want that um, to prevent us from moving ahead toward finding some solution that does um, allow for some in person somehow. Um, anyway, thanks. Thank you, Marcy. Um, th this is a, a, a very rich discussion, and it's really helping me to wrap my head around um, around this issue. I know you all have been talking about this for um, quite a while now, and, and I've been here for a week, so <laughs> perhaps I'm still getting up to speed, and so this is really helpful. Um, I, I don't want to cut off discussion, but but I do want to offer up um, maybe a, a way to, to make the call. Um, and, and one of the things that's really staring me in the face right now, um, quite literally, is um, the cost to this to this council um, that, that comes from delaying this decision. And so, as you all know, we signed contracts with hotels months, years in advance. And, um, you know, if we cancel early, it doesn't cost us much or anything. And the longer we wait, the more it does cost. And so, I, I would like to... Um, if we are going to um, have to back out of a hotel, I'd like to be able to do that um, before it, it costs us a lot. And so maybe as a, as a, as a time horizon here, um, if I look at our schedule right now for March and April meetings, we start to lose almost a couple of hundred thousand if we don't make a decision by December. And then it goes to 200 some by January and a little bit more by end of February and so forth. So um, unless there is um, a thought to the contrary, I think the way forward is uh, for the, the chairman and I to take this very rich discussion to heart. And um, I would propose that he and I um, work together to decide what the, the appropriate course is. Um, and that we do so here over the course of the next couple of months while we, our crystal ball perhaps gets a little less foggy um, and we learn a little bit more about what we think we can do in terms of um, a hybrid and a in-person and whether it's something that, you know, Brad and Maggie spoke to perhaps, um, or maybe it's, maybe it's full in-person, maybe things go swimmingly. Um, I guess that would be my proposal for moving forward, um, that the chairman and I take this this matter to heart and you, all of your good input to heart, continue this conversation with you on the um, over the next few weeks as, as things progress um, and make a decision accordingly. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Merrick. That was really good information on the cost of, of delaying the uh, the decision to, you know, to go hybrid or in canceling through the hotels. It seems to me that that ought to be part of your analysis in purchasing the equipment to allow us to do a better hybrid version. I mean, as others have said, this hybrid, this COVID thing's not going away anytime soon. And I think it'll be rising and falling and we'll be in a, in a situation where um, making decisions in a timely manner might not be as easy as, as it could be. So because of that uncertainty and things that pop up, 
So if you're doing the analysis, it might be good in that context to, to factor in that extra money it costs to cancel and not be sure. And that might fund <laughs> in a very short while the, the amount it takes to, to buy the equipment to be more flexible. So anyhow, I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. That is a, those are good thoughts. The other thought related to that is how long it takes for the equipment to get to us nowadays. Um, I'm told it would be at this point, um, we'd be hard pressed to have an equipment in hand in time for the March meeting. Um, but your note on savings to pay for such a thing is well noted. Um, Mark. Okay. Yeah, Merrick, I think it's a good idea for us to talk about it. There, you know, I think one great example of the problem with remote meetings is that Brad was there with you and council staff to talk about this, uh, and I was not. And uh, so, you know, Brad's got somewhat uh, a different education on this uh, than I did. Um, but I think we need to talk about it. One of the things that seems to come become clear is that the is that we're sort of tied to the council office because of the need to run uh, these, the potential to have to run these virtual uh, advisory body or management team meetings. And uh, otherwise, if they could be run from uh, a hotel in, in, in San Jose, then, then we wouldn't be tied to the council office. So that's something we need to explore, especially if we're gonna invest money in more equipment. And if we're still gonna be tied to the council office, uh, in order to do that, then that's something we need we need to have up front. But let's you and I talk about this um, uh, before we uh, incur some uh, irreversible financial damage, and um, and uh, I'll just leave it there. And I, I yeah, I'll just leave it there. Okay. Thank thank you, Mark. Um, Phil. And I will leave it with. Um, my perspective is that you should make a decision by the end of December. I believe that we need to either go virtual or do a hybrid. I think a hybrid, and I'm talking for both March and April, I think whatever we do for one, we're going to, we should do for the other. I would go, I would um, prefer you lean toward trying to, to, to do a virtual some um, and that we um, delay thinking about a full in-person meeting until the June meeting. Thank you, Phil. Are there any other comments on this matter? If not, um, I think uh, Mr. Chairman, I will hand it back to you. All right, thanks, Merrick. Uh, thanks for leading that discussion. I appreciate it. Um, a lot of good thoughts and uh, not a lot of great solutions. Um, so I think we're almost done uh, with council business here, but we're not quite done. And I'm gonna toss back to Merrick to uh, start a new topic that um, it's important to us. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, well. Over the last week or so, we've heard several times about Chuck Tracy's retirement. Um, and I have the honor here of being not quite the last one to say congratulations, but um, almost. And I have i don't know Chuck. I haven't had the opportunity to work with Chuck as much as many of you all, but Chuck and I have worked together twice now. Once, um, what was it, 13 or 14 years ago when Chuck was the salmon staff officer um, and I was helping to put together the trawl rationalization program. And then now here over the last week, as I've been uh, shadowing him and really getting the opportunity to learn more from him. And, and a couple of things are, are very clear. One is Chuck is the consummate professional, um, a gentleman. He works harder than just about anyone I've ever met. And he's really good at what he does. He's been good as a salmon officer, He's been an excellent executive director. And Chuck, I hope you're excellent at re retirement. <laughs> so, um, and I, I thank you for leaving the council in such a great state. Um, 
with some very talented staff, the council on a very good trajectory, the finances in very good order. And um, I feel very fortunate, so thank you. There are also uh, some other folks that um, I, I'm sure would have loved to have been here in person and, and, and can't be. And so instead, Chris has assembled this video um, and I will uh, let him just take it away. I just had a few words I wanted to say about Chuck and, and just thanking him for his service. And, and first of all, Chuck, thank you for your service to the council and your calm, steady leadership of the council. I've been impressed because of your experience with the council. You know the council process well, and you've done a great job of guiding the council and knowing when to weigh in on issues to, to bring the council to a good conclusion on those issues and, and, and maintaining a real stable process. Um, moving forward. The second piece is I really just want you to thank you for being a great partner with the National Marine Fisheries Service. You, you've always worked with us um, and always found a constructive path forward on issues um, and, and, and really worked with us, you know, hand in hand um, with the Fisheries Service, knowing that we have to get actions through the council process and up through our process and making sure that works so that we have a good outcome in the end. And lastly, I just personally wanted to thank you for and, and let you know how much I've appreciated your no-nonsense um, demeanor, calm demeanor in working with the council. You've worked through a lot of tough issues in the council process as the executive director, and you've never hesitated to reach out uh, to me, to Ryan, to others as we've tried to work through those issues. Um, and, and figuring out, um, you know, what the appropriate balance was and trying to, you know, get issues resolved um, in a way that actually works for the agency, works for the council, and works for the council family or whatever. So, you know, I want just thanks again. Um, I, we really do appreciate you from the fishery service. I've appreciated your work. I wish you a smooth sailing, and hopefully I'll be able to see you out on Lake Merwin uh, sometime in the future. So thanks, Chuck. Hi, Chuck. Congratulations on your retirement. Hope that it works out a little better for you than it did for me. Seriously, thanks for your many years of dedication and commitment to the council family. You've been a steady hand on the tiller of this great ship. Your guidance has led us safely through some treacherous storms and rocky passes, always leading us to calmer waters and better fishing. Most importantly, your leadership has helped to build a strong and cohesive council family. I'm going to miss your contributions to the evening council member receptions during our meetings. By the way, by my count, you owe us nine since COVID has suspended our in-person meetings. Hopefully, as you and Ruth embark on your next chapter of your journey, you will not forget us, and we will see you around every once in a while. <laughs> it's been a great trip. You leave us with the fish holds full and in ship shape, ready to leave the dock for the next trip. Thank you for your great friendship, Chuck. I wish you fair winds and following seas. Thank you. Chuck, it is, uh, it's been great working with you the last, uh, well, four and a half years uh, with me on the council and the uh, 10, 15 years uh, previous to that, uh, working with industry. Um, I'm just so happy for you, really. I mean, it's, I'm sad to see you go, uh, but man, you've done a fantastic job in virtually everything you've done. And uh, you really, you know, it's professional life well lived. And you've had a lot to the council process. And uh, you've been a great friend. Um, and uh, you've, uh, you've just been, um, I, I couldn't ask anything more from someone in the positions you've had. And so um, uh, as we leave you, uh, or as you leave us, um, I hope you uh, do all the, check off all the bucket list uh, items that you possibly can. And uh, enjoy uh, enjoy life uh, uh, after you leave us. Um, but I do hope that you would uh, keep in touch, and I'd certainly uh, like to maybe maybe go hunting and fishing with you, maybe some some endeavor in the future. And um, I just uh, see I'm I'm sad in some ways. Uh, okay, hate to see you go, uh, but I'm just really happy for uh, uh, for you uh, to take that next step and to uh, enjoy uh, enjoy the life that, uh, that you've. Um, uh, you set yourself up for from here on out. So anyway, uh, good luck and uh, let's keep in touch and um, all the best. Jack, it's Brett. 
gone but not forgotten i see or maybe i'm just an artifact of an old email list i I don't know um it occurs to me as i sit down to record this that you may need to have chris sign a non-disclosure agreement after interviewing all of these people from your past Uh, anyway i wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you from the bottom of my heart you've been a formative figure in my life and i have been changed for the better from having been around you I'm lucky to have had the extra time and the shared bond that comes from spending all of those hours in the team room together early on when I joined the council family. Your service to that council family and all of the stakeholders that are affected by council decisions has been exemplary. You've shown wisdom, patience, care, and what it means to be a leader. You've made the world a better place, and that is something that should be admired and appreciated. I think that you should be proud of that, and I'm proud to know you. Well, that's all I have to say. I've no doubt that Butch is going to pop up somewhere in here and crack everybody up, so I will leave the real funny to the pros and say so long. Uh, It's see you later, though, not goodbye. Happy retirement, friend. You've earned a break. So, um, uh, you know, this is for my good friend Chuck. Um... Chuck and I, uh, Chuck's lucky. This is not a normal roast that we do in person, so it'll be uh, a little more PG than than the stories that I could tell, but that's okay. Um, Chuck and I go clear back to 1982 when he was a fish checker at El Waco and and I was a deckhand on my grandfather's charter boats. Back then, Chuck had this flowing, long California surfer uh, uh, type hairdo, um, which hair was longer when we, we, we had hair back then, uh, but not quite, uh, still in El Waco, quite wasn't the uh, California blonde surfer dude uh, type hairdos, still pretty conservative fishing community and and so anyway, Chuck kind of stood out like a, a sore thumb. And, you know, back in then, the, back then the West was still young. The, the, treaties, the, the, the treaties were still getting adjudicated in court. Uh, all the user groups were kind of at each other's throats. We didn't even have, know how to react. Our, 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 our world was changing and, and uh, a couple years before 1982, the commercial troller, salmon trollers blockaded El Waco and Westport, I believe, so we couldn't get out. So the fish checkers were kind of um, target for tomatoes, you might say. Uh, a lot of them went swimming. Uh, a, a lot of them had to put up with uh, some verbal abuse from the charter industry, the gillnet industry, the troll industry. Um it was just a different time, but I, I, I remember my grandfather calling us all in and and uh, telling telling our office that hey, we're not we're these these guys are kids, they're out of college. Um, we're going to treat them with respect. We're not going to do what they're doing at the end of the, end of the dock. We're not going to. You never know when one of these guys uh, might become somebody, might be a director, or might be. And I always remember that. And and outside the window, uh, we had benches where the fish checkers would uh, would sit and wait for the boats. And there was old uh, Blondie Chuck uh, laid back, probably waiting for a, a boat to come in, uh, face up in the sun and his long blonde hair flowing in the wind. And I said to my grandfather, do you think that hippie is really going to ever be somebody? And, uh, and my grandfather said there was, you know, there was exceptions to all rules, but you guys will be, you guys will be nice. And uh, so that's where it kind of started. Uh, Chuck and I might not have appreciated one another um, in the first few years of his, his career and my career. Um, Chuck was involved in Sturgeon in the in the later 80s and early 90s and 
I don't think we quite understood one another as, as well as we should have. So it was kind of a rocky relationship. Everywhere I turned, it seemed like Chuck showed up and I'd say, oh, God, not him again. And he'd probably say, oh, God, not him again. And, and uh, you know, sometimes relationships that start, start out not so good us usually end up being some of the strongest relationships, friendships, uh, working relationships you have for the rest of your life. And, uh, you know, a few years after that, he went to Oregon um, and uh, worked with the Columbia River Salmon, I think uh, the, they call it the Columbia River Tack Team, technical team. Uh, that group used to come fishing with me and and I really got to know Chuck a lot better. And, and then uh, I became on the SAS and uh, got elected as chairman and and Chuck was my was my first boss. Um, he was the hearings uh, or staffer of, of the SAS and uh, I, I gotta say that the SAS was pretty dysfunctional. you know in those days uh, it was by consensus only. So people would purposely leave when it was time to vote. And, and basically, uh, the SAS hardly ever came out with a statement. It was ground to a halt, and that wasn't going so well. And Chuck and I got some time to sit down and talk to see how we could, we could change that so we could be more effective. Um, and, and I got to say, my ways are, aren't, aren't always so orthodox. Uh, we, we call them walk aways which is different probably than other any place in the world but but chuck let me with some some advice chuck let me try to do some things that i want to do and we came up with now it's not in vogue to have a majority minority report but but if we wouldn't have come up with that uh, essentially um people would still be uh filler busting and leaving during votes and and if, unless you back then had a consensus you couldn't you couldn't come out with a statement and and uh um so i i think we went from you know somewhat dysfunctional to um a, a pretty good recognized sub panel and and a lot of that was uh because of chuck and uh him helping me uh be a better leader um to a bunch of great uh a bunch of great guys and ladies on the SAS and uh and uh and too so then um Chuck got to be the grand poobah the whole show and I think back to my wife I asked my grandpa do you really think that you know that long-haired California surfer guy could ever go anywhere and and boy he did right right to the top and Chuck you uh you had big shoes to fill and Don McIsaac. And I think you did a, a, a most admirable job. I think you will go down as one of the boat best executive uh, directors the council had. And, and I appreciate you and I appreciate your friendship and, and may uh, all your crab be big and remember to stay out of, stay out of where I crab. Don't, don't take my spot. And may all your elk be six points or better and enjoy your retirement. Because my. And when we can get together and have a real roast instead of this PG version, I would love to give my PG 13 version of some of the stories that we could come up with in, in, in the early days. So thank you, Chuck, uh, for all you did. And uh, you have a long, uh, prosperous retirement and enjoy those grandkids and, and, and enjoy your your time that you've certainly earned, uh, you know, with all your hard work and all your dedication to being a great. On your
complex process. There's much that I know happening on the floor and around the floor. As a council member, I see this every meeting, but I also know there's lots going on behind the scenes to keep the council moving forward in a steady manner. And you have shepherded the council from a longtime director, Don McIsaac, to a new era and embraced new technology, new formats, new people, and kept the council really um, steady and productive. I appreciate our interactions both on and off the floor, and I will miss you. And again, just really look forward to uh, your retirement for you and, and grateful for your service to the council. And hopefully I get to see you in person in 2022. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi, Tuck. Congratulations on your retirement. I am so incredibly happy for you, and I hope this is a wonderful new start on an exciting new part of your life and an opportunity to do all the things you probably wanted to do while you were busy working 80 hours a week being the director of a fish council. Um, I want to share a, one of my favorite Tuck stories, which was that, you know, you are known for being extraordinarily professional and kind of have this truck face about everything and um you probably should have a second career as a poker player um, but one of my my favorite moments was um it was a couple years after i had started coming to council meetings and still a lot of folks i didn't know still getting the scene down and um i brought my karaoke set um, and was hanging out and singing some karaoke with a few of the peace stars. And then you came and joined us and hung out. And then you went for the mic and you went for it. And it was amazing. And that was a moment where I was like, wow, um, this guy is really something special. And it just really opened my heart and, really made you seem just exactly as you are, which is incredibly kind and incredibly accessible as a human um, and a director of the council process. And um, that was a, a very special moment. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you for all that you have done uh, for our West Coast Fish and Fisheries. You are going to be deeply missed by a lot of people. Uh, and I hope that as you literally sail off into the sunset, that it is a wonderful, beautiful, and long journey for you and for your family. So thank you so much for what you've done, and I hope to see you around. Hey, Chuck. Just wanted to take time to wish you well in retirement. I really had hoped that I'd be able to be there with you in person, but of course, this, uh, this pandemic has gotten in the way of, of a lot of things like that. Uh, you know, I, I, I think my earliest memory of you, Chuck, was back in the mid-1980s when we were both in the Columbia River Program, you at Washington Department of Fisheries. We were sampling in the, I believe, in the Astoria area. Our paths have crossed many times over the years, um, including your stint in Oregon. I have many fond memories of the old ODFW, WDF annual softball games and uh, truly, truly going to going to miss you in the in the professional context over at the council. And of course, I served on the STT when you were the salmon uh, staff officer. I think uh, I, risk, I really wanted to wish you well. Um, of course, I wanted to wish Ruth well as well, and I'm sure she's probably watching this video with you as well as your kids, Lisa and Eric. And uh, wish you the best. Hope to see you in the future. Uh, fair winds and a following sea, as they say. Chuck, Catherine Kempton here. I'm sorry I only got just a few years to work with you, but in that short time, I've appreciated so much what a terrific leader you've been. Thanks for all your help learning council process and unique lore, as well as your always calm, collegial, and collaborative approach to problem solving. From GC Southwest here in Long Beach, our deepest gratitude for your service to the council and wishing you everything good in your new chapter in life. 
Congratulations on your retirement, Chuck. I really enjoyed my time working with you both as a staff officer and then for you as deputy and executive director during my time at the council office. I'm really grateful that you encouraged me to take the next step in my career and move to NIMPS. I really enjoyed working with you in this capacity. Well, miss your steady hand in facilitating the council process, but I wish you best wishes on your next adventure. I hope to share some fresh tracks with you and Ruth on Mount Hood this winter. Chuck, we are sure going to miss you at the helm. We have uh, really appreciated your, your wisdom and perspective. You've brought so much of that to the council and your leadership has kept us going in a great direction. It has been a, uh, an honor and really a true pleasure to work with you at the council and appreciate all you've done for for us and for the West Coast fishing communities. I wish you happy sailing and retirement. You were retiring and I wanted to take this opportunity to provide you with a few comments and my recollections of our time working together. I've been in retirement in the retirement pool now for almost three years and I want to welcome you to the land of the free. I think you're gonna gonna like it here. I want to comment mostly, uh, comment a bit on my time and experience working with Chuck. We worked mostly on uh, projects related to the salmon FMP. That was kind of where our, uh, where we overlapped. I was the NOAA lead and Chuck was the council's lead on salmon projects. Uh, we worked together on FMP amendments and other long-term long sort of complex projects. Amendment 16 comes to mind as is a good example of that. Uh, these were team projects that depended on a core group of five or six participants and sort of a constellation of uh, other interested folks and contributors. Chuck was always one of the key players on the team. He knew the substance and the procedural steps that were necessary to get the job done. Chuck always did his part and more and did it well. And when the teams were clicking and the work got done, I find found these projects to be some of the most gratifying things that I did in my career. And I want to thank Chuck for his contribution to that and uh, just let him know that I appreciated my time working with him. Um, so uh, congratulations on your well-deserved retirement. Uh, you made a difference in the world of salmon fishery management, and I hope you enjoy your retirement and happy trails to you. Chuck Tracy. Well, you have been the executive director since I started, so I can honestly say you are the best executive director of the Pacific Fishery Management Council that I have ever worked with. <laughs> but jokes aside, I, um, I, truly appreciated um, your kindness, your patience, <laughs> uh, your solution oriented and positive attitude over the years. Um, as you well know, uh, our countless coordination calls um, and then meetings, uh, our staff have to work so closely together side by side on a regular basis. And uh, I always appreciate and respected uh, working with you and your leadership there um, to help that be the best um, relationship possible. Uh, I've also really enjoyed getting to know you over the past few years. Um, sad to see you go. Uh, I consider your friend um, and I do want to promise uh, and I look forward uh, to sharing a scotch with you next time we finally can get together in person. Uh, so congratulations on your retirement, Jack. Uh, I wish you nothing but the best in, in whatever you your future endeavors are. Uh, you will be missed here at the council uh, and by NIMPS and by me, um, but we appreciate your legacy and everything you've done. So again, just wanna say congratulations, Chuck. Chuck, it's been great working with you as the Salmon Staff Officer, Deputy Executive Director, and most recently as Executive Director. These have been some really challenging times for the salmon fishery, presenting us with some hard issues, and I've really appreciated the even keeled, thoughtful way you've approached these. I hope that your council family can give you proper rose in person before too long. I really miss working with you, and may all of your retirement dreams come true. Chuck, congratulations on your retirement. 
I highly recommend it. It's it's been the um, uh, best time of my professional career to not have to go to the office from eight to five and deal with the routine of a job at all. And I just want to say the best to you uh, as you move forward into this next phase of your life. I'm excited for you, and on behalf of Idaho Fish and Game, I want to say how much we appreciate your service, your public service to uh, the states and to the, the tribes and to the rest of the communities out there that rely on the PFMC for everything that you do. I will say, while I've been a short-term member showing up to the meetings, my exposure to the council goes back 25, 30 years. And one of the things I do know, Chuck, and this is something I really want to get across to you and your staff, is the Pacific Fisheries Management Council is known to be probably the best council in the nation. I get that from my exposure to the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and working my way up through the ranks there as president a few years ago and watching and talking to the other directors, the state directors from around the nation about their councils and listening to their discussions. And most of the issues they have have been dealt with with uh, the PFMC within the Pacific area. Um, we're known for our ability to collaborate, to do co-management, to get out there and work on ecosystem management and to meet the needs that have been put upon us for MSA. And Chuck, you get a huge amount of credit for leading us in your style to achieve those goals and be the best at what we do. It's a set of huge shoes to fill and some that I um, hope will be able to do that. I also want you to know that I appreciate the time you've spent with me and I'm just sorry we didn't have more face-to-face -face time to guide me as we went through the process. I do know that Ed Schriever, our director, uh, feels strongly about the council and wanted me to be sure that I relayed to you his congratulations as well on, on your achievement. The other piece of advice that was given to me when I retired, Chuck, was during the first year, just say no to every offer to take your time up, and there will be a lot of them. And give yourself the space to enjoy what it is you're retiring for. Get on that boat, spend the time that you want to on your boat, and hopefully you get a chance maybe to tow that thing over to some of the larger lakes in North Idaho where I'd love to meet up with you in my boat and we can get out and do some things. Uh, Ponderé, Priest, Upper Priest, all of those are gorgeous lakes, Coeur d'Alene, places I know you and your sailboat would enjoy immensely as you get the time. So with that, Chuck, I'm going to say thank you so much from, again, the Idaho Fish and Game, from the people of the state of Idaho, and for all of the public service, the calling that you had, that you have given uh, over the decades of your professional uh, uh, performance. Good luck. Goodbye. Talk to you later. Chuck, this is an auspicious occasion. You are finally... Uh, ending your career and moving on to the next chapter in your life. I got to say in the last 40 years of working with you, it's been an honor and a privilege, uh, not only to work with you in various uh, agencies, um, but to uh, be your friend. I've really enjoyed our friendship. We've had a lot of fun adventures together um, in the, um, uh, because of the sanctity of friendship, I, I won't go into details of some of those uh, experiences, but um, I've got to say uh, it's been a wonderful uh, time, and I'm really happy for you um, that you are now able to spend some time with your family, 
uh, hunting and fishing and sailing and may the wine flow sweetly. May the fishing game be abundant for you and may you have fair winds in a following sea. Good luck, Chuck. May we have more adventures together. Well, hello, Chuck. Um, gosh, I wish we were meeting on in different circumstances. I know you um, really love this Ring Central stuff, but um, we're all wishing that uh, we, that we could be with you uh, here today and throughout throughout this meeting. But unfortunately, we can't. Uh, so this is going to be the next best thing. Um, you know, I just have a lot of memories of you and your work here at the councils. Uh, my first memory of interacting with you was when you were with the Salmon Advisory Subpanel. I must say I wasn't too sure about, about you and, and what you thought about Washington, um, but um, particularly those those of us who are from the more northern ports, but um, you you proved yourself to be pretty unbiased in, in that regard. Um, but I, you know, I think the uh, as probably most people can readily recognize that when you're the chair of the council, uh, you have a lot of interaction with the executive director, and the executive director can make your job pleasant or that he can make it, he or she can make it miserable. Um, and you, about 95% of the time, made the job of chair a delight. Um, we had uh, a few uh, uh, interactions from time to time about things that we disagreed on, and I was always thankful that you were a guy that was willing to, to, to tell us where you were coming from, to tell me where you thought I was wrong. Um, and, and that's a, that's a value, that's a, a trait that not a lot of people have, uh, in that kind of a relationship. So I uh, just really appreciated that. Of course, as we spent uh, lots of, uh, dinners together and, and, and boy, do I, did I ever love those CCC meetings, as you know, about as much as you did, but we got to spend a lot of time together and found out that we had a lot in common. We had a lot of common interests from boats, um, I'll bet you have a sailboat, I'll forgive you for that, uh, but we both like boating, um, we both like fishing and hunting, uh, but I think the one thing that I, we had, uh, we found that we had in common, we didn't realize was a love for cars, and uh, to, to the extent that you can have a love for working on cars, uh, we both have that, and that kind of mechanical kind of aptitude, uh, and sharing stories about about our experience in working on cars was was a, was a special bond, I guess, uh, and and commonality that we had um, that uh, brought us even closer together. And by the end of it all, I just consider you to be a really good friend, Chuck. And I uh, I have so much value the opportunity to be able to work with you over the years. Uh, your leadership, you know, is just founded on the high moral ground, high principles, uh, a, a devotion to process, which is good, uh, especially for some key guys like me in line. Um, and uh, uh, and you are an exceptional listener. And I, I, I just think that that is such a great attribute uh, for a leader uh, to be a good listener. And, and look for ways to, to uh, uh, recognize what the other person is saying and build that in to the solution, which, which you did uh, all, over the years of your career with, with um, a, a great aptitude uh, for that. And then, of course, leading a group of people through uh, an organization like this through a time of, of a pandemic, uh, brought challenges that I can't even begin to imagine. Um, but you did it with the help of your great staff that that you have uh, in a way that was about um, as seamless as it could be. Um, I was a part of some other organizations, and I can tell you that without a doubt, uh, you and the, and the entire council staff uh, just rose to the top 
way above other organizations in terms of how you adapted and how you helped your members throughout a big you know a big organization i mean the council staff in and of itself isn't that big but we are a big organization as the council with all of the great advisory panels and SSEs and technical teams that we have uh, and you managed along with your staff to to make it work and um i just can't say enough about uh what a great job that you and, and the staff there has done in that regard. The other thing that I always admired about you, Chuck, is um, bringing people together. Here you got 14 independent uh, souls sitting around the table, all uh, with uh, different interests from uh, in a lot in a lot of times and a lot of issues. Uh, and you know, Chuck, you need to do this. No, you need to do that. No, you need to do this. And here you are, you know, keeping those balls in the air, trying to recognize what everybody is saying. At the end of the day, trying to build a solution uh, that, again, recognized what everybody's concern was. And, and you just had an ability to do that um, that is really unique. And um now I'm going to miss like crazy those work planning sessions, Chuck. That that you just seem to enjoy, and and you know when you came into this, these work planning sessions, you know they, you know sometimes they last an hour and a half, and I was just in misery by the time that hour and a half was done. But by golly, you have been able to stretch those things out over three hours, I think, several times. So uh, that uh, I know you love that, and uh, you love to. Uh, Oh, I don't know if you love to punish me with it, but uh, I always felt that you were giving me a little jab in the ribs uh, when uh, those sessions lasted longer, maybe than than any of us had hoped. So, Chuck, I just uh, really want to thank you for your your friendship. Friendship. Let's continue that. Let's continue to find time to to get out and on the salt water and and. Um, what a line from time to time. Um, I'm I'm uh, uh, indebted to you for your uh, for being able to be with you uh, throughout the uh, good portion of your career. Um, you're an outstanding leader. Where you're going from here, I'm not sure. You may decide uh, to to do the opposite that I did, and that is re and truly retire. And, and if that's what you do, that's that's well deserved. I know you're going to be out there hunting and fishing and boating and working on cars and spending time with your family, uh, which is all, all really good stuff. And uh, so again, just congratulations on your outstanding career, on your leadership here as the executive director of the Pacific Fishery Management Council. And I just want to wish you the very best. Way to go, Chuck. Say, let me start by saying thank you. Thank you for doing such a good job uh, as the executive director for the Pacific Fishery Management Council. I remember when uh, you were a candidate for this job and Phil Anderson said, you know, Chuck's kind of a steady Eddie, Gene DiDonato kind of a guy. And uh, for those who don't know who Gene DiDonato was, and Chuck, you do, uh, then uh, you know that's a big compliment. But you have been a real steady, stabilizing person at the helm here. You skippered this council boat uh, through some rough seas, through some uh, easy seas, uh, across the bar, and, uh, you know, just done a really good job at that. Every council meeting, as we all know, has a little bit of a bar crossing at some point during the meeting, and you've brought the boat back home safe to port every time, and so thank you for doing that. Uh, we're real proud of the job you've done uh, for five years, and uh, you ought to be proud of it as well. Uh, let me also say congratulations on a great career so far. Uh, you know, you started off as a fish checker and went to a field biologist and then executive director of the Pacific Fishery Management Council, and you've just done a great job at, at all of that. When uh, uh, I remember when you first walked into the office down at our old Portland office in downtown Portland, Carolyn Porter and I were so glad to have you come come in, and we were so enthusiastic about that. And, of course, John Kuhn and Sandra Krause and Jim Seeger and Renee Dorval were there, and they wanted to give this 
this new guy a pretty good chance. And, and of course, then you shined at filling some pretty deep shoes as the salmon staff officer uh, filling in behind John Kuhn and just have done a, a really great job. And so congratulations to a, a, just an excellent career so far. And I guess, uh, you know, everybody probably already knows what you're going to be doing next. And I want to be one of the first ones to congratulate you on, on uh, your next position here. I presume everybody does know about this, but, uh, you know, it's quite a thing to go back to Washington, D.C. and take a job. And, you know, this appointment as Undersecretary of NOAA, working on all these fisheries issues and under with all those responsibilities, I just want to say that's Don, a Don, Ruth does not know anything about this position. Oh, oh, is that right? Now, yeah, sorry, Chuck. Um, okay, let's just move on then, Chuck. And let me let me just then go to a story. So all these things always have stories, and uh, you know, Chuck, you remember that time? And you know, it's going to be a little bit maybe embarrassing for some, but it's in the past. You know, and it's it's gone by now. I think most of the damage has settled down on this, and I know it would have been tremendous, juicy gossip at the time. But if you remember the time, and again, this is going to be a little bit embarrassing. But when you, Don, what? you're not what? supposed to talk about these kind of things on a talk like this. Oh, gosh, you're kind of wrecking gosh. everything here. Well, let's just say, Claude Kimmer, let's both wish. Chuck, say thank you, Chuck. Congratulations. We hope we're going to be able to see you, see more of you and Ruth in the future. And congratulations again. Adios. Chuck, I don't blame you if you never want to talk to him again after all that. See ya. Hey, Chuck. Staff wanted to get together and wish you uh, congratulations on your retirement. It's been a pleasure working with you all these years, and we really appreciate your support, especially as we've had to navigate COVID and having to be light on our feet, as the saying goes. Uh, we're really excited for you for your retirement, and uh, we want to just have best wishes from us to you. Goodbye, attention. Hello, pension. Hoping you have a stress-free retirement. Yeah, all the best to you, Chuck. I hope you enjoy all the trips Ruth has plan for you and both. Hey, Chuck, you've really got a lot to be proud of uh, in your time with the council, and uh, we hope you enjoy a well-deserved retirement. Chuck, the fish and game resources in the Pacific Northwest are now officially in trouble. Good luck, my friend. <laughs> Chuck, happy trails, happy sales, happy retirement. Bon voyage. Chuck, it's been great working for you and with you for the past 20 years and uh, a lot of fun socializing too. And uh, hopefully you'll have even more fun in retirement, sailing, hunting, fishing, and spending time with family and friends. Hey Chuck, best of luck to you from all of us, old and new. Mm -hmm. Hey Chuck, wishing you a long and happy retirement. You've earned it. Happy retirement, Tanner. I just want to let you know that you shouldn't take any prank phone calls. Congratulations. Hey, Chuck. Humboldt forever. Uh, happy retirement, and do try to stay out of trouble. Congratulations on a distinguished career, Chuck. Congratulations, Chuck. Enjoy your retirement. You can play Whipping Post by the Allman Brothers Band anytime you want. Stop, Chris. Great job, great job, uh, everyone who participated and Chris for putting that together. I know that there's some folks who, who didn't get an opportunity. Um, and so uh, I'll look for folks who wanna offer um, a fond farewell or otherwise uh, to Chuck. 
I know that uh, Joe Oatman reached out to me and wanted to say a few words. Joe, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate this opportunity to provide uh, my sincerest, uh, sincerest, excuse me, uh, congratulations to Chuck on a very distinguished career. Uh, it was very informative for me to, to hear a lot of the comments that were just shared by uh, folks within the PFMC family who have uh, worked with you or alongside you uh, throughout part of that career. Uh, I'm in my uh, early part of my third term now on the council uh, representing uh, the tribes uh, that are associated with this. And uh, partway through that, um, Chuck was selected as the uh, ED. And over the time that he's been in that position, um, Chuck has helped me navigate, you know, some, you know, tough issues, um, as well as some, you know, fairly uh, easy issues. And I think when I've had things come up that uh, either I needed to be aware of something or uh, something that I needed to confirm with Chuck about, um, he was always uh, prompt and uh, provided me with um, answers uh, to whatever uh, may have been affected me or the tribe that I represent. And so I think I can certainly speak to, you know, kind of the steady hand that he has had uh, regarding those matters um, that I've uh, uh, been able to work with them on. Um, I really appreciate, you know, the importance um, that uh, Chuck has given to not just myself as a council member, but also to uh, the tribes uh, in this process, whether it's kind of the tribe uh, sovereigns um, or tribal staff that might be on, you know, the SSC or management teams or advisory uh, bodies. Um, you know, it, it, it's been uh, great to see how that has been in integrated and has been uh, treated as, as something important. Um, you know, dry, tribes bring you know, their treaty rights, you know, their, uh, their uh, interest in protecting, you know, the environment. You know, the ecosystem, uh, the fish, as well as the tribal communities who uh, depend upon them. And so I, I thank you, uh, Chuck, for all of the help you provided me. Uh, and I think you've left um, Merit, you know, a, a great place to be with respect to tribes. And I hope you uh, have a great retirement that you do a lot of traveling that you may have had to put off in the past, but now can you know, spend more time doing that than among other uh, things that you cherish. And so uh, thank you for all you've done for me and for the tribes, and we wish you the best. Thank you. Thanks for that, Joe. Um... I, I first uh, started, uh, first encountered um, Chuck when I was just a, a, a troublesome stakeholder attending SAS meetings. I uh, always found that he did a, an admirable job, uh, especially in those very, uh, especially contentious years. Um, of course, as soon as I joined the SAS, Chuck moved on to uh, deputy director. A pleasure working with Mike Berner though. And, and now I've had the pleasure of working uh, with Chuck as executive director, first as vice chair and, and now as chair. And um, I'm going to miss Chuck, but the way I look at it, it uh, you know, losing an executive director, uh, but but gaining a fishing buddy, I hope. Um, but I look very much forward to working with executive director Merrick Burden uh, in the years ahead and with all the challenges uh, that face us. And uh, even, even, um, my dog is upset that uh, <laughs> that Chuck is retiring, and also that it's uh, five o'clock and I'm still here sitting at the computer. Um, Chuck, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Um, it's only fair to let you respond to uh, some of the comments that were made. Is this off the record? <laughs> Well, I guess I better raise my hand. I'm a protocol guy here, so. Um, 
But uh, yeah, Mark, I, I was uh, I'm pretty impressed. With your dogs. I mean, your dog has your dogs have barked at every opportunity. <laughs> This is the first time I've heard any sympathy out of them, and it's directed my way, so I'll, that makes me feel pretty damn good. Um, but uh, well, I just want to say thanks to everybody for the, you know, for the kind words and the, uh, this lasting tribute that will be on YouTube for, <laughs> for posterity forever. And uh, I, I can't have my family take a look at it if I uh, if I think it's uh, safe enough. But um, you know, um, the council. My council experience has been the highlight of my career. You've heard me say this before, um, but you know, really, um, you know, I guess words don't really uh, express the depth of my feelings about the, uh, you know, the uh, the people and the process, um, and the, and the respect that uh, that exists uh, here at the council family. And um, you know, I couldn't have asked for a better. Uh, professional experience than uh, than what I've had here, and uh, and ex and it does extend beyond the professional experience because there are many friends that uh, you know are, mean a lot to me, and uh, the relationships are the best part of uh, of any um, you know of any of this. So um, just uh, thank you all, and I look forward to seeing you when I. Really hope that June meeting in Vancouver is in person. I would love to come down and um, see you all in person and uh, raise glass. And, um, and I do hope that I, uh, that I will see you all uh, here and there. And uh, I, I do plan to enjoy my retirement. So um, thank you for uh, those encouraging words and um, look forward to seeing you all uh, when, when we can. So thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Um, uh, Executive Director Merrick Burden, any last words from you? Um, nothing more from me, Mark, but thank you for the opportunity and congratulations again, Chuck. All right. So there's only one thing standing uh, between us and leaving. Um, the honor should go to Chuck, but he's not a council member. So someone on behalf of Chuck needs to make a motion in his honor. Phil? I think we should make an exception and let him go ahead and make the motion. All right. Uh, Chuck, why don't you make the motion and then... Um... Well, I'm not sure your dog's happy about that. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I think there is a COP that, uh, that uh, prohibits it executive director for making a motion. But like I always like to say, the only time we talk about the COPs is when we want to violate them. So <laughs> here we go. Um, uh, I hope uh, I hope this is uh, uh, my last meeting, but I'm not sure it will be. Um, but, uh, but I move to adjourn this meeting of the Pacific Fishery Management Council, November, 2021. All right, thanks. I'll look for multiple seconds just to make sure we had two council members. Maggie and Phil and, well, everyone, basically. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Here, here. Opposed? <laughs> Abstentions? <laughs> Motion passes. We are adjourned. Thanks, everyone, for uh, making it through this meeting. And we'll see you at the next meeting. We love you, Chuck. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, Chuck. Take care. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Yes, that too. <laughs> Feed those hounds, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> there is a reason I'd like to meet in person. I can leave my dogs behind.